Cambridge for the 2020 Vantage Elite and Under 23 Road National Championships, arguably the biggest prize in the sport of cycling in this country. Our young women, our elite women, alongside of our Under 23 men and elite men, ultimately wanting to wear the black and white jersey with their trade teams in Europe, possibly in Asia, or possibly domestically. We look forward to bringing you all of the coverage alongside of me today. We have former National Cycling Representative Paige Patterson. Good morning, Paige. Morning, Mark. And a man who's ridden 12 Grand Tours. He's pretty much won everything. And Greg, I won't mention the fact you've never won the National Road Race. Greg Henderson, <laughs> welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, nice to be here. A and again, uh, we've seen the Nationals over the last sort of seven or eight years go from Christchurch to Hawke's Bay in Cambridge for the first time. And it is very much the capital of cycling now with the high performance centre here. What can we expect? Fascinating course. Um, it's a really interesting course. Just the, uh, the, the dynamics of it. The hills quite early on in the, in the stage, in the race, and then uh, the big flat section in town circuits, which is going to be fantastic for the crowd at the end of the day. It's going to be uh, yeah, a very, very interesting race. And Paige Patterson, on the women's side, uh, one thing I've noticed from my time in Christchurch is the fact that we have seem to have a, a, a bigger critical mass of riders, a lot more under-23 starting to come through. Oh, strong in the under-23 age group, that's for sure, and it's great to see there's uh, already been a few attacks. I mean... I think that, as Greg's on it kind of alluded to, is that they don't quite know what's going to happen in this race, and that's what makes it so exciting to watch. OK, let's just have a look at the course map today for our elite women. And I'll get Greg Henderson here just to talk us through this, the key points in this women's road race, equally the course that will be used for the men as well. Yeah, as you can see, uh, the direction in which they're heading, the first climb that they tackled was that Tamiro. It, uh, it's not the steepest climb there, but often a place where you can soften up some legs or you might see some early attacks go. The big climb of the day is going to be the Mangakawa that's going to put a lot of people under a lot of pressure and not a long way to go from there to the finish line. It's, uh, it's going to be everything to play for. And Paige Patterson, from a women's perspective, you know the course well. You've been out there, you've ridden it. Are there some areas that perhaps are being underestimated? Are there some opportunities for riders who have really gone out there and done their homework on this course to get away? Yeah, and, and hometown advantage for a few of those riders too. I think after Mangakawa, that's, it's after then as well. I mean, there's, there could be a bunch get up the road and then there's a bit of a dark horse in that tur Turkey Hill. So I think some riders will, will know about it, potentially uh, look to attack and uh, use that to their advantage to get away in those uh, windy roads. Okay, so our riders are starting to make their way into the start area, the corralling area, and boy, it is a world-class field, it is a stellar field, and it is an intriguing one for the fact that we've got a lot of the European, we've got a lot of the European riders here who are going to have to have some friends in the peloton, and then we've got a lot of domestic teams, and we've got riders that make up trade teams at second tier level, at the continental level in Europe, Greg Henderson. Yeah, it's um, like we've talked about many times, it's it's such a coveted jersey. It's so prestigious to be able to try and win that jersey. Fantastic um, domestic teams, and uh, yeah, it would be lovely to take that back to Europe. OK, we'll just bring up the men's graphic of the course. Of course, the men today, they ride a lot further than the women, 174 kilometres for our elite men and under 23s. The, the trick here, the, what, the thing that I noticed is very interesting, if I was racing this race, is there's a headwind up each climb and that makes just a little bit easier for the guys sitting in the back of the peloton it makes it a little bit more difficult for someone trying to break away on those climbs um, and then of course at the end of all the climbing you've got the the really interesting circuit race as we come back into town but there's a lot of kilometers to, to cover in the, the uh, at the final of the race so there if you do get dropped if there is a breakaway it's got a lot of work to do to make it to the finish and Paige, we've had the women's race uh, has been underway and we'll update that very shortly. And we've had the privilege of being some of the pictures coming off the course. And l let's, we have noticed that in parts of it, there have been some reasonably strong crosswinds too. Yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating so far. And for those riders that uh, maybe were hoping they could sit in the bunch have had to do quite a bit of work up the front to try and pull back uh, those riders that are trying to get away. And are not, not quite as far to cover distance-wise when the riders come into town. So it might be a make or break getting up that Mangakawa hill. They could uh, stay away. Well, Greg Henderson, it could come down to a sprint. It could require a bit of a lead-out train. Let's just have a look at the circuit in town that the riders will be going through. Um, your take on this in terms of the bike handling skills, where you might want to be positioned? Yeah, so if I look at that, um, 
you know, I, th I honestly believe it's going to be, a, if a bunch comes, it's going to be a small number, you know, maybe a maximum of 10 bike riders. Um, and positioning into the final corner is always, always so important. And it's not far from that last corner all the way to the finish line. So, yeah, it's, I mean, there's a long time to wait. We've got 174 k's to get through first. So uh, let's just see what happens when they turn that, that fo for that final time for the bunch kick. So it is a fascinating day, and we look forward to bringing you all the live coverage, all the expert analysis, and just looking out from the commentary position, overcast, there hasn't been a lot of rain, but it is relatively cool. Uh, Paige Patterson, um, yeah, you expect, you, you live down here expecting the cloud to burn off, will the mercury rise a little bit later in the day? Oh, it's a bit, a bit hard to know out there at the moment, uh, it almost looks like we could see a bit of a shower, but I do think it will lift, lift off, and it actually makes for perfect riding conditions, there's not too much wind out there so far, as Greg mentioned, a bit of a headwind up, up the climbs, but other than that, I think that the, the riders will be pretty comfortable, it's not too hot. And Greg, if that wind does get up a little bit later in the day in terms of the riders coming back through into the street circuit, what impact will that have? Yeah, again, if it's a, if it's a small bunch, there's uh, there's always a lot of chance there where you can, if the legs are already very, very tired, you put it, at, when the crosswind, the wind comes from the side, you have the opportunity to give people way less shelter and you can, and you can actually... Um, yeah, you can put a lot of people in a lot of trouble in a crosswind. Okay, Greg, so in the men's race, and then I'll come to you, Paige, on the women's race, because that is unfolding at the moment. Are you expecting a large bunch? Are you expecting small bunches? Absolutely, the second. There's going to be small bunches come to the line for sure. It may even be solo riders coming in, in ones and twos. But in terms of possible setting this race up for a sprint finish, are we talking a group of three, four, five? I think it'll be a reasonable size group, and I think you'll see a lot of people trying to skip away in the final 10, 5, 10, 15 Ks. There'll be a lot of individual attacks that won't want to come to the line. If there's a guy that could come to the line, like Shane Archibald, very, very difficult to beat in a, in a kick to the line. Uh, Paige, you sense on the women's side that possibly not quite the depth in terms of strength, a lot more younger under 23 riders who maybe still haven't quite develop that deep down strength and being able to pull out of those times when they're having a bit of a bad day. So yeah. what, are we expecting maybe a smaller bunch on the women's side or possibly a rider to get away? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think we could see a rider get away actually. It, it more suits those, uh, all those riders that were on the podium in the TT. They're more of the hill climbers, the ones, uh, the likes of Georgia Perry and the likes that can actually get away for a long period of time and really put on the afterburners. So it uh, doesn't sort of suit the sprinters in, in that regard, but I think we will see um, there, there could be one, there's one off the front at the moment, so she could still be there at the end too, and uh, certainly would work to her advantage in, in that uh, town circuit. Now, Greg, we've been joking with you that you finished f uh, second on five occasions at the National Road Championships, but would this course suit you, particularly with the inner loop in the city towards the end? Absolutely. So, uh, I would be licking my chops at this sort of circuit. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough, no question. It's going to be raced hard, no question, but we've got plenty of time to come back and have a go at the finish. Okay, let's talk about one of the big notable missions from this team, and I think it was probably a course set up for him. He's the complete rider in Patrick Bevan. A hundred percent. It was, uh, you know, he can climb with the best, um, and he's very, very dynamic in the finishes. It was, uh, it would really suit him, but let's, let's just not forget there's, uh, you know, these races aren't raced exactly like like we would um, expect in Europe. You know, there's a lot of individual riders, a lot of individual strong riders that uh, nobody's working together as big teams. It's really, really difficult to control a national championships. Rusty Buchanan, not here on the women's side, four-time champion, other notable omissions? Yeah, Georgia Williams, we don't have here. She's uh, one of our pro tour riders and said she uh, came away with a nasty head injury from uh, the Cadell race. So. That, that, that's quite a um, sad to not see her here, but I tell you what, there's a good bunch of really good riders out there that are here, and as, as you said, they all want to take that NZ uh, jersey over to Europe. Yeah, it's, you talk about that, Greg Henderson. I mean, how prestigious is that? How personally prestigious is it for the trade team itself to have a national road racing champion? And I, I guess how important for the rider, and I'd imagine for the fans here in New Zealand? 100%. It's, um, it's every, every team that has uh, a national title um, they get presented with their own beautiful jersey made up by the team. They're on the front row of the f photographs. They get called up to start lines. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's very, very important to win this race. It's important for the teams. It's obviously important for the riders. And it's just been lovely to see, in the men's case, for example, we haven't had it in Europe for a long time. It's, uh, Julian it's Dean, I think, what, the last? Julian, or, or Hayden Ralston, actually, might have been the last one to win it. So um, it would just be lovely to see it. 
it's such a hard race to win. It's like, like I uh, alluded to, it's really difficult to control a race like this. So there's so many variables that can play out. Um, yeah, and we just hope for it. it's going to be a, it's going to be a great race. Right, let's throw to Andrew Dewhurst, who will introduce the riders and welcome our elite under 23 and elite men's field to the start of the 2020 Vantage New Zealand Road Cycling National Championships. Andrew. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Advantage Elite Road Nationals for 2020 here in Cambridge. A wonderful race in prospect as we get ready for a race start. It's time to welcome our riders in both the elites and under-23 categories. First, let's welcome a couple of our named riders in the under-23 field, wearing number 190 from Hamilton, riding for the NTT Continental Team. At 18 years of age, please welcome Drew Christensen. Wearing bib number 183, riding for Jumbo Bisma Development Team. Please welcome also at 18 years of age, she's the winner of the TT from Friday, Finn Fisher-Black. And please acknowledge and welcome the rest of our under-23 field, everyone, in the Road Nationals here today. As we acknowledge now some of our key riders in the elite men's field. Would you please welcome first up a gold medalist on the mountain bike from 2018, a huge year in front of him on road and mountain bike. Please welcome Sam Gaze. Wearing bib number 101, riding for Mitchelton Scott at 26 years of age. Three Grand Tour finishes. He's already ridden this year across the Tasman. Please welcome Dion Smith. Wearing 122, also riding for Mitchelton Scott at 32 with seven Grand Tour finishes. Twice he has been fourth in the New Zealand Road Nationals. Please welcome Sam Bewley. Wearing number 113, returning to top flight racing, and we're looking forward to a wonderful season. Signed up with De Koenig Quick Step. Please welcome the flying mullet. It's Shane Archbold. And riding for Jumbo Vismar at 29 years of age, eighth in the tour down under, a runner-up in the TT here on Friday, eighth in the 2018 Giro, and with his team, a stage winner on the Tour de France. Please welcome George Bennett. Ladies and gentlemen, please now welcome all of our riders to the start line for the under-23 and elite Vantage Road Nationals. Well, what a field it is indeed. And George Bennett, well, the real question for him today, Greg Henderson, does he have friends in the peloton? Does he have a number of riders who are prepared to possibly sacrifice themselves for the greater good of getting that black and white jersey in the Grand Tours in Europe? It's a, it's a tough ask. You've got, um, you know, the, the obvious tactic, I think, will be for George to try and try and attack on the climbs and go across to a potential early move. If he, can, if he can join on the climb to an early move that's already gone, then maybe he can uh, get those guys to help him drive it all the way to the finish. Uh, uh, Paige, one of the interesting um, dynamics that we haven't, w and we will talk about it, but is Black Spoke, this latest professional team out of New Zealand, Black Spoke Pro Cycling. Now, they've got an academy in here as well. So they've got them at the elite level, but also in the under-23. They have numbers. They have numbers, And they have right. some good <laughs> riders to ride for. The likes of James Orham. Mm -hmm. And we're also the likes of Aaron Gate. I mean, I think this course will suit their team, and, and they are uh, all Kiwi riders, so they certainly know, know the home turf very well. And uh, it'll, it'll be fascinating to see what sort of tactics they have up their sleeves with the numbers in hand. Will we see a breakaway? So one minute to the race start, and boy, fascinating this. They've got a reasonably long neutral zone before the flags will drop. Greg Henderson, are they going to light it up from the gun? Is that, is that what you're expecting? Absolutely. If I was on the start line now, there's, there's 100% there's going to be uh, guys looking for that early move. Um, it's quite often the early move is very, very hard to control later on in the race. So you'll see fireworks right from the, right from the gun. Well, intriguing it is. And if you're young, inexperienced, you're going to need to have had a pretty good warm-up, I would have thought, because I've got a sneaking feeling the heart rates are going to be very high, very early, Paige. Yeah, I mean, they're straight, straight up uh, to Miro Hill. And I can tell you they're uh, not going to hold back, even though it's uh, not too steep a climb. And big Sam Bewley there in the middle in the yellow and black. And Sam, of course, a two-time Olympic Games medalist in the men's pursuit back in 2008 in Beijing and London 2012. The man they affectionately call Wagon. 
I remember lucky enough to call a number of road cycling nationals in Christchurch, and he'd often come off and said, I had the legs, but there were just too many of them. Here we go, and we are underway now, so Vantage this is the start three. of the Vantage and 2020 and Elite line. Men's and Under 20 National Road Race, a total distance of 174 kilometres for the first time in the history. We will see the best riders enjoy the countryside that is effectively known as Cambridge. So just making their way through Cambridge initially, and this will just be in that neutral zone. And so any deals that have been done, Greg Henderson, have they been locked in, or are there going to be deals likely to be done during this? Yeah, nothing will be sorted out now. It'll, thing, things will happen on the road if things are going to happen. But you've got to remember, there's uh, every single bike rider there is hungry to, to win that national title. And uh, with a race like this, so many different dynamics, so many things can happen out there. There's, there's no one clear favourite. Fascinating the uh, number of riders out there. I mean, how do you position yourself uh, from the get go? If the, the, there's going to be fireworks as soon as the uh, lead car pulls out of the way, the neutral car. And it is only appropriate that it is raced in Cambridge, and immediately here we see just a little bit of chaos. <laughs> I was going to say carnage, but that's not the case. We'll be happy about that. At the moment, so the riders may understand this. A few little teething problems. station will be at the 30 kilometre mark. These days Cambridge of course the hub for so many sports, the rowing program, the triathlon program, road cycling, track cycling as well. So a wonderful resource and if you're not familiar with Cambridge, it's about an hour and a half or two hours southeast of Auckland, just to the east of Hamilton. Greg Henderson, you are a resident here. You've ridden these roads a lot, road surface-wise, a lot of sort of traditional New Zealand road, a lot of big chip. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's hard racing here. It's hard riding. Um, yeah, nothing fast about these roads, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, it's the same for everyone out there. Um, but, you know, these are the nice stages here, that the neutral, you just go through your race plan about now, you just think about, stick to your game plan, what was my plan at the start of the day look for who's going up the road you know you'll, you'll notice the world tour riders are on the front at the moment not looking to go in an early break or anything just to keep an eye on who is actually going up the road and how dangerous is it you know we can't let a break of too many people go up the road especially with some with some high power with some high power legs we can't let them go too far up the road well everybody's been talking about george bennett he is arguably new zealand's best rider on the road at the moment Earlier today, Andrew Dewhurst caught up with him to get his tactics and his thoughts on this year's Road Nationals. Well, George, uh, another day, and, and I would suggest this is more likely to be your day than on the flat of a TT on Friday. Uh, well, to be honest, this is even harder to win because, I mean, the course is still really bad for me. I mean, for some reason, we've got 70k of complete flat afterwards, so it's going to be a, probably be a bunch sprint or a... a a sprint from a group so uh, at least in the time trial you didn't have everybody just watching you you know so it's, it's definitely difficult I mean me Shane Bills and, and Dion are going to be it's going to be really hard for one of us to win because um, obviously everyone looks at the Pro Tour guys and so yeah actually looking back probably Friday was in hindsight my best chance at the title but um, yeah we'll see how it goes I mean I, we just have to race to win I know it's cliche but that just means lighting it up early and, and making it a super hard race and seeing if we can you know just make sure any of the sort of big guys sprinters if they get to the circuits then they get there pretty pretty tired yeah so given what you've just said teamwork's vital today you're going to look for some guys to try and test uh, the legs early yeah we don't I don't I've only got one teammate I've got Finn Fisher Black uh, he's an under 23 guy you haven't had a chat with anyone else no, I tried to, but no one wants to work with me, so <laughs> don't blame them either. Good, I wouldn't work with me either. Well, good luck, mate. Enjoy the day and have a great year. Thank you very much. Oh, great to see a little bit of humour there from George. Uh, does he have friends in the peloton? I guess we will find out what a class act he is. Uh, 
going to light it up early, Greg. Yeah, nothing too surprising there, was there? Um, you know, we I think we all predicted that. He can only really race this circuit one way, and, uh, you know, he let us all know how he's going to race it. Mm. Yes, some friends in the peloton. It hasn't been easy, though, for George Bennett. He's had a number of operations. Um, he's had a, a rib issue, which has led to a lot of stitch, uh, which has held him back from a performance point of view. It's still an issue that he is working through. Uh, but, look, no excuses out there today. Um, if he's in trouble, it's going to come down to maintaining the poker face, Paige. And uh, even if you might be in a world of hurt, just assuming, making sure that you look like you're comfortable. Yeah, well, he's obviously got the legs coming away with uh, second in that TT a couple of days ago, and it's just a just a matter of uh, being able to put them to good use today out on the course, and I think it is fascinating. He, he says it doesn't suit him, but, I mean, there's a few good hills in there, and if he can uh, even get away or sit, stay up the front and be ahead of those people that do have the power in the legs right at the end of that uh, town circuit, he could, could be in there for a win. Shane Archibald just sitting back there in the blue. You can see the flying mullet. So he's just happy to have a little bit of a chat. And so they're still in the neutral zone behind the commas ears. And when that red flag, when that red flag drops, oh, I wonder whether we're just going to see the first attacks go up the road. Uh, Greg, let's talk about Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy. Uh, under 23 team, an open men's team here. They've got numbers. How do you see them racing this? I mean, they're really just introducing themselves to the sort of the New Zealand public for the first time, really. Well, like you mentioned, the good thing is they do have numbers and you can play, they've got many cards they can play. So, you know, what actually what actually that means is later on in the race, there is the opportunity to skip some turns if you've got someone up the road and they can bring fresher riders to the end of the bike race. One guy I think we should all look out for, Hayden McCormick. He's gone under the radar, um, but I watched him race in the Sun Tour last week and he is in great condition. Fantastic, so a field of 76 riders. We have 36 in the elite men, 40 in the under 23. Again, just showing the depth that we're now starting to get coming through because of the success we've had sort of really in sort of from the 2000s on with the likes of Greg Henderson and of course um, the track cycling program with the likes of Paige Patterson. So the sport is well and truly booming in this country. And with more riders now on the world tour, just sends a message to youngsters that it doesn't matter what part of New Zealand you come from, if you've got a dream and you're prepared to do the work, you can ride at the highest level. Again, so relatively mild conditions, just we're getting a little bit of a sense though that, that wind is just starting to pick up a little bit, Paige Patterson. Yeah, it certainly is, and it looks like the cloud is starting to lift, if anything, so I think they could be out of the way of any uh, rain or wet weather, so th that's uh, always good. I mean, th it is a fairly technical race in the mid stages of with the Mangakawa and French Pass, the likes of those that are twists and turns in the downhill, so we will at least keep a little bit safer for the riders out there and weather can play a large part in that. It's a rider 103 there, Aaron Gate. We haven't spoken a lot about Aaron. What opportunity, what chance do you give him today? Would not want him to come to the go to the finish line with Aaron Gate. Rapid turn of speed. You can see just at the back there talking with his Madison partner, actually Shane Archibald. They've ridden a lot of times together uh, on the track, obviously. Good mates. Um, used to be teammates way back in the day. But uh, yeah, bring, you wouldn't want to bring him to the line. Those two guys on the back right there are some of the quickest in the world. You, you do not want to go to the finish line with those two guys. So an intriguing, intriguing 174 kilometres ahead of us. Yeah, fascinating to see a few of those track riders that are competing at Worlds at the end of this month here at the, we're in the road race. I mean, track cycling obviously a lot shorter in distance. Maximum sort of, uh, you know, number of Ks compared to this well, well over 150 Ks. So, but they certainly have the power of the legs and I suppose uh, of sort of a matter of them keeping up over the hills with the uh, very light riders, the likes of George Bennett, and then being able to put the hammer down when they come into town circuit. Yeah, I think you'll find that uh, the kilometres will take their toll. It's, uh, you know, anyone can ride up to 100, 120 k's, but 174 k's is different. OK, we're going to cut now to the elite women's race. The field is at Mangakawa. It is just starting to break up so here we go for the first time live we are watching the elite women's race 
and it is Kate McElroy on the front. She's been there for a lot of the day. This might possibly be the, the breakaway rider in this women's race who has looked to try and go up the road and possibly at the head of the race, and in fact it is. So it is Kate McCarthy from Waikato Bay of Plenty who's gone solo um, as we start to get towards the business end of this women's race. Yes, and we saw uh, uh, three riders go up the road earlier, Livia Ray and Kate McCarthy, Georgia Perry. It looks like Kate McCarthy's been the only one to remain off the front. So we see the charge now coming from those Pro Tour riders. Ella Harris on the front, followed by, by the looks, Michaela Harvey and Neve Fisher-Black. And I tell you what, McElroy, who's there in the action too, in the Wellington colours, she's been aggressive all day. Yeah, Kate McElroy sitting there, third wheel at the moment, in predominantly orange, Olympic Games representative sport of triathlon world mountain running champion commonwealth game cycling representative and she is pretty determined too we know how good uh, ella harris is over the past few weeks had some scintillating form over in australia coming away with a win in the sun tour on one of the stages so she, we know how good a form she's in let's see what she's gonna do on the hill up here well back to the start of the men's race that red flag is about to drop they will take this little left-hand turn. And then a field of 76 riders, a combination of under 23 and elite men, will look to try and put each other in the hurt box and look to try and rip each other's legs off early. And that flag has dropped and we are racing once they come around the corner. going to be very interesting to see when they hit kilometre zero who's the first to launch a couple of likely candidates ollie jones from canterbury i know he'll be looking to go up the road early just get that little bit of a uh, a head start on the climbs and hope that and this is the head of the race so the first uh, uh, first attack of the day has gone from rider number 176 and that is uh, lachlan robertson from southland so a relatively tall man deciding that he just wants to test himself and sometimes too it can just be a case of going up the road just to I don't know get the nervous system up a little bit just get the legs going a bit feeling a bit flat you empower yourself by going to the front Greg Henderson what do you make of this yeah he's going to get a nice start here and obviously he'll be riding you know obviously very hard but he'll be hoping that there's a couple of guys coming across to him and he'll be well aware of that. You see him checking over his shoulder, just letting, just making sure that, okay, if a couple of guys start coming across to me, I'll ease it up a little bit because I do not want to be out here on my own all day. No, indeed, and I guess Southland, they won't be immune to any wind, will they? They're used to riding in pretty tough conditions. They breed them tough down in Southland, so... So that gap around about 100 metres, that is the word coming from the Commissaire's vehicle at the moment, but no real panic in the peloton at the moment. So it's relatively bunched, and any time you see a peloton bunched, it generally means that the pace is dropping off. Yeah, just taking care now, obviously, like I mentioned before, make sure that the, if the group does go, it's not too big, that you can't control it later on in the race, and make sure that there aren't too many massively horsepowered or, or well-protected riders up there. An old director of mine used to actually say, if you want to get in the breakaway, go with every breakaway because you'll never miss one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, easier said than done, I guess, at times. And now uh, a little bit of a train on the front and the pace is just starting to go on. See a few more riders almost dropping into an aero-type position, a time trial-type position. And so the rider from Canterbury. And that is Rion Nolan. Great story, Rion Nolan. A very troubled upbringing and really through the sport of cycling turned his life around. So good to see Rion back on the start line. Very inspiring young man. Not quite sure what the tactic is here, but anyway, he's got the he's got the peloton lined out. So let's go back wow. up to the front of the women's race, and this is the chase group. So that women's race has well and truly come apart at the back. And the leader is still Kate McCarthy out of the Waikato Bay of Plenty, so the local rider out of her seat. But the challenges are now starting to come, but you can just see it beginning to splinter too. Greg Henderson, you've done some homework, you've done some research on this climb, just how tough is it? Mate, this thing keeps going and going. We get pictures of 14, 15% here, which is a super steep climb. And you can see she just has to try and hang on. 
over the top before the breakaway gets across to her and then she's done a fantastic ride. So intriguing. Just having to work through the gears out of their seat, climbing. We see, you see uh, quite a few riders just struggling at the back now. This is uh, where all throughout the race they probably felt quite comfortable in the bunch. They're just rolling, undulating hills until this point, and then all of a sudden the pace goes down at the front of the race. We can see those Pro Tour riders leading the charge here, and uh, the likes of Ella Harris, Michaela Harvey, Neve Fisher Black are uh, certainly putting the power down, and it'll be interesting to see if the, they soon have McCarthy in their sights and then what the game plan is from there. Well, Ainsley Thorpe in there too. Out of the Waikato Bay of Plenty, Kate Makaru, as we've talked about, and also in there, Therese Radham, by the looks of it, who won the time trial. So we know how strong she is. Her biggest concern prior to the start of the race was the change in speed, something that perhaps the triathletes are not necessarily uh, comfortable with, just in terms of peak power. So there goes Neve Fisher-Black. So she's got a bit of a lead on top of Ella Harris and Michaela Harvey. I mean, it'll be interesting, the uh, mental mind tactics that go on between these riders now. That's climb there, if you look at the, a lot of steep pitches, a lot of areas to a slight recovery, but you could see them all under a lot of pressure already on that climb. Um, but you look at that last pitch of that climb there, that's where you, the whole difference could be made. Yeah, and this is point two, it's physical. Now we're understanding too that Neve Fisher-Black is attacking from that chase group as well, looking to try and bridge across. So we'll try and get back to those live pitches out on the course. At this point, too, it is very much not just physical. It becomes mental now, just having to work through it, just having to try and break it down in your head. They'll know this hill. They'll know the little markers on the road. They'll know where that summit is coming. So this is a good little attack, trying to bridge across. This is the first of the team tactics we're seeing here. So Georgia Perry gets picked up by uh, Neve Fisher-Black. So, I mean, I tell you what, Michaela Harvey will not be helping Ella Harris behind uh, because... Neve wants to get away, and Michaela's doing her best job to keep Ella Harris back there. We can see a raft of uh, other riders actually still there in the action. Another wide block rider trying to bridge the gap. This is a very long climb. This is this is a three and a half k climb with an average gradient of eight percent, with kicks of 14, 15 percent. The fastest time up there at the moment is 11 and a half minutes. So these guys are going to be doing 12, 13 minute climb. That's that's a real climb. There's a lot of time to do a lot of damage to the peloton. It is, and it's very much come, off, come apart at the back, this women's race, as they have progressed through this distance. They're racing 108 kilometres. They start at 8 o'clock this morning, and you can just see there the body movement. Some athletes who obviously have a lighter frame, a lighter build, riding with a lot more balance, with a lot more poise, and slightly bigger riders who tend to be, who tend to prefer the slightly more gradual gradients of around five or six percent, just struggling a little bit. And you see the hips and the shoulders and the head beginning to rock. That is a sign of fatigue. I tell you what, on a uh, climb this steep, your power to weight ratio really does play a large part. And you can see you need Fisher Black. She's got a very small frame and able to put the power through the legs to accelerate herself up the climb very quickly. And she is doing damage and quite quickly, as you alluded to, Greg. I think what's important here really though is if you're a, if I'm Ella Hallis right now, all I'm thinking is stay within contact of the leader and keep a couple of riders around me so that I do have some help once we go on the descent, once we're on the flat, the chase back in. I don't want to be isolated one on one. I need help to get this break back. And that's I think exactly what you're doing. She's climbing hard, but she still has three or four riders with her. Yeah, does not want to go solo at the moment. Needs some friends and three or four will work effectively together. It's a good number to be in, Greg. Uh, I mean, what is the optimum number of riders that will work effectively? I'd argue sometimes when it gets too big, yeah, it's, it's too hard to get organised. It, it's when it gets too big, too many people start missing their, their workload and then people start getting frustrated and then it all breaks down and then a new series of attacks happen. But everybody knows now when we get to the top of this climb, these are the people in contention for the bike race now. They all know that. They all know they still have to catch. And look, they're very, very close now. So it's, um, yeah, I think we're going to have a very small bunch at the top of this climb, or at the bottom anyway, and it'll be uh, all on and to the line. Yeah, well, Kate McElroy's still in there hanging on. The bungee cord is just stretching a little bit, but not too far to the summit. She's so probably about fifth, fourth or fifth wheel back at the moment, McElroy. But it is Fisher who will lead over the climb by the looks of it. Been a very good performance, though, from Kate McCarthy. And she is hanging tough. She's going to need to hang a little bit tougher, though. 
And I think in, uh, also in the wide box colours there, is that Teresa Adams that's in that pack right behind uh, Neve Fisher Black there? So she could still be in action. Okay, let's go back to well, what fascinating race amongst our women. Let's go back to the front of the men's race. In fact, we'll just stick with this helicopter shot of the women's race. And so it is now a bunch of four, and you just sense that this is where the black jersey will head one of these riders. It might be Kate McElroy, by possibly Teresa Adam, a triath, a professional triathlete who won the time trial. It is, in fact, Adam in that group. So the strength of Teresa Adam. Kate McElroy, the all-rounder, and then two very proficient riders in Kate McCarthy and Neen Fisher-Black. One noticeable absentee, Michaela. Harvey, yeah. Wow. She had the prime seat. She had a teammate up the road. Unfortunately, just did not have the legs to follow, and this is a perfect scenario now. Ella Harris does not have to worry about two teammates from one from the same team. She can actually, she can actually race the bike race and not have to worry about team tactics. Well, an intriguing race. Four riders. Four riders remain out of a field of around 40 that started, including the under 23 women. We'll see how well these uh, four ride together and work together in order to stay away from the bunch. I mean, no surprises there in the bunch. Certainly uh, some of the top riders here in New Zealand. That's fantastic. They'll ride together. You just got to keep everyone motivated. You just keep talking to them. You just keep telling them, come on, they're doing a great job. They're not going to come from behind. You don't have to go flat stick right now. You don't have to give it 100% because, look, they're in ones and twos trying to get across, and that is very, very hard work to come back. All you need is four people rotating nicely. It's very difficult. And it's very hard, too, with and rider right to who's around. We won that time trial. There is a triathlete. She's used to riding 180 kilometer individual time trials. We know she's got the strength. We know she's got the power. She'll be setting that tempo. Kate McElroy knows it's in her best interest, too, to keep this going. Hey, it's better to have a one in four chance than a one in six chance for a one in seven chance. Absolutely. They look to be working together well so far. It'll be a really strong ride from any rider to uh, bridge that gap. Obviously, Munkau put a bit of hurt in the legs, and with these windy roads, uh, you can miss uh, seeing what happens up ahead and lose that motivation to try and tap back onto the back. So, no doubt, we might see a few bunches uh, working together and riders tacking together to, in order to uh, make that a team effort to get onto the back. Okay, so that's Chase Group of Two. We're just trying to get some updates from out on the course from our chief commissaire and greg henderson you've got a course graphic here in commentary in regards to the road ahead are there opportunities still there's still a lot of riding on that road they're hard roads there's they're heavy roads there's steep undulations there's steep pitches um i just um, if these pe if these four keep riding together like this it's going to be super difficult but the problem is now if, you, if there's someone very, very strong in that group of four, it can start to play on the minds of the other people in that group, and they might start to look to save some energy. Okay, so, and that then opens the gate for that chase group. Exactly. And four suddenly has three working. And, 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 uh, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, I'll come back to you, Greg, on that, but this is where they're going to need to communicate. They're going to need to talk to each other, but it, there is still no obligation, is there? <laughs> there is still no obligation. It's a bit of a funny thing where you do actually work together as a team within the, within the race, a race of individuals. And uh, I mean, we've still got, as Greg alluded to, plenty of hills ahead. I mean, coming up soon, we'll have this turkey hill, and this hill in particular has been a bit of a dark horse. Uh, uh, Greg, we, uh, bike riding, obviously, getting in the slipstream of another rider, you do save a lot of energy, but in terms of dragging a rider who's soft peddling, how much can that negate your effort? It's not only your effort, it negates everyone else that's in the in the working group with you. You know they're saving some energy. What are they saving it for? Are they saving it because they're a quick finisher? Are they saving it because they want to attack me on the next climb? You know, an interesting thing here I was just going to discuss is um, Finn Fisher, she actually has no obligation to work right now when her teammates only 100, 200 metres down the road. I, I would, if I was the race director right now in the car, 
I'd just be telling her, take a free ride. You've got a teammate just behind. Just be a policeman in that bunch. Absolutely. Just mark, she, just cover, she don't is, do any work. She has got no obligation to work right now. She does not have to. And that's the benefit and that's the advantages of having teammates. And now, well, one thing we've talked about coming into this race, well, I want to go back to Therese Wadden, because she is a triathlete traditionally, is the bike handling skills. And whether she actually has the same skills on perhaps the descent that some of the pure bike riders might have. Yeah, it's fa fascinating as well in this bunch. I mean, we've got two pro tour riders who know how to race well in a bunch. And then you've got out there also to a former triathlete and a current triathlete. So how do they race well within a bunch? And you can see Teresa Adams on the front. I think this is a strong position for her because if she's not strong, she may move her way to the back. Better to start at the front, move to the back, uh, rather than start at the back and go off the back. Well, what a wonderful women's race that is beginning to unfold in the streets of Cambridge. Four riders vying for one of the great honours the national road champion for the next 12 months. Still a uh, quick pace out there for these four. They certainly have not uh, eased off, but as you can see, so Neve Fisher-Black, she was just having a look over her shoulder there to just, as you guys mentioned, maybe, you know, waiting up for her teammate to give herself a, a better, better, uh, stronger team position in that leading bunch. Two out of five would be a lot nicer than one out of four. You know, that's... Um but yeah, we'll just see what they, at the, at the moment you can see they're working really well together and that just makes it so difficult to come back together, and especially in a, a peloton that's just broken completely to pieces. The big question is, to where is Kate McCartney? Not quite sure if she's still uh, up the road or if they caught her up the hill. She was part of that initially, wasn't she? She led up over the climb and might have just got shelled off the back in that last sort of two to three hundred metres towards the summit. And they are working quite hard over this little rise here. That is the word coming from the commissaire's vehicle, so there's a slight gradient here. But the peloton, we also understand, is starting to organise itself and trying to see if they can bridge the gap. Yeah, it is interesting, uh, as you go over this Mankawa Hill, it was a very steep rise, you know, 11, 12 minutes for these riders to get over the top, and then since then, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, not just undulating, there are some really steep, sharp rises here, and it'll be fascinating to see who decides to lead up these hills, or will we see someone, you know, just attack and see what sort of reaction they get? Uh, interesting Kate McElroy there, uh, obviously going to her nutrition, but she too just looked a little shaky towards the top of the car, and I just wonder whether she may have just burned a few matches. She was always towards the front early on in this race, and we might just see another little bit of an attack go here from Teresa Radham. Looks like you just sort of put the hammer down and take it up another gear. So maybe does she just sense there is just a, a, an opportunity here? Really tough little technical part of this course, Greg Henderson. Yeah, we'll just, you know, we're in a small bunch of four. There's no real stress right now. Um, they're, in, they're in the perfect prime position now. Four off the front, working well together. A long way to the finish. There's no need to really, really panic right now. There's no need to take massive risks to come back to a peloton, you know. it's. I think they'll descend this comfortably, and again, once they get to the flat, then they'll start making decisions. Okay, how much time have we got? They'll be asking for time checks. How much do I have to put in? You know, how much effort? Is, are they coming back? There are a lot of things, a lot of discussions happening, I think, once we get the flat roads. Yeah, so this is good here from Teresa Adam, just going towards the front and just making sure she's taking control and powering herself. Did anybody else follow here, Lines? And you, you alluded uh, just to the feed and nutrition there, and I tell you what, going through these races, 100k, for the woman, it is a, a long race, and you do have your ups and downs, both mentally and uh, physically as well, and taking on uh, your feed throughout the race is uh, super important, and these riders know their bodies well, and speaking to some of the riders uh, the previous weeks and throughout their athlete careers, as they do mature, they get to know what uh, food and nutrition works, and as well, hydration works for them best throughout the race. Well, on to Brunswick Road. Greg Henderson, you've got the data on this particular part of the course. Affectionately known as the Brun School roller coaster. <laughs> up and down and up and down, and yet some really steep pitches in there again. Predominantly gaining in altitude, about three or four kilometres long. 
that's Olivia Ray. So Olivia Ray was off the front earlier. It was Olivia Ray and uh, Kate McCarthy and Georgia Perry all off the front. So just trying to get a bit of a gain as gauge as to where they sit on the road. And she's sort of stuck in no man's land there, isn't she? She's like uh, in front of the peloton, but behind the, the lead group. It's, you're in one of those situations now, like, what do I do? You know, do I just keep the hammer on and hope that they ease up in the front for, for whatever reason? Or do I just save some Vickies right now, go back to a peloton and get, try and get a peloton motivated to start working together? Yeah, sit up, grab a drink bottle, wait for a couple of riders or the peloton to come through and try and get them organised. And speaking about feed earlier, we can see Ella Harris there taking on a gel at this stage in the race. She's got, got about 30 k's uh, to go. So uh, at this sort of stage in the race, uh, Greg, you can uh, speak further on this, but I would have thought she's having a bit of caffeine. Yeah, maybe she's, uh, it looks like one of those SIS gels. They're really, really good because uh, they're actually quite easy on the stomach and you can stomach, uh, you know, if you put too much sugar into your stomach and you, all your blood is going to your muscles and not your stomach, it can really start causing digestive problems. Yeah, it's one of those things too, isn't it? You'd like to think at this level though, as you've already mentioned, Paige, that those protocols are fairly well established, but you do have to make sure that you get that mix right. You often hear athletes who are really good at eating and drinking and training when they're on a road state and they don't often show their body in training how to deal with absorbing fluid and food when they're under duress and it is a very very different system too and you get different chemical releases when you're in a race and you're a little bit more nervous and how often off endurance based events do you hear athletes talking about how oh, I just felt a bit sick I didn't seem to be able to absorb anything. Yeah, it's about training the body over time and uh, being uh, able to, your stomach able to cope with uh, the intake of that energy, which is so important in the late stages of this race. And, you know, those riders that may be falling up the, off the back up month are potentially not able to get that food in early in the race. And you just sort of got to keep taking it in, as well as uh, the carbs and the sugar. There's plenty going on. I'll give you an idea of how dry it has been in Northland, up in the North Island. 40 days or 41 days now, no rain in the Auckland region. This would normally be a lush green. Almost looks like we're running riding sort of the tour down under. <laughs> Just look at the rolling territory there. You know, that's hard riding up and down. There's no real rhythm. It's just, uh, that's a very hard road so out there at the moment. They've got some beautiful roads here in Cambridge, though. You can't beat uh, ones without centre lines. It goes to show that uh, very little traffic. So Kate McCartney there by the looks of it. Kate McCartney, we were wondering where she had got to. We think that she might again be in no man's land as well. Just off the back of that group of four. She probably has no choice here, but to probably just keep the power on and hope. As you mentioned, Greg, that there's possibly a little bit of deception in the ranks amongst the four riders up the front. In fact, we've been told that is the lead rider now in the women's race. So I think it's uh, McCarthy and then Olivia Ray and then that four-man group at the moment. So I think it's the Kate McCarthy, Olivia Ray and Georgia Perry went off the front. Georgia Perry picked up up Mangakara Hill and those four riders are still chasing down Olivia Ray and Kate McCarthy. I think the uh, yellow motorbikes can find the front of the race. OK, we do apologise if we have put you on. We are just trying to get our comms with the commissaire's vehicles to give you a, an understanding of how this race is playing out so that makes a lot more sense why the four of them are riding hard riding strong to give it because they are chasing the front of the bike race still that is a solid gap too that is a reasonably big gap at the moment so i think with mccarthy she's committed there's no plan b now that is just put the hammer down and go she's giving a good crack i mean mccarthy she's doing very well to be out there at this late stage in the race and She's uh, no doubt going to give it everything, but that, uh, that bunch of four, they are working well together. I'll try and pick up that men's race for you at some point. We do understand that George Bennett being relatively aggressive on the front of the men's race. And today, racing just under 180 kilometres. So now we see the peloton. It'll be interesting to uh, gauge whether these guys are working well together. Looks fairly yeah. pedestrian, doesn't it, really? See the mullet at the back there, so. Yeah, nothing too stressful in the peloton right now, but we don't know exactly what's going on off the front. Is there a break? Has it gone? Um, you know, as soon as it goes uphill, we know it has to be made hard to make 
It's make sure that the sprinters' legs are tired. Yeah, and that will be, that's exactly it. Just trying to hit them hard in and out of the corners. Just try and burn as much fast twitch as they can. It's happened to the glycogen stores. We do have a ride up. So Olivia Ray again. Off the front. So Olivia Ray actually uh, currently living over in the United States at the university over there and actually more of a track rider. And so does really well in the, the Criterion Racing in the States. Picked up uh, multiple national titles in the sprint events on the track. And she's done very well to go ahead early on in this race. So this is one of the Waikato riders, we understand, off the front of the women's race. Not quite in the picture there. That's Libby Ray from Auckland, but Kate McCarthy still off the front. So you can see that uh, she's either trying to get across to the race leader right now and stay ahead of that chasing four. I think in a couple of kilometres time, I think we might see a group of six coming together because I think if we just pan back now, we might get a sneak peek of those four bike riders and there they go. And there's not far to go now to catch those next two riders. So I think in the next couple of kilometres or so, we're going to see a front group of six riders. And uh, how much damage have they done to their fuel stock so far, those two riders out front? That's the question. Will they even be able to hold on to these uh, four high-class riders? Well, this is Turkey Hill. Now, a lot of locals here talk about this has been a point on the course where a rider, it could be make or break, where this could be almost a decisive point. Yeah, you can see the spectators there. They are obviously wanting to see it. It is a short, sharp hill. And uh, tell you what, they certainly can get away because it does twist and turn. So this is arguably the third group on the road. Two riders ahead of this group of four. As Greg's mentioned, hopefully we'll very shortly be expect four to be two to become six or four to become six. There are some reasonably big gaps still. A little bit of terrain still to be covered by that chasing group. But it will come together at the front. Turkey Hill, very steep pitches. Um, it is relatively short in, in uh, length and in time, but, you know, if you've done a lot of work out there in that group of four, we may actually, uh, you know, there's a possibility to lose one from that group of four. It could be down to three. So, uh, yeah, everything to play for still, but let's just see Let's just see how we go up this climb. And if I, if I was in that breakaway, it would be in my best interest to try and keep the four together. So, Kate McCarthy... She looked a little fatigued as she came over the top of Mangakawa. But she certainly maintained that composure on the descent and through this undulating part of the course. But she's going to need to maintain some good form. As mentioned, there were some tough little peaks on this climb. So she's just getting up to the top of Turkey Hill now. She is uh, that's, uh, coming up to the top and following her is Olivia Ray representing Auckland. And then we've got the bunch of four that are chasing them down. I tell you what, this isn't the end of the hills either. After this one, they have the backside of French Pass, which uh, the local riders will know very well. And so up to the hill she goes. Next will be Olivia Ray. Kate McCarthy, what's your time probability like? Well, that's a good question. Let's see what she can do to keep off the front. Well, I mean, looking... Um, at her body type, Mankawa, who looks to be a power rider, certainly has a, a, a strong build compared to, say, perhaps what we've seen from Mean Fisher Black. Yeah. We certainly know that Theresa Adam, Theresa Adam can time trial. She won the time trial championship on Friday, and she's a member of that four group. And Kate McElroy, she's got a strong mountain running background, triathlon background, so we know she aerobically is very strong as well. And McCarthy looking quite good out the front there, but I mean, we even had too many close-ups. Maybe here getting a bit closer to get a gauge as to her fatigue out there on the road. But as you mentioned, a bit ragged over that Mangakawa Hill, but she's stuck away. And this looks like they're about to pick up Olivia Ray now. So Olivia Ray, what will she do? Will she just slot in and start working with this four? Or the fact that she's been in no man's land for a period of time, how much fatigue is in the legs? This is a fantastic move, actually, because she is a lightning-quick sprinter. If she can make it over this climb, stay in contact with this group, come back to the front of the bike race, she's absolute sitter to win this bike race. She's done a great ride, tactically almost perfect, if she gets over this climb. Yeah, I was going to say, you've got the backside of uh, 
that French Pass Hill too. So it'll, I think from here it'll be a mental game for Olivia Ray. Well, uh, and then Greg, it comes down to mouth amongst those four riders. So Olivia Ray, okay. We know that she's got a kick on it. We know she's got a sprint on it. But the four girls in that group know that. Do they look to try and attack it? Do they realise mm. the danger that she offers if she can survive? At what point does, say, Kate McElroy go, we cannot afford to have her, I cannot afford to have her on a sprint finish? 100%. And I, I wonder how well they know her too, to be honest, because she lives over in the States. They don't race against her very often. They won't know exactly what kind of rider she, uh, she is and how she makes her moves. So, again, if you look at the race dynamics now, we actually have got now two Waikato Bay of Plenty riders. Um, so again, in that group of four, we've got one lady there that's obligated, not obligated to work at all. Mm. So riders yet to hit French Pass. And that could be... Another short one though, it's not too long. So again, uh, it's a, I think it is more of a mental game, those riders that have got the uh, endurance capacity to uh, put the power down and I think we could actually see a bit of an attack up the uh, back side of this one at least those four are still trying to chase down that front rider and work together in that front. So the rider you're looking at is Kate McCarthy from Waikato Bay of Fiji who attacked before the Mangakawa climb and managed to get away and she descended incredibly well down the other side and she is down on the hoods of her handlebars Trying to be tucked in the zero as she can at this point. Just looking at her pedal cadence there. Pushing relatively big gear. This chase group just looks to be a little bit more distorted at the moment. Doesn't seem to quite have that fluidity that we've seen. But we also see the number of riders at this point in the race having to go to the jowls and making sure that they do have a little bit of petrol in the tank for the finish. There is Teresa Adam. Waikato Colours, Kate McElroy now taking her turn, going through to the front, and rider number 26 is Ella Harris. Yes, and it uh, looked like Olivia Ray got on the back there, she's just taking on some uh, energy to make sure she keeps up with the bunch of four, you would not want to lose the back of this bunch of four, it's going to race over from here. They need to keep talking to each other, keep communicating, I'm not sure it's quite the time for Cat and Mouse just yet. So French Pass, yes, again, another real climb. Average gradient of 6% for one and a half Ks. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real climb. It's about a five minute climb, so there is time to do a lot of damage to your to your riders. It starts off uh, fairly uh, low and gradient first, and then it really starts to pick up in that last uh, little bit, and uh, sometimes you feel like you're standing still when you are going up, it's uh, that steep, but once you get to the top, it's all downhill and uh, not very technical. Pretty uh, straight rollers back down the other side. So Kate McElroy just gives a little bit of a flick of the elbow and Teresa Adam comes through. Makes her turn. See the sprinter on the back, eh? She's one not wanting to do the work. Quite happy just to let those other four do all the chasing to Kate McCarthy, who's out front. So about to take a right-hand turn into French Pass Road. Yeah, they'll begin that gradual climb at the beginning and it really kicks up uh, near the end of this climb. So let's just see what happens now. We've got, uh, you can see one sitting up just a little bit here. Um, still got a lot of work to do to catch this lady off the front. She is working hard and riding well. Yeah, gutsy performance indeed. This is wonderful stuff and this is the opportunity. And I guess there's been that one criticism maybe over the years of the elite women's race. They tend to look at each other a little bit early on and there is that opportunity for a rider to get away, for a couple of riders to get away. I'm hoping that we get that mere wide, wide shot now and we can uh, hopefully see really uh, what sort of a lead Kate McCarthy has, but that's the beauty of this Cambridge course is that you can get away like this. It is much harder to see that rider who's up the road, particularly when they have a lead such as this. And this is really the last climb and then they uh, come down and into town into that uh, town circuit. So this is their last opportunity to sort of put the herd in to lead. Be interesting to know what sort of communication they have with the front of bike race too. Do these riders actually know how far up the road she is? Is it one minute? Is it one and a half minutes? It's, it can make a big difference to, to how hard we're chasing right now. Yeah, long stretch of road there. They get a visual on that rider. And out of sight, out of mind. And that can just create doubt. Imagine if this group of five that are chasing would be 
Don't give it to you for the three. They've been fairly, fairly good. There'll be a couple who might have just been going through a little bit of a low, a little bit of a bad patch. They won't really be showing too much. And now that Comcier's vehicle will come through and just give them that time check. And that's a fascinating thing if you have a look at this bunch. I mean, we do have two riders in there that are in those world tour teams that Ella Harris and Neve Fisher Black. They'll be wanting to take that New Zealand jersey back to Europe. They'll be wanting this badly and they'll be wanting to uh, catch up to Kate McCarthy. So just apologise there. This is a card for the coverage and we'll go back now to the men's race because of a little bit of a significant break we'll just beginning to develop in that men's race and you can just see that peloton now just starting to be stretched out so a little bit of urgency and trying to chase down uh, these two riders who have looked to try and go clear at the head of the race so number 138 is joel yates out of west coast north island and it is certainly splintered Looks like it is just starting to come back together. And they're on Waterworks Road. So still just sort of feeling each other out a little bit. And teams, I'd imagine, will be just trying to get a little bit of a read on what other teams are trying to do tactically and who might, even early on, might not be having the best day. section that we're on now that again all, like every road around here undulating up and down can actually be quite difficult sitting at the back of the bunch because you get that yo-yo effect so quite often sitting at the back yeah we can save a lot of energy but and of course it's twisting it's turning it's up and down there's often quite quite that stretch at the back of the peloton costs you a lot of energy well it's a bit like being at the back of the criteria isn't it those riders in the front come around those often 180 degree turns they're back up with full speed while you're braking coming in and you've got to just work that much harder so, uh, uh, Greg, just for people watching this, uh, people who are maybe just coming to the sport of cycling in the Peloton, when the pace is on, where primarily do you want to be? Yeah, it, again, it depends on the type of parkour we have, the, the type of circuit that we have, because um, if it's nice and flat, then we do need, um, you know, about 20th, 15th to 20th is where you get a really nice, uh, really nice draft. And uh, but again, if it's undulating up and down, you, you cannot afford to sit at the back. And, and of course, you're relying too on the rest of the peloton having some pretty good bike skill sets too as well. And I guess if you find yourself in a peloton with a lot of beginner riders, you probably just want to be closer to the front. Yeah, that's true. And of course, you can always keep an eye on, on what's happening in the bike race too. You don't want to be sitting at the back. I mean, in the uh, in the very important bike races in Europe and, the, and things like that, we've got massive teams. You can rely, and you're a protected rider, you can actually rely on your teammates to cover all those moves with you. But a race like this, you've really got to be aware of what's going on. OK, so Ella Harris is just one of the women riders in that chase group. And we caught up with her earlier this morning. Ella, road race day, the big day, a little more tension around today? Yeah, definitely. I think there are a few people uh, today who want the title and it's up for grabs. So, yeah, it's definitely going to be nervous, but exciting racing, I think. You feel Friday set you up nicely? Yeah, I think so. It definitely opened up the legs well and it's uh, given me a little bit of confidence. So, yeah, it's nice. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, uh, Greg, I'll get your thoughts and I'll come across to you, Paige. But doing a time trial on Friday, you've got that day off in between, um, can it negate your performance? Look, she's in fantastic condition. I watched her win on top of uh, Falls Creek in the Sun Tour, actually. I was on the side of the road screaming at her. She's from Dunedin. She's from my hometown, so I was pretty proud of her, pretty proud of her effort, actually. And then, uh, so she's in great condition. Again, she had a fantastic time trial. And, and when you're in good condition, when you're fit and, and healthy, you recover really well, and she'll be absolutely fine today. There'll be, there'll be no side effects at all from that time trial. And we've talked about that, haven't we, Paige? I mean, this is sort of established practice, and it is just a simple case of saying, well, look, you know, I guess in a lot of uh, tours, you're going to have day after day where you're going to be going into your VO2 max, where you're going to go into peak power and you're going to have to back it up and you're going to have to recover. Mm. So maybe for the more inexperienced riders, 
backing up can be tough, but yeah. as Greg alluded to, the more experienced riders. Yeah, they're used to this. I mean, if you have a look at back at um, Ella Harris's, uh, you know, schedule leading into this race, it, she's had, you know, numerous races over in Australia, the Cattell race, the Sun Tour, Tour Down Under, and she has performed really well. So if anything, she'll be taking a lot of confidence into these nationals. Uh, one rider we haven't seen in this breakaway group, and you've been somewhat surprised, is Michaela Harvey. Yeah, she hasn't managed to make her way <laughs> over Mangakawa Hill with that lead bunch. Um, so, I mean, it'd be fascinating to know what sort of, um, you know, re reaction that she's getting back in that peloton and whether she's in the peloton or ahead of the peloton. We haven't quite got that sort of news yet. But, I mean, if she was up in that lead bunch, it would be a hell of a threat to have those two riders together. Well, Andrew Dewhurst caught up with Michaela Harvey prior to the start of this race. What were her tactics? Well, Michaela, uh, big day. Uh, how does Friday set you up for today? Feeling good? Yeah, I'm feeling really positive. I'm super motivated going into today and getting to wear my new big Lakatusha like, colours is pretty cool and racing alongside Neve, so I'm super excited and pumped for a hard day. The, the course? What, what's the plan? How do you attack this course? Oh, I don't want to give away too much, but the course has got some interesting parts to it, so yeah, we've got some good climbs to get up and over and a good flat finale, so yeah, we'll see what happens. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, what a future Michaela Harvey has. Uh, Greg, it takes a long time, doesn't it, to, you know, mature as a rider, to get those years in you. Um, and what age these days, you know, do you really start to see athletes truly start to fulfil their potential? Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because uh, it's been a topic of discussion um, on the world tour level lately. And... It's the young kids that are really coming to the to the fore at the moment. You look at the, uh, young Egan Bernal; he was 23 and won the Tour de France. Like that would never have happened, you know, 10 years ago. It was always, it was always 28 to 30, 30 years of age was your, your optimal. But nowadays, the young kids are so strong and so fit. We now will go back to the front of the women's race, and we have Teresa Adam, as I think it is. So just trying to pick up... That's Kate McCarthy. Kate McCarthy, my apologies. So she's come out of French Pass. She's back onto the flat, so she still is at the head of this race. She's still managing to stay away from this group of five who are chasing, which in itself is just remarkable. So she's now gone over the top of French Pass, so she is on the flat and coming into the town circuit. So... Kate McCarthy, I tell you what, she's still looking strong out there. You just even look at the gear ratio there, Greg Henderson, what, pushing a big chain ring on the front, and what, maybe a 53-15 there or thereabouts? Well, what I was actually noticing, you'll, you'll notice the chain is a white colour. That's actually one of those very special UFO chains, which is actually friction-free. Again, that saves probably three to four watts. Um, you see she's riding a skin suit and a, and a slightly aero helmet, so... The aerodynamics, she's got the deep section wheels in. She didn't go for climbing wheels. It's like that she had this plan in her mind the whole day was I'm going to have a crack going solo. I'm going to make myself as aero as possible and they're going to have to struggle to catch me. So technology on the bikes, uh, the evolution of it, remarkable. First and foremost, you do all the work you can. You do everything right as an athlete and then you buy the performance side of it and we've seen it these days and the riders have what they call power meters set up on through their cranks through the bottom bracket of their bikes which gives them a record they do a lot of training based on that and the great thing about power and wattage is that it's always going to be a consistent measure no matter whether you're on a rough surface or a flat road surface and I tell you what's fascinating about that French pass is that those other riders, that group two, that group of four, they would have gone over French pass and then they go down this dip here and this is a really steep, sharp section but very short. So they'll soon be at the top. So you know French pass. We've seen these riders still coming to the top. So based on that, what do you suggest, what do you think the gap is between our um, rider out in front and this chase group? I think we're looking about a minute and a half here. Because by the time these guys get to the top and we saw t t uh, Kate McCarthy coming through. I mean, Kate McCarthy's in some good form. She, uh, on just two weeks ago, won the Hawks Bay Tour. So we know how good a form she is now. And uh, so as you, you notice, we've lost Olivia Ray. That's the big key. I just noticed right there. They've unloaded the sprinter, which is, uh, for these ladies, I'm sure, 
a, a load off their mind, a big easy, like, OK, I don't have to worry about someone rapid at the finish to take the title off me. So that was obviously a goal of theirs, try and unload the sprinter, and now they have to work together and catch that leader. But that's going to be a big ask because she was moving. She was riding really fast. Well, Greg, just looking at the form of the riders, can you take any sort of... Can you get a read on fatigue levels here? Everyone looking comfortable? At this stage of the game, I honestly believe there's not far to go. She, look how fast she's riding. She's turning that gear beautifully. She's in a nice aero position, and that's going to take a lot of work. And you know, Ella Harris is going to be looked at to do a lot of this work. This is going to be a close bike race. This might not come back. No, I mean, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether it's going to come back too. And these four are going to have to ride really, really well together. And uh, oh, you can see there, Kate McCarthy just missing a drink because she came through the feed zone a little bit fast. Yeah, and she slowed right down too to make sure that she did eventually get that bottle. So she clearly is on that rivet at the moment, making sure that she's got plenty of fuel in the tank. At what point do they just say to Teresa Adam, you're going to need to take some bigger turns here, Teresa? Or did, when does Teresa Adam actually decide to take some bigger turns at the moment? Her national title hopes are up the road as well. I'm very, st I'm still very interested to see the uh, the teammate there rolling through and and helping with organise this chase to chase down her teammate. Um, you know, for me, sit on the back, you get a free ride to the finish line. You you turn turn up fresh and uh, and and beat them all in the, in the kick. That would be. Yeah, you can see here all of a sudden, Neve Fisher Black. She's uh, pushing the pace at the front of the race. I mean, these riders. They uh, know that it is uh, within reach, but it's also going to be a very tough ask. So an intriguing battle in the front of this women's race. What courage, though. What a warrior, what a street fighter that we are seeing from Kate McCarthy. You want to see guts. This is where you put all your training in, and this is where you remember all the good days. You say, hey, this, I know what I'm capable of. I remember three weeks ago on a Tuesday afternoon how well I rode in a particular training session. I know it's in the tank, and you hang in there and you believe. Out of sight, out of mind. That is the advantage she has at the moment. She is up the road. There is no visual from this chase group of four. And uh, knowing aggressive riders, Kate McCarthy's partner is Dylan Kennett, who's in the uh, elite track team, and he likes to uh, push his boundaries, push his limits. So Kate McCarthy off the front still. She's going to have to put the hammer down to get in to this finish uh, town circuit. And you can see here the pressure. It's not too much tensity, intensity, though, out there. Would you guys expect a little bit more? Well, I, I, always, I, I never really quite know with that women's race in regards to it. It's a, it's a sort of, you know, with so many young riders coming through too, it's always hard to get a bit of a read on this field. But I think we've got... Certainly experience here. We might not necessarily have a lot of bike experience from Teresa Adam, but she's an experienced professional athlete. You know, she does very well in her chosen sport of triathlon. Kate McElroy here. But, you know, what, the, do they believe here, Greg Henderson, that Kate's going to come back? I think that's what it looks like to me. There's no real urgency. There's not too much panic. I know they're riding hard, but there's still not that urgency. So it would just be nice to get a it would just be nice to get a graphic on exactly how far we've got to go to the finish. And from that point on, I mean, the riders will know exactly how far to go, and then they can assess how much danger they're in. Yeah, well, she's uh, certainly far enough up the road that there she, she's not within sight at the moment, Kate McCarthy, I can tell you that much by where we've seen her on the road. Uh, uh, Greg, these days, uh, post your career, uh, you're involved with a, a professional road cycling team. If this is your rider up the road and you're sending her messages, you're talking to her through the radio, what are you telling her? What are you telling Kate McCarthy at the moment? Uh, this, she, everything to ride for. She's just now in time trial mode. She just knows how far to go, how long I've got left of this bike race, and she is just giving it everything. It's 100% time trial to the finish line for her now. Absolutely no plan B whatsoever here. You can see, though, a look at the heads there, starting to sort of sway side to side, so these four riders aren't exactly fresh and uh, ready to rip into a 2-3k to three K effort. They are hurting as well. But they're looking comfortable. Yeah, they're looking comfortable. And there is now a little bit more determination coming in. They will be getting updates from the Commissaire's vehicles in terms of what that time gap is. But at some point, they'll probably be getting some reads that perhaps the gap is not coming back. Do we look at any point, Greg, for one of these four riders to try and go? I think 
the only option there would be if you could get a visual on her and, and if you could then judge, can I jump across to her and unload the, the riders that I'm with. But at the moment, you can see they're all still rotating very well together. Four is always faster than one. I am presuming that that gap is coming down. OK, so Ella Harris in that chase group. Neem Fisher-Black is there. Kate McElroy, as well as Teresa Adam. That is the chase group. The woman who is leading this race at the moment is Kate McCarthy. She attacked prior to the Mangakawa Hill, and she managed to get over the top. She descended brilliantly, and she's gone into time trial mode and is really starting to ask some major questions. A real dark horse, the real surprise factor in this peloton. And she's got now the rest of the field asking some very, very big questions. The question is, can they find the answers? I think it'll be fascinating to see here if Teresa Adam does uh, try and jump off the front of this group of four and chase her down herself. We know how good of an uh, athlete that she is winning that time trial a couple of days ago. We know she can sit on the front and put the hammer down and she knows how, how long to go. And we, we see the town of Cambridge there. And... Uh, these riders now making their way onto the town circuit. And then the town circuit in itself, Greg, we've talked about that. A few left-hand turns, two right-hand turns. Um, obviously, out on your own, you can negotiate that by yourself. Group of four, that is just another little thing you have to think about, particularly if riders are fatigued. Well, another thing that uh, you know that a lot of people might not know, you're actually very fast through corners on your own as opposed to a group because you can pick the line, you can pick the apex, you can enter fast and exit fast. So that's actually a lot of time where a group can't actually make time up on you. So time is running out for the chase group. They started at 8 o'clock this morning. We've been going two and a half hours. Total distance for our elite under 23 and elite women is 108 kilometres. So they're now making way onto the town circuit. First, the left hand turns. These are four riders. You can see Ella Harris on the front from Kate McElroy, Neve Fisher Black, and at the back there, Teresa Adams. Well, Greg Henderson, I'm not sure. Is that a visual of a commissaire's vehicle up the road? Is that potentially where our race leader is at the moment? And is that gap beginning to close? Yeah, I think they've just got a visual there, and that just gives the chasing, the chasing group that much more confidence. They'll know now, are we catching her fast enough? Will we catch her in time? They'll have a lot more confidence from that uh, visual right there. It can be a cruel sport, can it? We've seen it Jack Bauer in the Tour de France. You can go out for so much of the day, be on your own, and be pulled back, what, 50 metres short of the finish line. Are we about to see, or are we about to see a situation like that unfold? And then within these four riders, then they've got to start thinking about their own races too because who is the sprinter? Who is the athlete that could potentially win amongst that group of four? You're probably not going to back the lights of a Theresa Radham or a Kate McElroy necessarily in a sprint. Yeah, I can confirm it looks like they are on the same road as Kate McCarthy. Looks like they're on that uh, one out the back of Cambridge where the raceway is. So she looks like she's right on that limit as well, Kate McCarthy. She has uh, certainly got plenty of uh, power in those legs, but she, has she had it in her legs for the last 50k, and has she got enough left and right to the finish? Well, she's going to, think, she's going to have to continue to dig deeper, work really hard in and out of the corners. <laughs> All right, so she turns now. onto one of the main roads and she'll uh, go back out to the main Victoria Street. She'll, uh, am I not, Victoria out to the Velodrome out round Peak Road. And this is the interesting point too here, Greg. Now, what's the wind doing through town? And we're just sitting here and not a lot of breeze, but any sort of headwind is not going to be favourable to the solo rider and any particular crosswinds equally, but it's looking relatively still, so I'm not sure that that is necessarily going to play into the hands of this chasing group. If she's got a tailwind, however, that could certainly benefit her. Definitely. Tailwind, very hard to catch a breakaway in a tailwind. With a lot of the turns on a street, though, you're not in the headwind for too long, you're not in the crosswind for too long, so it's not going to affect you as, lo as much as a big, long straightaway into a headwind where you can just absolutely tear your own legs off. OK. So this peloton is driving incredibly hard, and this gap is closing. And if it should come together and four riders suddenly become five, do we see an immediate attack from the like of a Teresa Adam, who probably knows that she perhaps might not have the kick that, say, Ella Harris has? 
tell you what, I just had a look at whether that second bunch of riders were, and I think it's too far away. It's going to be a very big ask for these uh, forward to catch Kate McCarthy. She's got a good lead on her. Well, it'll be a stunning performance, wouldn't it? Thoroughly deserved too. Certainly no luck. You've gone, you've done it your own, you've done it on your own. I'd say there's at least two minutes because these riders now are just uh, about to turn onto that main road. So we understand now the gap is 1 minute and 43 seconds, Greg Henderson. That is just remarkable. What a performance from Kate McCarthy. Wow. That is incredible. She deserves this. That's, she took off from the start, and that's going to be very, very difficult to close. I mean, if I had to bet right now, I think we can almost see our winner. Well, how often do you see... Uh, athlete go solo on a course too that there's been discussion about the back part being flat perhaps not enough climbs in it to make it necessarily a, 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 a course for an individual to win on we were expecting probably sprint finishes bunch finishes we've talked about that in the men's race you can see at her speed she's still going you know she's moving well she's turning those that, that uh, the cranks around like she's not laboring on the gear you can just she's got not a lot of body movement you know, body movement often indicates fatigue. She she is riding super well. Yeah, and that's always the thing, isn't it? Never look at the facial expressions of rider. Always look at the form. It's the same across a lot of sports. You, you do talk about it. There's no head movement. The upper body's beautifully poised. We've seen the same. In fact, you're probably in one harder gear at the moment. And often a sign of fatigue is when they're leaning on two bigger gears. Yes, so she's just uh, about to come past our road now. She's coming to the finish. So she'll come back and then she'll get the bell lap. Two laps to go once she comes through town. So a further 20 kilometres to go. So there is still time left for this gap to close up. But she looks good as she comes past us here in the commentary position. And what the important thing is now, there will be a lot more support out on the course. There will be a lot more people yelling at her that will allow her to deal with things a little bit better mentally, Greg. Just that little bit of a pick up, that little bit of applause. Yeah, she knows the circuit now too. She knows exactly where she is. She can nail those corners. She can hide from the wind. She can just keep that one pace. You know, she's got a great gap, and it's now about she's got about 20 k's to go. She can she can feel the finish. Oh, 20 kilometres though. We do talk about a point in a race though where the exponential fatigue, uh, curve of fatigue kicks in in the men's race. We, we we talked about this almost being 180 kilometres. We all sort of agreed around the 130 k mark is when every kilometre, every five kilometres after that, the fatigue in the legs increases considerably in this women's race. Are we at that point now? For her, no, no question. She has been out there working hard, and yeah, 20 k is a long way, and you've got four riders still working really well together. We've just crossed a minute, and we still don't have them inside, so she's still got a good, still got a good minute lead. Let's just, I'm just keeping a time on it now. I'll let you know as soon as these chasing four come past, I'll let you know exactly what time gap we've got. So Mark Watson with you alongside of me, an icon of New Zealand cycling, a man who's ridden 12 Grand Tours, and Greg Henderson, Paige Patterson, former track cycling, cycling representative, bringing us all the expert analysis as we see this group of four riders now come through town. And I'll throw it over to you, Greg. There we go. We're right on about a minute 25. And you can see now, I think you'll just notice that the other Waikato Bay of Plenty girl there she is now doing exactly what i thought she would be doing and sitting on the back and saving her energy it's not up to her to try and catch her teammate okay so no. that is Teresa adam on the back tell you what uh, I, I thought there was only uh, 10k or so to go and we thought that was race over for this bunch of four but all of a sudden it is race on 20 kilometers to go <laughs> from when they go went over the finish line there and only the gap only won at 25. Uh, but, but Greg, I, I want to talk about this because you're assuming there are team tactics going, yes, you're riding for Waikato Bay of Plenty, but uh, I mean, what's in it for Teresa Adam? What's in it for her other than doing the right and honourable thing that often goes with bike riding? She's a professional triathlete. Uh, it's not a sport that she, she's not going to be racing and bike riding every week. She, she's got sponsors. Yeah, it's a tough one. It really is. Um, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but it's, you are racing for your centre, you know, it's, and it gives her a free card too, like, numbers game, statistically for the win, it's actually easier for her if she doesn't do the work on the back, she's fresher, if they do make contact, bang, she can hit them and away she goes solo, so I just, uh, 
in my mind, it just makes perfect sense to start resting the legs now. Okay, so interesting tactics. So she does have a friend back in the peloton. Our race leader, Kate McCarthy, she has a stable mate in Teresa Adam. And as Greg mentioned, it is the right thing. If they do bridge this gap, I wonder, Paige, whether we just see Teresa Adam attack immediately. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit wondering the same as you, Mark. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't have exactly... I wonder if even they had a conversation before the race even started, these two. I mean, they're certainly not on a pro team and not used to team tactics. One being Iron Man. I mean, it's, it's, it's an individual game, that one. And Kate McCarthy always riding for herself at the various tours around New Zealand. So I don't think they would have had a conversation, and I'd be surprised if they were working for each other. The last thing Theresa Adams would want to do is sit up and then all of a sudden uh, her teammate counter-attack herself. So... I mean, I think they'll be in it for themselves, the two wide op riders. Uh, Greg, let's just have a look at the, the bike set up here uh, for the most of the riders. Um, it, it, as we see, the third peloton now just come directly in front of us. So this is the, the remnants of the starting group, and they are actually the main... Well, the that's rest of the peloton. That's actually all that's left of the bike race. And actually, you'll notice they were still riding with a lot of intensity too. So they don't think the race is over yet too. They've still got 20 kilometres to catch. That was good to see. They're still racing. Yeah, the, the, the disadvantage they have is they've probably got a few more numbers. And we've talked about that just getting organised. But any time you see one long line, generally means the pace is on. Uh, technology in the bikes these days, is there much they can do in terms of setting up the bike aerodynamically on a, on a road frame? Absolutely. It's all, it's all changed over the years. You'll notice... That Disc brakes now, there's actually no exposed cables. Um, again, the, the very streamlined handlebars and, and stem are all integrated, they're all one piece. So they've definitely made a road bike very, very close to a time trial machine now. And you'll see that um, you know, even the way they ride the bikes now are in that leaned over, hands on the handlebars in that sort of semi time trial position like that right now. Look at that. That's as close as you can get to a time trial position on a road bike. And further forward on the seat too, which means that you see that with a lot of riders, they tend to probably use their hamstrings a little bit more when they're right on the end of the seat. And What are your thoughts, Greg, on the uh, disc brakes versus clinches? Um, yeah, I wasn't a big... When they first got introduced, it was probably three or four years ago, I was racing in the pro peloton. And, uh, yeah, I didn't see the need for them. Um... I'd never had a problem stopping, but, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with them. I actually, I've used them now on all my bikes, and, um, no, it's a, it's a nice piece of kit. And the last of our, well, three riders still coming back through. They'll have two laps through this inner city circuit to complete as we go back to the front of the women's race. And we have, we were going to bring, we're going to bring Rushley Buchanan into the commentary very shortly. Rushley has won this race on four occasions. Not competing today, Rushley, because... She is heading off to Track Cycling World Cups coming up. And Rushley Buchanan, good Hi. morning, welcome, how are you? <laughs> good, thanks. Rushley, you're not doing this, uh, but you are somebody who is very familiar with this particular course, with this 108 kilometres. How good has Kate McCarthy been? Yeah, I'm, I'm really stoked that someone's gone out there and, and raced their bike today and not waited for Mungakawa or any of the hills, so kudos to her. And, and It's going to be a hard slog, but uh, she, she looks like she's dedicated and it's, ex it's making for some exciting racing. What did you make of the chase group there? Uh, we, we've had a discussion here regarding with Therese Radham, who is technically riding in the Waikato Bay of Plenty Colours. Is she now at a point in this race where she might work for Kate? Yeah, it's an interesting situation when you have a national race like this and you have people racing for their centres but also for their pro team. Uh, I'm not sure if the Waikato team had a discussion before the race. Uh, I've been in the Waikato team before and it kind of can be each for, each for yourself, but I think later on as we, as we enter the last circuit, it might be, yeah, I'd say it's a good move to, to just let Ella and Neve do the work. You know, they're the big names. They've got the... They've got the pro contract, so they have more to lose, technically. Now, Russia, you've won this race more times than we've had hot dinners. Uh, are you uh, sad not to be out there today? Yes, definitely. It's kind of giving me this nervous energy. <laughs> I definitely want to be out there racing, especially in my hometown, all these home roads. I'd, I'd just love it. But, you know, we ha I've got something pretty big coming up in a few weeks, so I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket. Obviously away, uh, fly tomorrow to uh, Berlin, I think, for the World Championships. Yeah, correct. So a um, 108k race probably wouldn't be the best idea before flying 30 hours. 
definitely a little add, why add extra fatigue onto a, a fatiguing journey. If you're in that chase group of four, Rushley, what, what, what's the communication? What's being said at the moment? Yeah, they definitely have to get their act together and, and kind of work as a team. Otherwise, any hesitation and, and Kate's just going to get extra seconds. So, yeah, they do, they do just need to keep rolling through and, and the race isn't over until it's over. So um, there's, there's still some, quite a lot of ground to cover in, in terms of the race. Um, there's not that much wind, so it's going to need to be a constant power. They look like they're doing a pretty good job, though. Yeah, they're constantly working together, the four of them through and off, and I've been doing this all day. It was a great watch, race to watch. The, it attacked, as we thought, up Mangakawa. It blew to pieces up there. These are the remnants. They've caught, they haven't quite caught the initial breakaway yet, and she is riding so strong. It's, uh, I think it's going to be a really close call on the line. Yeah, talk about the wind, uh, historically, through the township of Cambridge. Uh, are there any particular parts of this inner city road circuit where out on your own is going to be tough? Yeah, there's roads out here on the circuit, Peak Road, Racecourse Road, they're wide open, there's no shelter, so any sort of wind direction, you're not going to get any cover, um, so that you are going to need to keep the power on, there's no hiding. I guess through town here, there, there is a little bit of hiding in between the buildings, but that's when you're out of sight, out of mind, so that's, that's when Kate can actually make up most of the time, as if she keeps the power on through town. Greg, you talked about how good she looks, just how relaxed she is through those arms too, you know, uh, it's like... She's not gripping the handlebars. She's not trying to sort of pull energy through that frame. Nice, smooth, just from the hips down. Yeah, we say she's not fighting the bike. You know, she's in that uh, as aero as you can get on a road bike right now. She's still, like I said, turning that at that constant cadence. Um, she's not all the way up the block on her cassette, so you can see she's actually pushing a reasonably sized gear, which means she's actually going quite fast. So to catch that, you've got to be going faster, and it's hard work. Yeah, and just a chance to get out of this seat there, just to stretch the legs. He's a slightly different muscle group as well. A cadence that she's riding at at the moment, do we see a lot of variation in the... Uh, with our women in regards to those athletes that love to push those bigger gears versus those that love to spin a little bit more? Yeah, road riders definitely love the low cadence, especially um, out on these open roads. At the end of a road race, you could be just going at 70 RPM. I like the fact that Kate's wearing a skin suit, you know? She's here, she's dedicated to a race, she's, she's put all her eggs in one basket and good on her. Yeah, we actually mentioned that exact same thing just before. It's like she's got that UFO chain on, the friction-free chain, she's got a skin suit, she's riding with the deep section wheels, she didn't bother with climbing wheels for the hills. She's going, right, here's my go, I'm gonna go solo, you guys have a crack at catching me. I'm just trying to get you some splits from out on the course but when they came through town with two laps to go that gap was one minute and 45 seconds from our race leader Kate McCarthy back to a chase group of four which includes Ella Harris, Neem Fisher Black, Kate McElroy and Teresa Adam. Men's race underway too and we will bring you coverage of the men's race at the end of this women's race and very shortly our race leader, Kate McCarthy, will come back through the start-finish line region and she will get the bell lap, which means she'll have about 10 kilometres, or I think it's around about 9 kilometres, to try and hang on in what would be a remarkable performance. And Rushley, how nice is it when you hear that bell lap? What sort of lift does that give you? Yeah, it gives you a lift that is un indescribable, especially when you've been out there all day. Uh, and, and hopefully the crowd will get behind her as well. She deserves a good, a good round of applause when she comes through with one lap to go. 10Ks, like I like to always break it down to time. How long does 10Ks take me? It may take me 12, 13, 4. I just break the effort down into time. It's only 14 minutes left, and I've finished this bike race. And the last two minutes will take care of itself. <laughs> That's <laughs> another way of playing the game, isn't it? I always used to say, you can't eat an elephant whole. You eat it in small pieces. You've just got to break it down piece by piece by piece. And because it, it, it's not just... You know, it's not just physical now, it is mental, isn't it? It's, it's, there's a lot of mental fatigue as well. Concentration's going to be important. And we're just getting an update from Andrew Dewhurst. 52 seconds, so it has been a considerable chunk of time taken out. But that still means with 9K to go, though... That's not enough. It not, <laughs> might not be enough at the moment. If that group of four start looking at each other, they are just going to need to absolutely put it down. And you just sense now that Kate McCarthy's getting another sort of real lift... Uh, just picking herself up, taking it to yet again another level. She senses that perhaps she is on course for arguably the greatest performance of her career. Rushley, what is going through your mind 
right now. If you are out there, what are you thinking? Well, I've actually been in this situation before myself uh, in Christchurch. Um, I did a solo attack. I was out there all day by myself, and Linda Willemson caught me about 200 metres from the finish line. But, um, you know, I'm going to pat myself on the back. I still managed to sprint her and win. <laughs> so the race isn't over until it's over, like I said before. And uh, she's just got to use every single ounce of energy, energy that she's got. No, no nervous um, breaks. Whereas these girls behind her are going to look at each other. They're going to play cat and mouse. And that's when she has to make the most of her opportunities. OK, well, Rusty, all the very best for the upcoming World Track Cycling Championships and hopefully later in the year in Tokyo as well. Thanks, guys. Have a good day out there, everybody. Right back to the front of the women's race. Rusty Buchanan, the four-time champion and just looking at the official race clock, two hours, 49 minutes and 10 seconds. Greg Henderson alongside of me, Jade, Paige Patterson as well. And very shortly, our race leader will come through town. She will get the bell lap. Form still looks good, Greg. Keep going back to it. But that's at this point, you've got to start going back to it because we are in that exponential curve of fatigue in terms of where we are in this race. And let's not forget... Yes, we're concentrating on how fatigued she is. Let's not forget that there's four people chasing that are also fatigued. You know, that's a combination. Of everyone out there is just now tired against tired. It's, it's a great race. And we just see there, is that just a little bit of a breakdown in communication? Kate Mackle, we're not looking to look necessarily want to try and come through and take a turn. And Teresa Adam having to go through. Still having sense to work. Maybe that breeze is coming up from across the left shoulder, possibly. Still having to work very hard, these... Uh, for riders and they were, it's still 53 seconds the gap. So they took off 30 seconds in the first lap. So they went from 125 down to 50 seconds, but they remained at 50 seconds. And so if they can only take off another 30 seconds, this next lap, they're only down to 20 seconds and they're still behind. So there's uh, two laps. 30 seconds a lap is not enough, my mama calculations. Exactly, she'll come through with the bell. If they continue to catch at this rate, they're not going to catch her in time. This is going to be really, really interesting. Well, what a performance. What a warrior from Kate McCarthy. However, this race ends up for her. She has shown plenty of courage. As Greg Henderson's mentioned, she's shown so much intent with the bike set up. This was the plan all day. And while everybody's talking about maybe some of the other riders with bigger reputations... She's gone away, she's done the work, and yep. she's taken her chance. So 53 seconds, she has up, and she is now hearing the bell. It's that extra lift she's going to get. And can she hold on? That is the question. Will we see a break from that bunch of fours? Someone else got the legs in that bunch to chase her down in this last 9.8 kilometres around the town circuit. Yeah, she hasn't. We haven't seen her reach for a drink bottle or take any food on board too, and that's just the other thing. She'll be having to just keep an eye on the fuel gauge. Nine kilometres to go. Unbelievable. If she pulls this off, an incredible ride. She absolutely deserves it. It's going to be the hardest nine kilometres of her life, but all to play for here. She is holding off four of the New Zealand's best bike riders, and she is holding them off on her own. This is an incredible well, what ride. What makes it more remarkable? You've got the New Zealand time trial champion in that chase group too. And, and uh, uh, Teresa Adam. Now, that gap comes through, and it will be 47, 48 seconds. So it is coming down. Nine kilometres to go. Unbelievable. 108 kilometres, and it is now, and it's an old cliche, but it's a good one, 100 kilometres of hope, and now it is eight kilometres of truth. Well, it's all going to come down to this last lap of town. I can't wait to see who makes the first attack from that bunch of four. Or are they all going to work together, swallow her up, and then uh, turns into one nice big sprint? Or is it the opposite? Does McCarthy stay away? There's too much, there's too much chase in that peloton. There's nothing that's actually going to... They, they are chasing as hard as they can to catch that lady. OK, we go back to the front of the men's race. Coming up, Mangakawa for the first time. And is it George Bennett on the front? That's Finn Fisher Black. Finn Fisher a really, on the black, my a, apologies. A real hard tempo. He wants, like George said, make it hard on the climb to hurt the legs. He's got his teammate riding a very, very hard tempo. You can see George just sitting on the wheel. He'll be comfortable there, but he knows everyone behind him is actually on the limit right now. You can, If you look down the peloton, <laughs> you can see you guys humped over the front of their bike. Well, there's a little gap here. The bungee cord almost breaking too between, say, the first six and seven riders. A little bit of a gap opening up as well. So we talked about George Bennett. He said, we're going to need to light it up early. We're going to need to really just try and take the sting out of the legs of a number of riders. They're doing exactly that. But it's very much a two-man job at the moment. And maybe some of those other World Tour riders, the likes of Sam Bewley, 
maybe need to come through too and then try and add to the damage and the hurt that's been put on the rest of this peloton. It's amazing to see stark difference. Those at the front look so cool, calm and collected and the others out the back, they're swinging side to side already up Mangakawa, throwing bottles out, all sorts. Oh, so we will come back to that men's race, but we're now back at the front of the 2020 Vantage Elite Under-23 and Open National Road Championships. This is the women's race, and our race leader for so much of this race is Kate McCarthy, but the challenges are coming from a group of four. Ella Harris, number 26. Neem Fisher-Black wearing number 30. We've got Kate McElroy, number 18. And we've got Teresa Adam at number 10. It was around about a minute 45 with 20 kilometres to go. It is now down to 48 seconds. The gap is closing. The question is, though, are they starting to run out of road? That's the big question. Is it close enough? It doesn't look like the time gap is coming down fast. But look at it. She's still peddling beautifully she is still riding fast she has not blown she's not running out of energy and she can smell the finish line now at what point now does she just uh, the main peloton now coming through in front of us in the commentary position at some point she might just want to discard that drink bottle to take any weight out of that bike oh fantastic ride and it's great to see she is so strong so late in this race and that bunch of four i don't think they've realized that they're not going to catch her because there needs to be a little bit more intensity if they're really going to put in an effort and uh overcome at kate mccarthy a true hero today what a fantastic ride everyone at this stage of the bike race everyone is tired everyone is fatigued she can now know that all she's got is about 10 minutes of riding left and she's going to win the national title this is incredible bike racing and it's a national title that's been going back to 1981 on the women's side and some wonderful athletes have won this particular road title uh, the likes of Sarah Ulmer, Kath Cheatley, to name a few. Uh, going back to the days of Kathy Lynch. So it's a long, illustrious list of uh, legends amongst women cycling. Alison Shanks, Rebecca Bailey. And boy, to have your name added to those, what an achievement that would be. We know some form that this Kate McCarthy's in. She's a policeman day to day. And uh, her partner being Dylan Kennett in the uh, men's road race. So I tell you what, she's... Uh, Certainly been some great form this summer, and uh, she's attacked this race. She's been off the front from uh, halfway through the race with uh, Georgia Perry, Olivia Ray. They weren't able to keep up with her pace, so she just kept going. And, man, more than 50K off the front in the uh, Nationals by yourself. A great effort. And you can see the four are still working really well together. And it, it, at some point in this bike race now, they're actually going to start to realise we can't race anymore for the win. We can't win now. Hang on. There's two spots left on the podium. Let's start to think about a silver medal. Let's start to think about a bronze medal. And that's when the actual bunch behind can start to slow down and cat and mouse a little bit. OK, so at what point do we see that? Who will wave that white flag? It's always the case, isn't it? Sometimes just one athlete, or in this case, a collective group, might just say second is good enough today. And all you can do, if that is the case, is walk up to Kate McCarthy, shake her hand because you've just been outclassed. There's nothing you could have done. Tell you what, if you look at uh, Kate McCarthy's number on the back there, there's plenty of wind out there, crosswinds along these roads. And it's pretty open and exposed here in Cambridge, around the outskirts of town. Just went past the Avanti Drome. She is not far away now from a national title, in my belief. So, road, it, road and time running out for our chase group of four. Kate McCarthy, are we looking at our 2020 New Zealand Women's Road Cycling Champion? And they're into the last three kilometres now. It is just a pure time trial. The legs will be burning. As Graham Miller, the great male cyclist, once said to me, at this point, you are breathing through your eyelids. You are just searching for oxygen any way you can get it. They can see her. They are on yeah. the same road. Mm. They can see her, but have they got enough time? <laughs> well, it's all or nothing now. Kate McElroy desperate to try and win this race to add to a long list of achievements from mountain running world champion to national titles and triathlon. This is the one that she's missed. She hasn't got. She'll be wanting it. Teresa Adam will be wanting to sort of, I, I guess, carry the flag for triathletes who sometimes get a bit of a bad rap from cycling saying, hey, we're great athletes in our own right. So there is so much motivation here for that chase group. And then, of course, you've got the brilliant Ella Harris who has the ability to blow everybody's legs away if it does come down to a sprint finish. Look at the desperate 
Look at the urgency now on this chase for they know they are running out of real estate as we come into the final now. There's probably only five minutes of bike racing left. Yeah, well, Kate McElroy there, you can see the grimace on her face. She is working hard. What is going through her head? Head like granite at this point. What an athlete. What a story. She's hanging tough. The locals here in Cambridge will be wanting to see a local win this one. And maybe an unfancied rider to do the unthinkable. Drawing every ounce of energy, going back on all of her experience, remembering all the bad days when she questioned herself whether it was actually worth getting out of bed and continuing. Oh, Kate McCarthy, look at her. She's got her head down. She is putting every ounce of energy left in her legs through those pedal strokes. But I tell you what, that group of four, she's in sight now. Oh, it's going to be fascinating to see if that gap comes down. She's not even looking back. She does not want to look over her shoulder and have a look at the four hunting her down. All she is focused on now is getting to that finish well, line. three kilometres becomes two kilometres. They cannot afford to look at each other. They cannot worry about who's going to win the race within the race at this point. Much more urgency. And this is expected from Kate McCarthy. Oh, she has a look. She has a wee look. She has a wee look. She's now sitting up. I just wonder whether she's riding to a little bit of a headwind here, possibly. Oh, could this slow her down? Those uh, roads out by the race course. And look, oh, the oh. Gap comes is the, the gap. group. They're about to oh. turn a right hand. <gasps> it is going to come down to the wire, ladies and gentlemen. This. Settle in. One of the great women's races beginning to develop here through the main oh. streets oh. of Cambridge. She's right what there. What a race. She's right there. Here we go. Four chasing one. Oh, this can only be only 20, 30 seconds between it now. They're definitely in sight. I can tell you what, their heads are going down. I wonder what these four are thinking. Oh, here goes Ella Harris. Oh, no, she's sitting up. I think the tempo's too strong at the moment for one to go off the front. They've got a wee sniff now. They're all in power. The adrenaline begins to pump. Look at their a good thing here from Theresa Adam, the New Zealand time trial champion, taking a wee drink. What is going through her head? That is slowly beginning to close. At this point, it's not so much a case of the riders behind going any quicker. It's more a case of her starting to come back as the fatigue levels begin to kick in. Oh, it's going to be so close. Teresa Adams, is she going to work hard within the bunch? Is she going to pull the bunch through? We know her strength. We know her power. Kate McElroy having to do the work on the front, but they're still working very well together. They want to chase down Kate McCarthy. Well, at what point does Teresa Adams just decide to go and try and bridge? Greg Henderson, you talked about getting the side of a rider. Can you bridge across? At the moment, she is still solo. The people down here at the finish line in the main streets of Cambridge are urging her on. They're willing her on. Look at her. She is fighting. Look at the grimace on her face. There is just not far to go now. She is just giving everything she has got. She can almost see the finish line. The four behind her, though, you've got to remember, they are flat stick too. There is nothing. They've got nothing left in the legs. Everyone is empty right now. Well, definitely fatigue there, though, in Kate McCarthy. The head not quite as still as it has been. That position, that aero position, just been somewhat compromised. She's going to need to really just kick out of these corners, get out of the seat. Oh, still looking behind. I, I, oh, it's come down. There must be 10 seconds, 15 seconds in it now, and it's uh, going to feel like the longest two kilometres of her life with Kate McCarthy out there. Well, at one point, at point you are, you're starting to feel like you're almost riding through quicksand at this point. It's going to feel like maybe the brakes are on. You're not quite in the right gear. Am I too easy? Am I too hard? Still, though, in that aero position, hanging tough, she, riding beautifully. She's just turned into a tailwind section now, and again, this will help her because this is a really difficult to catch someone in a tailwind. The policewoman from the Waikato Bay of Plenty region Oh, she's putting the foot down now. I think she looked over her shoulder and figured that they're a little closer than what she thought. And the bunch of four, they are working well together. They're sharing the workload. She's done it all herself out the front. There is not one girl in that group chasing four that has missed a turn. They are 100% committed to try and get to the front of the bike race in time to try and win this national title. It is not over yet, ladies and gentlemen. Well, good crowd starting to build here in the finish line in the center of Cambridge, the home of cycling one of their own oh. turning into Vogel so not far to go now 50 the kilometers out the front by herself don't look back keep pedaling and that breeze is just picking up we're just sitting here in the commentary position the wind is just starting to now come into play they've got her in her sights 
I honestly You've got feel, it in her I feel sorry for her. Now, <laughs> I on. think this is where we could just see Ella Harris now starting to think a little bit. Now, a little bit of indecision in that chase group. They're starting to think about it. Ella Harris, she knows she's probably got the best sprint amongst these women riders. Oh, they start playing cat mouse and she puts the hammer down at the front. She can still hold on to this. What a race. You could not ask for a better finish, could you? This is going to come right down to the wire. With 20k to go, you thought it was over. 10k to go, still over. Now look, they're within striking well, range. Well, they will pull her in, I think. I think they will pull her in. We saw it some years ago in the Tour de France, didn't we, with Jack Bauer. And how sorry did you feel for him? And now... They still need to catch her. They, they still, still need to catch her. They still got to catch her. She has the benefit of coming in and out of these corners on her own. The other four have to go. She's about to take a left-hand turn into Hamilton Road. But that gap is now down to about 50 metres, and we see a first attack coming from Theresa Adam and immediately jumping across onto her wheel. It's Neem Fisher Black. So, it's oh, all together. Still haven't caught it. It's all together. Still haven't caught it. The left-hand turn, they still haven't caught it. We're about to see four become five, are we? And you'd suggest that someone will attack immediately. Who will that be? Will it be Kate McElroy? So what a race, and it is all over. The flag has been waved. The white flag has come out. She's had no choice. And now we see Theresa Adam go immediately to the front and look to light it up. The New Zealand time trial champion. The gap is open. It is rider Neem Fisher Black. And so suddenly a group of four have come down to two. But here we go. We're seeing now, uh, uh, we, we're now seeing young Ella Harris look to try and jump across two. We're down to three riders with less than a kilometre to ride. This is incredible. Ella Harris just tagged on the back there. She was in big trouble trying to get across. She's made it now. She'll get 10 or 15 seconds to recover now. The girl on the front is obviously flat stick. Here we go. We're going to come down to a bunch of three. Who is going to have the fastest sprint here? Oh, so wonderful. So Kate McElroy is gone. Three riders remain. Teresa Adam on the front driving it. She doesn't have the kick. What does she do? She's going to need to try and go early. She's asking for someone to come through and take a turn. They're not prepared to do it. She'll want to take it out a lot further out than the last one to 200 metres, Greg Henderson. Ella Harris is in the perfect position here. She's sitting on the wheel. She knows where to be. The, the attack is gone. Who has got the legs to follow? What a great a little and, kick and it's a left hand turn to come and that is a big gap that is a big gap that's hard to close so nobody's got the legs to get that ella harris it's not going to happen down. it's not going to happen and she will win this race in one of the great races and one of the great performances and it is neem fisher black who will take the national title with a piece of strategic riding that is textbook textbook ride from the youngster wow what a performance from the under 23 athlete neem fisher black from tasman stand up you are the new zealand road champion for 2020 but you have to feel for kate mccarthy what a performance from her greg henderson mate that was just incredible you do you absolutely feel for her she was just so strong all day and literally got caught in the final kil kilometer can you believe it well i can't the adrenaline is pumping here in the commentary oh. box. How good was that? Oh, I mean, How good I, I, was I that? I don't think it could get any better, to be honest. I mean, it was they, they only caught her a K to go. So, I mean, it was all on from there. And there was a little bit of cat and mouse going on before they'd even caught her. I thought maybe they might not even catch her. And then all of a sudden she tagged on to the back. Teresa Adams took off about, you know, 900, 800 metres to go. Next thing you know, I thought uh, Ella Harris was going to get to the front. But all it took was a simple attack coming into that final corner. As you said, easier to go through the corner individually. And the rest of the bunch had to fight it out for uh, their uh, minor uh, positions. But Neem Fisher-Black, she was brilliant, wasn't she? Because she had the power horse and Theresa Adam, who had just done her turn. And she just knew that probably she was the one athlete who could bridge any attack. But having done that turn on the front, she just burnt just that few too many matches. And in that ability to try and recover, she went. And you, like we talked about, everybody was fatigued, but we saw it cost Ella quite a bit of energy to, to actually get to those lead two. That might have been the effort that she needed to then actually do her final sprint. Mm. So she was on the limit to get across to those two. And then, of course, when they opened up the sprint, Ella just didn't have the legs. Kate McCarthy, what do you say to her? Oh, I want to give her a hug, <laughs> don't you? Well, I mean, we need a fourth podium, don't we? Oh. We need a Most top aggressive. five, don't we? <laughs> that was impressive. I mean, fascinating stuff. You'd love to know what was happening out there in that bunch of four. Actually, who was doing the work? Who were the ones that were um, pulling the bunch up to that bunch, uh, that lead rider? I mean, what happened in that last, you know, lap where we thought they weren't going to catch her? Did someone put the foot well, down? 
I, I don't sense they were wired up to radios. It was no. more just about you feel. could tell. It was just more about. You could tell everyone was so fatigued at the finish. You just knew everyone was working as hard as each other. It just came down to a little bit of luck, a little bit of tactics at the finish, and who had a little bit of kick left over. Nobody was saving any energy out there today. Well, we'll try and catch up with those that were part of just a wonderful live stage play, if I can call it, with Neem Fisher-Black winning the 2020 Women's National Road title, the under-23 title. What a performance. Wow. And we've still got the men out there <laughs> yeah. dueling it out over almost 180 kilometres and we'll pick up that men's race. We'll also get plenty of reaction from our women from Andrew Dewhurst who's out on the course. But I hope you are enjoying the coverage. Greg Henderson alongside of me, man who wrote 12 Grand Tours, World Track Cycling Champion, Commonwealth Games Gold Medal. And as I say that, we have got Andrew Dewhurst standing alongside of our national champion, Neem Fisher-Black. How cool is this? Uh, so young. What a race. National champion. What's your initial reaction? Uh, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's pretty um, unbelievable, actually. I, that was a flake. Oh, a first-year pro and to wear the national jersey this year is going to be amazing. Like, uh, yeah, I have no words. When you came into this weekend, was this even part of your dreams? Oh, it was there. It was in the dreams, definitely. With the... I um, backed myself to do it. I think, yeah, that was all going to be decided on the day. And, um, yeah, I, today somewhere I found the legs, so. Tell, tell me about the way that race played out because Kate just absolutely emptied the tank out in front and it looked like she'd done enough. Did you guys feel you were catching in time over the last two months? Oh, that was, that was an insane effort. Um, up the top of Munga Car, we got a time check. And she was still almost about three minutes ahead of us. And I just was thinking, oh, my gosh, we're not going to catch her. And um, even over the top of French Pass, she still had two and a half minutes. And, yeah, I think, I think we were starting to worry, definitely. When did you think you would catch her? Was it literally in the last kilometre or so? Oh, I think coming through the finish line with one lap to go. Uh, I think we got a time check just before that. And started to realise we were closing it down pretty quickly. And so, yeah, we just put the hammer down from there and then we, we could see her ahead of us, so we knew that was the race. I mentioned you're so young to, to be winning a national title. You're, you're about to head into full-time pro riding. Uh, who's helped you along the way? Who, who do you think of right now in this moment? Oh, my, my, oh, my family, my dad and my brother. My brother's probably my biggest inspiration out there. Um, and my coaches, Patrick and Sammy, they just insane, always there for me, like, I, I wouldn't have the legs to do this, would I, without them, so, yeah, big thank you to all those people. And, and what now, I mean, this sets up your year beautifully, what, what are the goals from here? Um, oh, I mean, it's all, everything's new for me this year, so it's all just going to be about learning, learning my way around things, moving up the ranks and seeing how it goes. Congratulations, national champion, Vantage Elite national champion. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, Greg Henderson, what a future. Wow. Oh, that was just, yeah, you could see the emotion, and she was just almost in shock that she's won the, the national title. i tell you what was very interesting I noticed from that uh, interview was they had a, a lot more information than what we had here at the commentary box. They were... They were having time checks all the time. They were confident that it was coming down fast enough, whereas we can't quite picture that here and watching from the television. So they were quite confident, OK, we are going to catch her, but I don't reckon they <laughs> thought they were going to catch her with 1K to go. Yeah, and she said that the time was coming down quickly. I didn't get the feeling it was like that out here. I mean, we were getting time checked from the course, but it was sort of 50 seconds and then went up to 53 again and then back down to 42 and it was sort of hovering around that 50-second mark. There was no, from our perspective, that it was quickly they were chasing her down. Well, well, it just shows though, doesn't it, that the women's road cycling program in this country, uh, there's some wonderful talent out there and just these youngsters starting to come through. Greg, we had a bit of a discussion during the commentary about when do athletes start to really peak and really, you know, 
maximise their potential. And you came up with an interesting point that it's changing a lot. That's a lot of the younger riders, and we saw that again today. Absolutely. We, we just spoke about, um, obviously, the, the latest Tour de France winner, a young 23-year-old. They can just... Uh, the, the power they produce now, um, the way the sport's changing, evolving, uh, whether it's nutrition, aerodynamics, all of those, all of the uh, major important factors. And, uh, yeah, you're seeing, you're seeing youngsters win very big, very prestigious bike races. Yeah, yeah and I guess the positive thing here today, too, and what, what we've seen, too, is that it, we, we saw Kate McCarthy up the road who, you know, um, a much stronger build mm. than we, what we saw from the Fisher Black. But at the end of the day, it was still that light, lighter rider that got across and got the job done as well. Mm. And I'll be honest, I watched the speed of her final sprint, and Paige, you can comment on this, but she was moving quick in that mm. sprint. She had a very aerodynamic position. She was over the handlebars, very Caleb Ewan-esque mm. sprinting, and she was moving. That was a fast sprint. Yeah, yep, no, no doubt about it. And uh, the thing is, again, power-to-weight ratio and sprint, sprints, you know, they weren't travelling at a, like, very quick speed. It was pretty close to the top, but when she got out of the seat, the others just couldn't match it. Now, we are going to pick up the men's race, uh, road race shortly, but Andrew Dewhurst is standing by with an athlete who was a part of what was just a wonderful chapter in the rich history of this race, standing by with Ella Harris. Well, Ella, uh, what a race. You're part of a chase pack, and I guess when you chase down a, a leader like that, you want the, the legs to get to the line first. Just wasn't to be today, but what a chase. Yeah, it was a really tough chase out there. As soon as the break went, I saw three strong riders and I thought this could potentially be hard to bring back um, over Mangakaru and French Pass. I knew that they'd probably actually be able to climb quite well, so I thought we'd have our work cut out for us, and we certainly did. Um, it was just all hands on deck for the final uh, 30k once we got off French Pass, really, just slapping around, um, just closing down Kate very slowly as she was just so strong out there today. Um, but we... Managed to get her in the final 3K, um, but from there, I was pretty toast. Um, I could have tried something, but realistically, I just didn't have the legs. So I just tried to follow the wheels, follow the moves. Um, I knew Neve would be the one to beat in the sprint, and yeah, I didn't have a chance against her. So realistically, second was the best um, I could have placed in that bunch today. So yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that. Close but no cigar, but you know, there's always next year. It certainly looked like you were all doing your share. There was no one just sitting on the back, was there, in that chase group? No, um, the other three were very strong, and I certainly felt like the weakest link, but I just kept battling through, rolling around, and, uh, yeah, they were all so strong out there today. Uh, there's such a generation coming through. Pretty cool to be a part of this young group of riders, and uh, I know you'll share a little bit of delight in Neve's win today, even though you wanted it desperately. Definitely. Um, I mean, it's always cool to see the New Zealand jersey in Europe, and I, knew, and I know Neve. Um, we'll do it proud at Big Like a Tusha. It's a really cool team to have the New Zealand jersey at. Um, so I think it's just going to be awesome seeing it out there in the European peloton like um, George Williams had it a couple of years ago and that was really cool. So, I mean, I would have liked to have taken it over there, but to see Neve wearing it will be pretty cool also. Uh, well done. Second today is still a wonderful result. Well done on a great start to the year. Thank you very much. Oh, Ella Harris, what a classy competitor indeed. And just confirm that it will be Neem Fisher Black who wins the under 23 title. She is the overall national women's road racing champion. And it was Ella Harris who was second in the under 23s. The first elite woman across the line was Teresa Adam. Still just uh, trying to pick up pictures from the men's race. And we'll go to that as soon as we can. Um, and we are hoping also to catch up and have a chat with Kate McCarthy. Uh, for Kate McCarthy, where to now, Greg Henderson? The pub. <laughs> <laughs> or bed. <laughs> or bed. <laughs> no. Um, Not what you'd do, Greg, what <laughs> she would do. I'll tell you, actually, just firstly, before we touch on that, um, really interesting interview with Ella. She was, uh, you know, you could obviously see in her face the disappointment of finishing second, and, you know, like we've spoken before, I've been in that situation many times at the National Champs. And, but she was very pragmatic, and she was like, I was not strong enough today in the final, and that was, um, you know, she knew the best that she could do on that day was second place. So, yeah, it's all, it's always sad, it's always upsetting to finish, you know, the bridesmaid runner-up. But uh, you know, she was obviously very, very gracious in defeat, and I like to see that. Mm. Well, well, Kate McCarthy, they'll have a big, um, yeah, they'll certainly have a, have a big 
uh, spot on her back going forward and uh, she won't be able to get away with those tactics oh, again. That, that's the thing now. She'll be marked, won't she, in any sort of race. Yeah. People will turn up and go, well, let's have a look at a bike set up. Right, we know what her plan is. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I mean, even in, you know, in racing within New Zealand, but also I reckon uh, internationally there'll be a few... Uh, People out there t t taking her name down for uh, future prospects in their, you know, pro road teams as well. Right, let's catch up with Andrew Dewhurst, who is standing by with really arguably one of the great heroes of the day and a courageous performance, Kate McCarthy. Well, it's a cruel sport. Uh, you, you're the star of the day, but uh, you're not going to be on that uh, top step. Uh, what a ride. You just put it all out there. That's cycling, isn't it? Yeah, yep, that's for sure. I, um, I'm a bit gutted, but I'm happy with how I went, yeah. Were you getting splits, Kate? Were you getting updates as to uh, how that chase was going behind you? Yep, yep, I was. So it got out to about four minutes and then it slowly kept crawling back until I <laughs> could see in the last down race course it was about 20 seconds and then I thought, oh. <laughs> but, no, I was happy. Mm. Yeah, a wonderful ride. I mean, tell me going into the race, was that part of the plan? Did you, did you race to a tactic today in terms of when you made your move, going solo so early? Um... It was, but probably not as early as that. Um, I saw two of the girls go off the front and the bunch sort of he hesitated. And I thought, oh, I'll go with them. Um, and it worked out well, yeah. And uh, obviously this is a title that people so desperately want to win and you've played such a huge part in the race today, but just makes you even hungrier to come back again? Oh, yeah, for sure. This is only my second nationals. Last year I think I was about 15 minutes down, so I'm really happy with today. Yeah, it's, it's the toughest interview to have to do. We thank you so much for joining us. And again, from everyone, well done. Brave race, wonderful race. And uh, I know you've emptied the tank, but well done. No, cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, Greg Henderson, I've got to say, I almost have a bit of a tear in the eye. I do feel for her. Um, but what, just a lovely smile, just quintessential New Zealand. Yeah, that's her second nationals ever, you know, and she nearly won, nearly won the bike race. She was the most uh, animated there. Um, I, by all accounts, the strongest rider out there today. Um, you know, as we spoke about, her tactic was to, to make the break, make the attack. Um, it happened a little earlier than she thought it was going to, but uh, yeah, yeah, just the hard, like they said, hard interview to do. But um, you really feel for it, don't you? Mm, indeed, and that's the nature of sport, isn't it? It can be cruel at times, but look, I don't think it's one of those what if moments, one of those if only moments. I think. You know, she said she'd prefer to have gone maybe a little bit later in this race, uh, but circumstances played out the way she did, and nothing ventured, nothing gained. No, I mean, I think she will gain a lot of confidence from that race going forwards, you know, into the season ahead, and maybe, you know, maybe she might be putting some big races on her calendar now, knowing that she, you know, is able to stay out and ahead, and, you know, you, you heard the other riders who are on the podium, and they said, man, they're very impressed with her effort in itself, so, I mean, they're on the pro tour as it is, so... I mean, you know, write it down in your book, Kate McCarthy, a name to watch. Uh, we also do need to mention uh, the fact that w we did have Theresa Adam in the group, who, who is a professional triathlete, who rode incredibly well too, uh, to get into that break, to do it a lot of work, to do a lot of the chasing, also the veteran and Kate McElroy. Well, did you notice that it was Theresa Adam driving that break right at the end there? I wonder mm -hmm. if she knew that she was actually up for the elite women's national title and was more concerned with winning that title over the actual across the line because, you know, tactically speaking, leading it out from a kilometre to go is not typically how you win a bike race. Um, I wonder if she had that in her mind. Mm. Mm. OK, so we are going to try and bring you pictures very shortly of the men's road race. We do understand there is a bit of a break that have gone up on the road in that. Five elite, two under 23s is what I'm hearing from the commissaire's vehicles. So we will just go back and have a look at this race course for the men's, uh, this very beautiful, picturesque, but very testing course of 172 kilometres for our elite men. And Greg Henderson, we have spoken about this earlier, but just looking at that, and particularly you've done some analysis on wind directions. Yes, so, um, and obviously, as we know, can play a vital, vital part of, uh, of any sort of bike race, but um, predominantly it looks like they are faced with a headwind up, th up the main Mangakawa climb. And now what that actually does is if you're six, seven, eight, or 10 back in the peloton, you're actually getting a lot of shelter, whereas the guy who's, who we saw setting a really hard tempo was Finn Fisher Black for his teammate George Bennett. But the guys 10 back, they're not getting as much of a hammering as what they would if it was fast or a crosswind up there. So it can actually save them and work in their benefit. 
just mentioned the name Finn Fisher Black. Of course, his sister has just been crowned national champion. Yeah. And brother out there riding for George Bennett. And we understand up French Pass, there has been a break. It has gone away. Five elite riders and two under 23 riders. So we'll bring you pictures as much as we can. Uh, Greg, we've had the benefit here of the looking at the street circuit. And we've seen the women race over it. Uh, the breeze is just starting to pick up a little bit more. So when the men do come into town and hit that on multiple occasions, it will be something they'll need to factor in probably more so than what we've seen with the women. Absolutely. In a small group, and if you need to make that small group even smaller, you pick through a corner, you attack through a corner, that's going to open up into a crosswind, you put it directly in the gutter, and there's only enough room, there's only enough space on the road for a couple of bike riders, and that's how you make your breakaway on the finishing circuits. I'll tell you what's fascinating too, just having a look at that means course, there's two laps of that Mangakawa circuit. It makes a whole lot of difference. Imagine if the woman had done another you know, lap of that Mangakawa, we could have seen them catch uh, Kate McCarthy then. So, I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see actually who those five riders are that are away and ahead. And as we saw, you can catch people on that town circuit. OK, right, we do have an interview standing by with the gentleman we've been talking about, Mr Finn Fisher-Black. So Andrew Duhu has caught up with him earlier. Well, Finn, uh, welcome. Pretty cool riding in those colours. Pretty cool with the other bloke that's riding in them as well. You a bit nervous? Yeah, definitely a bit nervous. Um, yeah, it's going to be a big day for, for me and George, and um, hopefully hopefully this is the year for him, and uh, it's my, my big chance to step up as a, as a worker for him. So, But... Um, but uh, of a kind of big deal for me. He's a bit of a childhood hero for me from my hometown, Nelson. So, yeah, it's a big deal for me. So do we take it from that that essentially you sacrifice your chances today? I mean, is that a given? Is that a, an untold secret here? Yeah, I mean, I've got, I got a few years to work up to be where George is. So it's um, only right that I dedicate my race to him today. So, yeah. Obviously, legs feeling good after that very good ride on Friday. So you bounce back, okay? Yeah, thank you. No, it was, um, yesterday was a pretty easy day. We just did a lap of the Mangakawa circuit. Reminded myself how brutal it was, but um, yeah, legs are okay now. It should be a good day. Have a good one. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, fascinating battle now. Just while that's been going on, we're just going to bring it to commentary here. We do apologise, but Teresa Adam. Not a lot of people in the pure cycling fraternity know a lot about Teresa, but won the time trial on Friday and a very courageous and gutsy performance today in the women's road race. Greg Henderson, I'm going to let you do this interview because you've probably got more questions um, as somebody who's been at this in regards to how things played out out there. Well, what a fascinating race and it came down to the wire. What was what was the thoughts going through you? Like, even just a lap to go, what, what, was, what were you thinking? Like, it looked like the bike race was over. Yeah, well, um, we came back into town and we kept getting splits. We had about two and a half minutes. But um, the uh, Neve and Ella and Kate and I just kept rolling. Everyone took a turn, no one skipped turns, and everyone rolled hard, and we just kept chipping away, and yeah. We noticed that. We noticed that, that no one was missing turns. Everyone was, like, absolutely committed to the, to the task at hand. Um, and, yeah, the time gap just consistently kept chopping down. Did you know, because it was difficult for us here to know exactly whether it was coming down fast enough, did you actually get a feeling it's going to happen in time? I, don't, I didn't know. I don't bike race a lot. I have not much experience here. So I just ride hard and, um, you know, hope for the best. So um, for me, like I said, I, I guess I've done three road races in 10 years. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you think about the odds, though. There's one girl out there. She's been out there for 70 k's now-ish, 60 k's. So, and we're rolling hard and we're, you know, averaging over 40 k an hour. It's kind of like, you know, it'll come down hopefully or she might be strong enough to hold on. You don't know. Was there a point, though, where you thought it's not going to come back? Um, yeah, definitely. Like, I know Kate, you know, she did really well on the TT on Friday. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it seemed like a big gap. Yeah. Uh, in, in terms of, were you thinking of a tactic if it did come back together? Did you have a plan? Were you going to attack immediately? Um, I knew, for me, the, my sort of game plan was further back in the race and trying to get away and have a bit of a gap. But um, I just didn't have it today. But um, And the girls were insanely strong. So, um, like I said, I don't do this much. And um, I just wanted to roll hard. And then when we saw Kate and we were about to catch, it was about 3K to go, I went hard. Um, I knew I don't really have a sprint. Um, normally race for nine hours. So... Um, <laughs> 
yeah, I went hard and then um, they got on my wheel and I just gave it everything this last rate. Yeah, and what I, what I found particularly interesting was we had a Waikato Bay of Plenty girl up the front and I noticed you did not miss one turn. Like, tactically, typically tactically, it would be in your best interest to maybe skip a few turns and use that card of a teammate up the up the road saved a little bit of energy but i think maybe i think maybe the break was just too dangerous if you had started to do that i think the the bunch that you were in would have lost a lot of interest and then maybe never have caught her again but did it ever occur to you that maybe you could miss a couple of turns because you're on the same team like i said i I don't have those thoughts out there. I don't know what I'm doing, really. <laughs> I right. race Iron Man, so I didn't really think about anything like that. I just ride hard. Okay, just the recovery. You won the time trial on Friday. Um, were you concerned that that would maybe just, you know, affect your performance two days later? Because often it's not the next day that you're tired. It can be 48 hours later. Oh, yeah, definitely woke up pretty tired this morning and um, not super tapered. I'm racing Iron Man New Zealand in three weeks and I can't afford to let my fitness drop too much um, and taper here and then taper again um, so it, it was difficult we kind of just chucked it in um, I'm obviously extremely stoked with how I've gone this weekend um, yeah it, yeah like I said I did wake up pretty tired and I looked when the break went initially I was I, that first lap was just really hard for me a lot of surging which I'm not used to which is what we talked about we thought that might be yeah. an area of weakness for yeah. you but <laughs> just that change in speed you're used to a sort of a more high aerobic state all yeah. day yeah 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 so that hurts um definitely um hurts me in the legs and um so I was just I kind of wanted to sit in for, for a decent amount of time and yeah see oh. how it went Fantastic ride today. It was very impressive. We're all in the commentary here just um, impressed with... I think any any one of those five riders deserved the win today, and it was uh, it was just fantastic to watch, actually. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of fun. It was a cool race, and um, like I said, I enjoy going hard, and everyone was committed to going and racing hard, and that's that's a good day. Well, well done, Teresa. Thank you so much. Cheers. All the best for the New Zealand Ironman in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you so much. There you go. She's probably off for a uh, 20k jog now, I suppose. <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> 18, she just told me. 18. Uh, right. We are just trying to bring, having a few technical difficulties, trying to bring you live coverage of the men's race. Uh, one man who would be desperate again to have the colours of New Zealand, part of his trade team colours in Europe, is the two-time Olympic Games bronze medals. The man they affectionately call Wagon from Rotorua, Sam Bewley. Andrew Dewhurst caught up with him. Well, Sam, welcome to the Nationals. Always a big day. There's a lot of excitement, uh, and it's great to have you guys back. Uh, this is a big title to chase, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's becoming pretty elusive for the professionals. Uh, it's been a long time since, since the jersey's been in the World Tour over in Europe, so I think all the pros are here are pretty motivated to, to be the first guy in a while to take it over there, so it's going to be a good race. In some ways, does that make it even tougher? You're all having to crack at each other while the others are all sitting back, maybe? Yeah, well, it's been like that in the past, and, I mean, I guess as the years go by where, it, where it's not in Europe, the pressure starts to build and, and every, every pro wants to be the, the first guy to do that for, for a while. So, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly be racing against each other like we will be against every other person in the race. But hopefully between us, we can, uh, we can have the jersey over there. You're not the smallest uh, body out there. Uh, your thoughts on this, this course? Is it a, a case of getting yourself over the hills and then holding on? Yeah, it's pretty. It's very hard, that middle section. Uh, obviously, we've got 60 or 70k flat at the end, which will suit me a little bit better than the first part of the race. But, uh, you, you know, you just got to play your cards right. And, um, yeah, for me, it's about weathering the storm through those climbs. Obviously, George is going to be, be hard to follow up those climbs. But, um, yeah, i just got to get through the best I can and uh, make sure that I arrive on, the, on these circuits here, at least in contention, and then play it out from there. You've got Dion in the same colours. Uh, have you spoken to anyone else? Uh, there, are there any uh, deals you can tell us about? <laughs> nah, there's no deals. Uh, I've got one, one other teammate, and that's Dion. So uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing our best to try to take the jersey for Mitchelton Scott. Good stuff. Have a good day. Cheers, mate. Thank you so much. Uh, Sam Bewley there mentioning um, fellow teammate and Dion Smith, Greg Henderson, uh, a rider that I know talking to you prior to the start of this race, you felt has got a very, very good chance today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. He's um, he's just such a talent. Um, he can just about do anything on the bike. Uh, he can climb close to the best on the, on the short climbs, the short steep climbs. And um, technically, you know, Mangakau, it looks big for us here in New Zealand, but compared to the European climbs, it is a small climb. It's, you know, eight, nine-minute um, nine climb. But 
his finishing speed is very, very fast. You know, in a bunch sprint, he just uh, he actually just did the lead out for um, Caden Grove in the Sun Tour last week, and Caden Grove won the stage. And Dion was going that fast; he held on for the second place. So, definitely, definitely a um, a danger man to come to the finish. Well, let's hear from Dion Smith. What were his team? What were his tactics coming into today's National Road Racing Championships? Well, Dion, uh, everyone's saying it. This is a sought-after title, isn't it? You've been on the podium twice here. How much would it mean to you to get the win? Oh, it would be massive. I mean, I mean that's why we're here. That's why we've made the effort to stay in New Zealand a little bit longer and um, even to delay the Nationals by... Well, not delay, but move the Nationals by, by a month so we can get a bit of racing and a bit more training in um, just to make that little bit of difference. How are your legs coming into this? You, you've had some work in Aussie? Yeah, no, it was a good Aussie campaign. Um, yeah, I mean, you never know. It's a one-day race, so. but the, the form is definitely there. Uh, the legs are hopefully going to come out today. What is it that makes it so special? Uh, I guess every national champion wants to take that jersey, those colours, back to Europe, yeah? Yeah, I mean, you know, every race you, you go into, you're wearing the fern and... Um, you know, we're such a small country, and to other other riders in Europe, they'll be like, you know, what's what what is this jersey? And sort of, I guess, yeah, it gives us more exposure, New Zealand cycling, and um, just proud to wear it. Really, you know, all Kiwis are pretty proud of their country. So, break down the course for me in terms of your approach today. I'm sure you've had a very good look. Yeah, uh, Sam and I reconned this course a couple of weeks ago, and. It's very interesting. Uh, a lot of climbing at the start and a lot of flat at the finish. So it's it's quite an open book, I think. Um, so yeah, I mean we'll see. It's it's nice to have Sam here as well. It gives us you know two cars to play instead of just just one. So um, if we're going to be on the front foot most of the day, that's that's probably the best start. Have you got to be there off the hills, or can you make up ground if you're a couple of minutes down? And, and I'm not saying you will be, but could you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you miss the initial break, it depends who's up there. Um, there could be a group that comes across. Uh, depends how hard George Bennett goes up the climb. Um, but yeah, it's definitely anything can happen at nationals. You never know. So yeah, like I said, you just want to be on the front foot with either one of us in the move or both of us. It just really depends how the first 50k pans out. Good luck today, but also uh, good luck for uh, for the whole campaign this year. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, Greg Henderson, Dion Smith there. Uh, what a meteoric rise too. Just another young rider and just more and more of our young riders making their way into the World Tour and that continental level and getting into the professional ranks. Yeah, he's uh, a classic bike rider and, um, you know, he's very confident in his form right now, as he said. Uh, you know, he had a good week racing. Um, delayed his departure back to Europe for this special occasion, the national title. Everyone knows how important this national title is and, you know, it's all about how hard they're going to go up Mangakau the second time. And uh, you've got a little bit of an update on the course. We understand there was a break that has gone up the road in the men's race. They are approaching Mangakawa. What's the latest? So the latest is they've got about two minutes, just maybe two minutes 15 as, they, as the break turns onto the bottom of Mangakawa. Now this, to me is the launch pad for George Bennett. This is the time that he's going to go, he's going to try and bridge that 2 minute 15 gap across to that break, hoping that none of his major contenders come with him, and then that he can actually get that group to work together and try, try it like anything to try and hold it to the line. But I think this is going to be the climb. Now, Finn Fisher Black is in that breakaway group. We do understand that, trying to get some of the other numbers. So if that is the case, and he's in that group, he's there ultimately working for George Bennett, what does he do? How yep. does he play this? Couldn't have asked for a better person in the break. And, you know, it's almost... If I was looking at the bike race, it would be the one guy I probably wouldn't let go in the, in the break. It would be like, you know, I know what you're going to do when, when you go off the break there. I know that George is going to come across for you. And then I just know... That how, you know how strong Finn Fisher Black is. You saw the time trial he did on Friday. He's incredibly strong. And he's the type of guy that could absolutely control the breakaway. So Bennett looks to bridge... Mangakawa. Correct. Finn Fisher Black in that break, and then it's just foot on the accelerator, take those guys with them, and then have a wee chat about some deals that possibly could be done. Possibly, exactly. And it's like, yes, it's no, it's a big ask, though. It's two minutes he's got to cross up the Mangakawa, and uh, it's a long way to go. If, if the chase gets organised behind 
the break, then uh, you know it, it might be it might not happen because remember they've got to do six laps of this finishing circuit. It's a, it's a long way. Six laps, but we, we've talked about that too, though. But a group of four or five can work effectively together, particularly through a tight street circuit. Um, chase group, the bigger the chase group as we get into town, arguably the better chance for the small break. Yeah, people start to get dis disinterested, don't they? There actually are genuinely some fatigued riders also that can't work. But yeah, people sitting on, it distracts you. It, it makes you get a little bit frustrated. Um, but the... Uh, I'm just hearing over the race radio right now, as we spoke of, George Bennett has just attacked on Mangakawa. Brilliant. Uh, we hope to bring you those pictures very shortly because we do want to try and get bring you those live pictures. And so George Bennett has done what we thought, trying to bridge the gap across to that chase group with his only friend we understand, or legitimate teammate in the peloton, in Finn Fisher Black. So It'll be really interesting to see how many people can actually follow that initial attack. I heard Michael Torkler has maybe bridged or held onto George at this at the early stages of the attack. So, and rider 109, Ollie Jones has lost contact up the, up the climb, so he was in that break. So that chase group, which we understand is seven, is now down to six with the likes of George Bennett looking to try and bridge across. So that's and that's not all over for Ollie yet. He's got the chance now that if, when Bennett catches him, he's got that last chance to hang on to the wheel and maybe come back across with George. So, yeah, it's, uh, we did pick Ollie Jones at the start of the race so that he would actually be in the breakaway because it's, it's one of his chances to, you know, to, to get away and, and hold on on a flat circuit. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's all happening in the road race right now. You can imagine the panic in the peloton. Now, now, Greg, I just want to go back to it too for those that may have just joined the coverage here. Uh, going up these climbs, we talked about a headwind and that breeze is starting to pick up. You can certainly notice it. And we are now going to go to the front of the race. So here we go. We'll pick it up. Greg Henderson alongside of me. This is the 2020 Elite Men's Road Race. And George Bennett looking to try and bridge the gap across to Finn Fisher Black, one of his teammates who is in a break. So that's Michael Torkler with him. He's holding on well. And he'll, it's all up to George Bennett now. You can see he looks comfortable, looks smooth. But I trust me, they are moving up there right now. And or you can just see in the background a group of two, maybe three riders. Not far off. That, they could all come back together yet. Now, we are told this is possibly ahead of the race. So we will just confirm those numbers for you. Just picking it back up. Live pictures from out on the course out here in Cambridge. We have just seen an intriguing women's race. And with the nature of this course, with so much of the back half of the race being flat, it, it was going to require a huge amount of intelligence and some absolute precise execution for the likes of George Bennett to give themselves a chance. And this is the chasing group just in the background. It'll be interesting to see who is driving in that chasing group. So we've got this break here off the front. This ha is the lead group. But have they... Have they, that's the head of the race. Okay, and we've got... Uh, this looks like the main peloton. There's not a lot left there. No. That's a they pretty small group. pedestrian at the moment. If I can use Where's that, that word? breakaway? Where's that breakaway group? Okay. Has George, got, has George gone across and passed the breakaway group already? Okay, I, so we think this is the George Bennett... Michael Torkler trying to jump across to that breakaway group, and you just get an idea there of the gradient. Television never tells you how steep a climb is. It's super steep right there. You hit up to gradients of 14%, and these are two of the best climbers. Michael Torkler, can, he can climb super well, as you can tell, because he's the only person that can hold George Bennett's wheel. Now, Finn Fisher Black, this is the main peloton, and that has basically just been a bit of a demolition. Someone's thrown a hand grenade in the middle of the bunch and it's just sort of imploded and we've just seen them slowly just fall apart from the back. You just saw a black spoke rider there raise his hand in uh, indication to bring one of his teammates to the front to help with the chase. So black spoke obviously trying to get things a little bit organised. They can't afford... Like, there's no real panic yet. OK, George is up the road, yes. We, we knew he was going to do this. Long way to go. He's got one person with him. He has to get across. He has to get across to this breakaway. And it might even come down to it where you might see Finn Fisher Black, who's still in the breakaway. You might see him even just wait for him. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Finn Fisher Black, his uh, legitimate teammate in that break, how does he play it? What would be the instructions if you were his team leader and and passing the instructions from the team car 
that's exactly what I would be saying. He'd be, don't wait for him now, because he might drop you in this part of the climb. Get to the top, and then really soft pedal, and wait for him, and when he gets there, just drive it. i tell you what to... And, and, and convince Michael Talker it's his best interest, too, to buy into it. Oh, 100%, yeah. Michael, and and Michael Talker knows Bewley that. Big Sam Bewley on the front there, possibly. Yep, riding a nice, hard tempo again. He, the bigger the bunch that gets to the top of this climb, the more guys we have to work for the next 60, 70 k's to catch this break. So, like we said, we knew this was going to happen, but if the, the, the trick is not to let this gap blow out and beyond ridiculous where there's no chance of bringing it back. So, so George Bennett with Iambo Visma, and we've got Sam Bewley with Mitchelson Scott. We thought, Greg, that possibly the World Tour riders might come together here and unite, knowing that they're up against some of the provincial teams, they're up against domestic trade teams. Are we seeing this possibly here from Sam Bewley? He... No, he's, he's trying to keep a group together now so that there's numbers. You can see, I can see um, Shane... Archibald's there, Dion Smith's there. So if we can keep a big enough group together, they will be able to get a, a group motivated and they'll work fast together and there is a chance that they'll come back across in the later stages of the race. We certainly know what Sam Bewley's capable of coming from a track background, a two-time bronze medalist in the men's pursuit in Beijing in 2008, London 2012. Everybody desperately really wants to see George Bennett, I think, win this race today. They want to see the New Zealand jersey incorporated into his trade colours and I think people just really like George Bennett he's just such a nice guy he is just so personable he uh, you know he's very very humble and I just think people like the way he races too so they've just summited now and you can see them they had a quick chat Let's get it going. Let's keep cranking. Now, Black's boat on the front of the remainder of the peloton. They're driving it, making sure that that gap doesn't go out too far. Okay, so the Black... Let's just run through the Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy. And we've got Aaron Gate in that, who has a very good chance of winning this race today. Hayden McCormick, Luke Mudgeway, James Oram. So four very accomplished riders there. And then at an under-23 level, they've got Ethan Black, Josh Kench, Ari Scott, Kieran Watts and Xander White. Tactically for them, a newly launched trade team, are they looking for under 23 honours or is this just a case of getting one Black Spoke Pro Academy rider across the line in first place, even if it means giving up the under 23 jersey? By the looks of it now, mate, they are riding for the win. They've actually broken the peloton in half again. So now that we're on the really steep sections of Mungakaui, you can see... Yeah, that is tough there. That is brutal. And the peloton has shrunk again. So we've actually just lost Sam Buell. He's just losing... He is just losing contact on the final... The final pitches there that you can see. That it's not far to go. It could still come back together, that, that peloton. But Black Spoke have put the hammer down. They want to make that bunch, that peloton, a little smaller... You can just see, too, boy, that little peak there between about the 1,600 metre mark and, what, two or 300 metres there. Very, very, very steep there in the middle, and it just slowly builds. Not a lot of opportunity to try and bring that heart rate down, if any. Probably no. just between the two and the two-and-a-half kilometre mark, there is just an opportunity to get a little bit of a breath, maybe take a wee drink on the drink bottle. What's going to be really interesting now is what is... Are we going to see... What happens in the breakaway in front of George? Are we going to see them? How, how long is it going to take them to get across? Well, Black Spoke on the front driving, looking to maybe see if they can at some point try and bridge across as well. We'll find out very shortly who they're possibly looking to ride for. Uh, I, I, you'd say looking at the form coming into it, it, it will be very much a case of riding for Aaron Gate. Aaron Gate or Hayden McCormick are my two picks. It's going very, very well. Um, James James Oram is very he climbs very, very strong. That might be James. We can't really see from the pictures now, but that might be James putting hard tempo down right now. But again, it's not a huge gap. It's not like we've got minutes. It's it's literally meters. So it's yeah, it looks fantastic on television, but that can, that can come back just like that. Also, if they're not motivated from behind, it can disappear just like that. Equally too, and then it comes down to the ability on the descent as well. Now, some of the riders will be very familiar with this course. They would have come out throughout the week and had a look at it and done some real analysis on it. Others, well, they might not have necessarily had the opportunity. And it will come down to small percentages you sense today. And this is George Bennett with Michael Torkler, who are looking to... We understand, try and bridge the gap to a 
lead group of seven riders or six riders now. So as we just got an information there that George and Michael had about nearly close to three minutes on the peloton over the top of Mangakawa. So that's a, that's actually a very large, <laughs> large group. Yeah. And we know too, isn't it? We saw when George Bennett won the Tour of California a few years back. He, he probably won that tour or cemented it in that time trial with a wonderful ride that day. It's an area that he's done a lot of work on. He finished second in the time trial on Friday. So he, he, he understands now on World Tour level, you can't just be a good climber. You've got to be the complete all-round rider. So we know he's got the strength. We know he's got that ability to time trial if needs be. So here you can see we've got two black boat riders absolutely purely committed to the chase. But it looks like we've got Mitchelton not really happy to contribute right now. There was a group of four not far behind. And if I was in that group right now, I'd be saying, guys, let's just wait for the other four. Four stronger than seven. We've got much better chance of closing down that three-minute gap to George Bennett because we don't need George getting across to that break. And it becomes three riders against a group of eight riders. Well, the maths doesn't work. Sam Bewley riding for Mitchelton Scott and the man that Greg Henderson believes is a real chance today is Dion Smith, the 26-year-old 26 26-year-old from Taupaki in South Auckland. So Michael Talkler and George Bennett I've just all have now prepared mentally for a long two-up time trial. They just know. And remember, there's still a lot of hard roads to go. Look at them right now. They're, they're going uphill. This is where they, they cannot take time on them right now. This is where these two guys are the fastest in New Zealand. There's still a lot of time now where they can still take more time on the chase and peloton. Boy, George Bennett looks comfortable, doesn't he? It just almost looks easy at the moment. He's going to need to get by in, though, from Torkler. He's going to need to look after Michael Torkler. Michael won't necessarily have the ability to take the big turns, but he's going to require Torkler to do some work at some point. He'll be talking to him. He'll be encouraging him. He'll be just saying, hang in there. I'm happy to drag you up some of the climbs, but I'm going to need you to come through at some point. So Michael Torkler wearing number 134, just losing our pictures from out there on the road. Alongside of me, Greg Henderson. He rode 12 Grand Tours. Track Cycling World Champion, Commonwealth Games Gold Medal, and the man who finished, he tells me, told me not to bring it up in commentary, finished second in the National Road Championships on five occasions, Greg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I was in Christchurch one year when I, 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 I think yeah. Jack Bauer might have peeled you guys on the line. Jack. Okay, so this is the one where we understand he's done a lot of homework on this particular descent and he is going to absolutely rail it down here. He did it four times in practice. He came out and he just did his homework on this particular part of the course. He's got a bit of an understanding of it. He believes he can probably attack this part of the course on the downhill better than anybody in the peloton. Why not? He can make time on the uphill. Why not make some time on the downhill? Um, you can see, obviously, Michael Torkler knows these roads very well also, so there's no, there's no, there's no way that he's holding up George Bennett in any way, shape or form. Look at them just nailing down here, 80, 85 k's an hour right here. It's so fast. Uh, George Bennett, Michael Torkler. You talk about the speeds they do go at, just tapping the brakes. Look out, Aero, Michael Talkler's down on his top tube there. And the old Chris Froome on the top tube peddling position there for a while. But there's two of them away now. They're working. They know together they'll be, they won't even have to talk to each other. They'll just, they'll just give each other everything they've got. So now they're onto the roller coaster road. Brunskill roller coaster road. This is up and down for about a good six or seven kilometres, a hard section. Okay, this is perfect. This is what we needed. We need a small peloton, a reduced peloton, had now motivated to chase this breakaway. And I think that's exactly why the Mitchelton Scott rider, he would have known, mate, there's no use three of us trying to catch. Wait for the guys behind. Let's get a good group and let's drive it. Okay, so... It is already beginning to play out, play itself into a strategic battle, and the big trade teams, the Mitchelton Scott riders of Sam Bewley and Dion Smith, clearly have a good understanding of what they want to try and achieve. And at the moment, George Bennett. He told us what he was going to do, and he went out, and he did it. And there's one guy that actually went with him, and that's fantastic. He probably wasn't expecting anyone to come with him, so any company is good company. And Michael Torkler, what, a, what an absolute 
weapon this guy is. Well, Michael talks has got plenty of experience too. You want a guy with experience. You want a guy who understands this game intricately, understands just the subtleties, and we're getting that, aren't we? Yeah, he's a he's a fantastic bike rider. Obviously, climbs like a demon. He's the only one that could hold on to George Bennett, and now the two of them just settle in, and looking up the road to where that breakaway. We still believe the breakaway is up the road, or are we to believe that they have caught the... Is this, we, we just need to know if this is the... Well, we have just had a text come through from uh, the great G-man, Graham Miller, and he tells me Dion Smith, smartest man in the peloton. That's his pick for the day, Greg Henderson, and I think you've sort of backed that up with some of the earlier discussions we've had as well. These two are just trading off turn after turn. They're just... They'll know, they'll, like I said before, they'll just give everything they've got right now. You're going to have a very motivated group. I wouldn't even call it a peloton anymore. I would call that a chase group because it is very, very small. But the good thing about that is it stays motivated. The, the smaller the peloton to chase, the smaller the chase group, the more motivated they are. Yeah, more organised too. I just get the feeling that this is the front of the race. I just get the feeling if they took three, if they took three minutes out of the peloton up that climb, I believe they easily caught the two minutes to the breakaway. That, that's my gut feel. So we are just trying to get an update from out of the course to give you the exact scenario that is playing out before you like coverage of the Pasadena women's race. Are you going to stand over? still a breakaway of six or seven riders ahead of them that they're looking to try and bridge a gap to because we were told earlier today that there was a group of seven that had gone up the road five elite men and two from the under 23 category the reason I think that this is potentially the front of the race is because we have not seen Finn Fisher Black yet and I'm pretty confident if he was in the break he would be back now he would be back now helping drive this so we think George and Torkler are away at the moment. So George Bennett, Michael Torkler, this is the race lead at the Vantage 2020 New Zealand Road Cycling National Championships. And that is correct. We have been told that, in fact, is correct. And there are groups all over the road, so it has completely been blown apart. It is completely disintegrated, as expected. We, we heard from George Bennett before the race. He said the pace will go on early. And this is now the chase group. And we'll try and see who is in this chase group and find out whether or not, in fact, we do have someone like Finn Fisher Black back in here, possibly acting as a policeman. We can certainly see the yellow colours in there, but we've got a feeling that might be Dion Smith uh, from the Mitchelton Scott team. I... It's definitely Shane Archibald has definitely made it. There's two from Black Spoke made it. There's one from Mitchelton made it. Um, yeah, it's a big ask for George and Michael out the front. Two riders. Um, if I'm in this, if I'm in this group now, I'm just keeping everybody motivated. I'm not pulling big turns. I'm not smashing legs off right now. I'm just talking to everyone. I'm just saying, come on, guys. We've, we've got 60 k's now to catch these guys. Don't panic. Let's just keep riding together. We'll eventually mow them down. Intriguing battle, 109, these are some of the chase groups, and number 109 there is Ollie Jones of Canterbury, who was part of that initial break, and we heard that he had sort of basically been spat up the Mangakawa climb. I won. A big, tall rider. Again, to opting for the deep carbon rimmed wheels. Are you surprised by some of the wheel choices that we're seeing out the other day, Greg Henderson? Well, actually, there's quite a bit of science behind it now, and um, they, the, the, they, the science says unless your average speed is under 24 k's an hour, the deep section wheels always go with it. Um, so really, you would only envision people using the really lightweight, the really small carbon wheels on like a Tour de France mountain stage where all you're doing is or going up and down. incredibly windy. Oh, of course, for safety, incredibly windy, yeah. correct. But nowadays, the deep carbon rim wheels, they are super fast. 
So this is the front of the race. Coming up Turkey Hill. Now they've talked a lot about Turkey Hill. They're on the descent, but it is one area of the course that the locals have said it could be a key moment in the race. It could be strategic. It is a race, it is a hill that not a lot of people tend to talk about. It tends to sort of fall into the shadow of the Mangakawa and the French Pass climbs. Well, when we panned out to that helicopter shot, I'm not sure, I just caught a glimpse of two riders in front of these two riders. Now, I just need to pan out a little more. I'm wondering if there are still two from the breakaway that have survived. Well, you mentioned, you have mentioned it though, haven't you? The fact that Finn, Finn, Finn Fisher Black, George Bennett's it just play wasn't... teammate. We haven't seen him. He is a quality rider. He is a class rider. And it was an interesting shot where they just showed Ollie Jones. Like, why would they pan to Ollie Jones? There's no way he's... He was in the initial break. There's no way he was coming back to the peloton. I have a feeling that maybe he might still be in front and they, these guys could be catching up to Ollie Jones that part of the break. It's, it's really hard to guess right now, but um, it's just an interesting shot to pan to Ollie Jones if he, because there was no way that he was going to go from the breakaway to then chasing the peloton. I'm wondering if that maybe they are still just in front of these two. Well, George Bennett having a chat to Michael Torkler there. They'll be setting a nice hard tempo. And again, like we spoke about, this is another section where they're the fastest in New Zealand. They can take more time out of the peloton. Just look at the high cadence there. Uh, two from George Bennett, just spinning beautifully, isn't he? He'd be sort of that 95 revolutions per minute, very much sort of that Lance Armstrong type climbing style versus the bigger gear of the Jan Ulrichs and Michael Talkler not quite as smooth in that cadence. Both quality climbers, mate. Honestly, the speed they're going up there, you have to see it to believe it. It's, uh, it's incredible how fast they go uphill. And so it was George Bennett who, out of Nelson, started riding about the age of 16 or 17, had a dream. And what a bike rider he has become too. Very much targeting the Olympic Games, targeting the Giro d'Italia Giro later in the year. A team leader amongst his Yumbo Visma team. And if I'm back in the peloton now again, I'm just trying to get keep everyone motivated. Come on guys, let's just roll it together. We don't need to panic just yet. We can just ride a nice tempo. We don't even have to go flat stick over these hard undulations we've made the front split we put the hammer down in the flat sections because we have six laps of the town circuit to catch and that's going to be so hard for two guys we don't have to panic right now on this peloton I'm, i'll be saying guys let's just go through and off we don't need to go flat stick they can hold us we don't have to catch them right now we'll catch them later let them burn some matches let them go out there let them absolutely spend themselves it's a wonderful game, the sport of cycling. Just so much going on. So many mind games, so many tactics. Not always obvious to those that are relatively new to the sport. But every time you see somebody go up the road, you see somebody talking, you see a rider who might appear to be soft pedaling, you can guarantee it's planned. You can guarantee there is a tactic behind it. There's a real game of cat and mouse really undulating section of road quite open and exposed and barren hills okay here we go we're at the back of the what's left of the peloton and i can see finn fisher black in there so finn fisher black has come back from the breakaway ollie jones is there he's in the peloton so this is the front of the bike race okay wow and it's good though that we do have finn fisher black back in that group because you'd imagine at some point that chase group might end up getting reduced, might come apart a little bit at the back, and George Bennett then has a policeman in that chase group. He has somebody who can just create a little bit of indecision, who can just act as a little bit of an anchor at times by just sitting back, doing nothing, soft pedaling, and forcing the riders just to tow him a little bit. So it is confirmed. This is the front of the bike race, so they are Full noise now, mate, all the way to the finish. They've got a two-up time trial. It's going to be the hardest two-up time trial of their life. Well, George Bennett, this is remarkable because you, we played an interview earlier, and we might just see if we can replay it a little bit later on for you of what his tactics were. He didn't come in here with a lot of confidence. 
He didn't seem overly keen on this particular course. He talked about just how much flat there is on the back part of it. He said, look, there's no one really here who's going to work for me, and why would they? He did say you would need to light it up early. He's done exactly that. I don't think he gave as much away in that interview as perhaps uh, he had to say. He clearly has a plan, and at the moment, he's rolling it out beautifully. Absolutely, and yeah, so he, he told us what he was going to do. Right, we've got Shane Archbold in the chasing group, and he is a rider too who has the ability, particularly if it comes down to a sprint finish, to take today's national title. We spoke to him a little earlier today. Shane, uh, welcome. Nice, nice to see you showing the colours. I bet, I bet you're delighted with that for this year. Yeah, it's um, obviously an awesome opportunity to join the world's best team. It's um, so far the season started pretty well, so. Uh, Hopefully the success for the team continues. Plans for today? Today's very different, of course, to what you'll face uh, the rest of the year, but uh, plans for today? There's no real big plan for me. It's just about trying to get to uh, two thirds through the race over the hillier stuff and um, see what happens from there. Hopefully not too far behind and there's a possibility any can happen. Obviously, every year a new course at Nationals. Every three, four years is a new course. It's... Um, yeah, I like the last part of it, but the middle part's pretty tough, so we'll see how we go. Yeah, the last part's nice, but you've got to get there first, haven't you? Exactly. Um, it's not much I can do. It's only keep pedalling, and hopefully I'm still there. Well, everyone's delighted at the deal, and, and just great to see you with the team, and uh, wishing you well today and for the rest of the year. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Well, Shane Archibald, in that chase group, what does he need to do today if he wants to take the black singlet? And I'll just use that metaphorically back to Europe. Yes, yeah, so it wasn't that long ago. I was actually Shane Archibald's coach, and uh, so we're quite close. And I had a good chat to him about the race today, and he actually used some of my words there was just got to keep pedalling. It's like Paris-Roubaix, anything can happen. You can always come back. Just got to keep pedalling all the way to the end of the bike race. Anything, anything can happen in this race. And when he gets into that group, and they're in a, it's a small, it's a very small, um, reduced peloton now. He's as fast as anyone there. Well, George Bennett, Michael Torkler, they are on French Pass Road, and talking to a former winner of this race back in 1987, Graham Miller. He expected it today to be what he calls old-style racing, just attack, 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 and see who's left. And it's very much the case playing out here. Big left-hander coming shortly. We, we, we know that George Bennett is a, 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 a going to be a, a, a better climber than a Michael Torkler. How does he manage Michael Torkler through the steeper parts of this course, through some of the uh, uh, gradients that they still have in front of them? Well, they're committed together now. They've, they've, you've, we saw them speaking. It would be like, mate, we've got a two-up time trial. Let's just put it all on the line right now. There's not going to be any massive surges in pace now. They are riding a very, very hard tempo that they know that they can hopefully sustain to the end of the bike race. So there's going to be no massive surges, and it's in George's best interest. If I, I mean, I don't even expect Michael Talker to be in any trouble, because if he could follow up Mangakawa... He's a great form. He's a great he's climber. A great form, yeah. So I don't expect him to be in any trouble at all, and the two of them are just... This is a t they can still take time right now. This is actually this is where that is playing into their hands, and then they have just got to hold on on the flat. Well, you look at the urgency here. This is on a downhill stretch. This is the chase group, and it is the newly formed team, Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy, led by Scotty Guyton, as their sort of sport director sportif, and they are really now riding with some urgency. They want to try and close that gap. Using the numbers, it's, it's a smart thing to do. Use the riders. Um, maintain the gap, I think, is probably what's actually going to be happening because it's it's a very, very tough part of the, the course right now. And if we can ride a good hard tempo through here, we may be able to maintain that gap. Is that chase group too big? No, I don't think so. Not yet. No, I think... Six uh, six laps of this circuit. I'm sure it'll get smaller once we hit the town circuit. Okay, they're about to take the ride into French Pass Road, uh, French Pass Road, which just gives you an idea that it is a significant gap between George Bennett and Michael Torkler. You, what you have to understand on this course is they will come back into the city of Cambridge, or the township of Cambridge. There is six laps of nine kilometres, so 55 to 60k of flat work 
which has a technical component to it, but it also has a swirling breeze, which can create a little bit of a havoc. That will be in the mind of these two riders as well. I guess the question, Greg Henderson, what sort of time will they need before they come back in to the street circuits? I tell you what is actually another interesting factor that can play out in a bike race like this is when we do come back into town and we hit those town circuits, people start attacking, people start getting tired, the peloton disintegrates. You start getting smaller groups and smaller groups, and then all of a sudden, it becomes maybe a group of three chasing the two out front. It's not a group of ten anymore. So all of a sudden, you know, it's, you've got two versus three. It's not massive odds. So that's another tactic that could play out in, in the future of this race. So Finn Fisher Black in that chasing group, he is policing that chase group. He is the teammate of George Bennett, rides for the Team Yumbo Visma development team, and he'll be wanting to do everything for his general today. So the rock stars of New Zealand Cycling are in that front group trying to chase down the superstar that is George Bennett and the very accomplished Michael Torkler. And on the climb at French Pass, and uh -oh. Greg, I'll get you to bring uh -oh. up your statistics and have a wee look. Michael Torkler might be in a bit of difficulty. We talked about managing Torkler on the climbs. And what does George Bennett do here at the moment? Does he manage him? At what point does he say, you know what? The velocity is just not strong enough. We need to be riding harder than this. So a decision here for now, George Bennett. A key moment in this race. A fascinating battle as they make their way towards the top of French Pass. Michael Torkler's just going to have to hang tough here and then jump back on as they look to descend. He's made it. He's made it back. That was crucial. That was Torkler in big trouble, but he's just got back on. George may have eased off the pedals a little bit because George really needs him. And they've, they've crested now. They descend back now. They can use, And they work together. It's... Uh, that was crucial. If that had happened 10 k's earlier, it might have been a totally different story. George Bennett might have been in a whole lot of trouble for this bike race. He's still got a partner in crime now. He's still got a partner in crime, and he's got a teammate back in the chase group. And we know what a quality rider is. Uh, we know what an absolute quality rider Finn Fisher Black is. He, in 2020, won the mountain jersey at the New Zealand Cycle Classic back in 2019, 10th at the Junior World Time Trial Championships. So he is the complete rider. Finn Fisher Black, a real star of the future. Won't be his day-to-day -day in terms of overall line honours. His time will come in the future of this race. His day is the fact that he wants to get George Bennett across the line and have the black singlet and the silver fern incorporated into their trade colours in Europe. Look how good uh, Michael Torkel is descending here. He knows these roads are like the back of his hand. He's actually put a nice little gap into George, and I think um, I would be very happy to let Michael lead the way down. And what you do is you just give a good 10, 15-metre gap. You're still in the slipstream because they're doing 80 k's an hour, so you can get a good read of the lines of someone who knows the corners. OK, let's go back to the chase group because we've talked about Finn Fisher Black. Does he now look to light it up going up French Pass and just try and decimate that chase group, try and reduce the number of chases? That won't or take just any... simply try and take the legs away from a couple of these guys for later in the race? I don't think they'll take... If he does try to go hard up the clump, they won't take any notice of him. He's not going to go anywhere on his own, and they'll know that he's trying to disrupt the chase. i tell you what could actually happen, and I think, you know, it's not totally beyond the, the scope or the realms of reality, is he gets to sit on now for 70 ki kilometres. Like, he has got a free ticket to sit on and not do a lick of work, and then if it looks like he's going to be caught... Just clip bang. The, clip the ticket, sit on the bus, off you go, boys. And then I'm not doing anything. You know I'm not expected to do anything. I'm just going to sit back here, and at any point, if there's any indecision, I will come through, and I will disrupt if I can. But, hey, we've now got a one-two punch we can use, and that's exactly what George Bennett wanted. So Michael Torkler, he is in great form in the last of the Dynamo events. He was just attacking off the front. He's got good legs. Well, what a partner in crime into the dip here on French Pass. This requires good bike handling skills. They are absolutely rocketing. And look at Torkler descend there too. Anywhere between 80, 90, possibly even 100 kilometres an hour. George is a little bit nervous of these. He's not he's not 100% confident on these climbs. But that's that's great that Michael Torkler has the local lottery. And I'd be, like I said, I'd be super happy to let Michael lead down the climb. And uh, Last of the big climbs now. He needs to look after Michael Torkler here. 
He needs to make sure he's got Torkler at the summit. He needs to use him as they come into the flat, flat parts of this 2020 Vantage National Road Cycling Championships. He'll be talking to him. He'll be encouraging him. And they'll be getting an idea of what the splits are. Back to that chase group. Torkler looking much more comfortable here. Nice, smooth pedal cadence, just deciding to sit in. And now George Bennett pulls alongside of him. Both just turning the pedals beautifully. No sign of fatigue at all when you look at the form of these two riders. And now we're on to the flat parts. We talk about a long day. We talk about the time trial. Well, it's around about 70 kilometres now of time trialling. 66 kilometres to go to the finish now, the two of them, two up time trial. Look at them, they're in the big gears now. They've changed from that really high cadence to now pushing a big, strong time trial gear. And just for those new to the world of cycling, what are we talking about cadence? We're talking about the number of times they're turning the pedals in a minute. And optimum cadence these days for a lot of riders, around about 95 revolutions per minute. And probably pushing maybe 85 here. And you'll see them. If, if they get fatigued, they often tend to sort of lean on their gears even more, and that cadence will drop considerably. Now, Bennett just asking for his team vehicle to come through. He might actually just be asking for a time check. He might just be asking the motorbike to come up and say, how much time have we got, mate? And so... So they are descending hard. Again, a lot of local knowledge on these descents can make up quite a bit of time. As you can see, look at the gap, he's, he's exposed, but that's fine, he's not gonna go anywhere. Everyone's still got him in sight, in slipstream. He's just, he's knows the, he knows this descent like the back of his hands. Dylan Kennett possibly off the front too. Just making. So another little chapter possibly being written here. What is the tactics going on? Have we got a rider now looking to try and bridge the gap? Have there been some deals that have been done prior to the start of this race? So it sounds like on race radio that that chasing peloton, we'll call it a peloton because I think that's the remnants of what's left. It's still got over three minutes to chase. They've taken more time in these last undulating sections. George and Michael have taken more time. Well, well one of the uh, things that George Bennett, the likes of the Sam Buleys and those riding the World Tour, they went to Bike NZ and they said, look, you have your National Road Championships in January historically. We don't feel we come in with the best legs. They've, they've been the ones that have forced the change and brought the Road Nationals to the middle of February. They wanted to go and do the tour down under. They wanted to get some racing into them, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing the best riders in good form, which is what a national championship should be. Mate, I must have complained for about seven or eight years in a row. <laughs> That's because you finished second on five occasions, Greg. I said, can we please have the Nationals... It's to do with January, Greg. <laughs> can we just outgun Greg. Can we please have the Nationals after the Tour <laughs> Down Under? I, and as I was getting older and older, I needed more well, time. That just gives you an idea, too, because this is French Pass. This is the descent. Now, we saw Michael Torkler and George Bennett, what, four, three, four, five minutes back already doing this? 2.45 at the top. And they aren't even at the bottom. So 2.45 and the clock is still ticking from the time split that we've been given at the moment. So Here's this last it's kicker well now, isn't it? Three minutes. This is this last kicker. And this is just this last little kicker. And I just wonder whether this group will stay together. And, of course, if you're not a, a great climber or you're starting to feel a little bit of fatigue, you just want to be right at the front right now. So you're just drifting off the back over the top as we go back to the front of the race. George Bennett, Michael Torkler in the time trial of their lives. We saw a great women's race earlier on today when we thought we might just see one of the great solo performances take place. But in the finish, she just ran out of road. Kate McCarthy, that was a gutsy performance indeed. We might be looking at something very similar in the men's race we're right here two guys now know they're in the time trial of their life i tell you what i did notice was one noticeable absentee wagon the buells sam buley has not made the front group dion smith is there alone for middleton scott and so 
and they're going to be taking a right into McLean Street. And this is where it starts to get very, very swirly indeed. At some points, they're going to have a, a, a tailwind behind them. And when they take the right-hand turns, that could end up being crosswind. At some point, they're going to have a slight headwind. They've got six laps. So they'll be getting a really good opportunity through the first lap to get a bit of an environmental scan. OK, what's the wind doing? What parts of the course are we going to have a tailwind? What parts of the street circuit are we going to have the crosswinds? And they can work tactically in and around that. They'll know how to position themselves. What I find fascinating, and it's a credit to the level of bike rider that George Bennett is, he literally told everybody his tactic. He said, I am going to make this race hard. I am going to go flat knackers up Mangakawa, and that's exactly what he's done. He's caught the break. He's dropped the breakaway. He is now the breakaway. There's only one man that could stay with him, Michael Torkler. We know how strong he is. He's been racing so strong locally. And now it's like up to the it's up to the reduced peloton to now catch a good three minute gap, and that is a lot of real estate. Well, stay with us. You are watching live coverage of the Vantage New Zealand National Road Race Championships for the elite men and the elite under twenty three men. I'll just give you an idea of just how fast these riders are riding at the moment. They'll be wanting to maximise their power output with that tailwind behind them. And they do have the benefit of being able to negate some of these tight corners. In regards to just the two of them, and be able to choose their lines, not have a myriad of cyclists in front of them who possibly could end up getting it wrong or not necessarily take the straightest line. Just remember when we get... A little further on, 120, 130 k's into this bike race, you, you're going to have a lot of the local riders or like the, um, you know, not the world tour or the professional riders, they're going to start to get tired legs, whereas a lot of the pros, they're used to riding 180, 200 kilometre races, their legs will feel exactly the same from kilometre one to a kilometre yeah. 180. So the, 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 the massive difference is, it really does become a whole different bike, bike race. But, but, Greg, we have talked about it. We, we understand they're now at the 112k mark, where they've got around about 62 kilometres left in this race. But there is that, what we I affectionately always call the exponential curve of fatigue. We've all agreed that it's around about that 130 kilometre mark. Every sort of 5, 10k after that, the fatigue levels uh, increase considerably. And so we're starting to get around, you know, not too far away from that particular mark. Now, as you've mentioned, some riders, they won't notice it. But you only have to have one or two in that chase group who are having a slightly bad day, and that opens the door for these two. Absolutely agree with you. And again, remember, we've got Finn Fisher Black sitting in there, pretty fresh legs, just punching tickets at the back of the bunch. He doesn't have to do a thing. So he can go, if anyone decides to move, if, if people are getting fatigued in that chasing group, he can just follow and tag on the back of anything. As you can see now, Black Spoke are fully committed to this chase away, ch breakaway. James Orham on the front now, doing some big pulls. Of you. I wonder who they're riding for. I wonder if Hayden McCormick has made. I wonder if Aaron Gates has made this front peloton. I noticed Mitchelton, well, I'm presuming it's Dion Smith, has made the front group and is not contributing. They, they are actually relying a lot on black spoke. And this could be a little bit of a problem because effect, effectively... That's only three riders chasing two riders. It's not a whole peloton rotating and trying to catch these two bike riders. It's only three guys from Black Spoke. They've taken, they've taken commitment. They've taken charge. They've taken responsibility. And now it's only three against two. This, this is an interesting bike race. OK, well, we're also going to bring Andrew Dewhurst into the commentary uh, very shortly as we have a look now at Dion Smith. So Dion Smith in that group, one of the real race favourites. But look, the four riders here from this newly formed team, Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy, taking, trying to take control, but they're not getting a lot of buy-in. They've just got to make sure those other riders on the back, and we know certainly that is going to, um, that is certainly going to be. So McCormick, I noticed, was rolling through and off, pulling hard turns. So that says to me they're not riding for Hayden McCormick to win this national title. They're riding for someone else. I can only presume it's Aaron Gate. If Aaron Gate's got over that climb, if Aaron Gate has made it, he is a real danger in the finish. Well, Andrew, you've been uh, introduced us. You've been out around the streets of Cambridge, and one thing we've noticed from the women's race starting at 8 o'clock this morning, there is a breeze beginning to build. It's not a breeze.
in now in town, which is going to play some havoc with six laps of the street circuit. Yeah, ju just wanted to throw that in there in terms of the conditions. Uh, the overcast has certainly helped, but it's one of those days, those uh, central Waikato days, where it's it, it's deceptively warm, even with the overcast conditions. But the breeze certainly, they'll be happy to get into town, but they do duck out on each one of these six laps that remain, and they will catch this. It's a northeasterly, but it is picking up. We're hearing it even through the microphones a little now. So the wind will have a little bit of an effect here, and, and, I, and I guess Greg Greg, you can comment on that, that if you're thrown out on your own, you're not getting much protection, that's going to hurt these guys. But it's, no, it's not anything dramatic at the moment, but certainly it's a factor as we head into these last 60-odd uh, Ks. In and around town, they'll be fine, but when they head out on, on the outside of this loop, this, this chase back will have a little advantage. Yeah, the, the, the positive thing about the six laps, and we've already discussed this, is you do get a lap, you will get a pretty good read on where those headwinds are, where those crosswinds are. As we see 104, Hayden McCormick in that chase group. 105 is Luke Mudgeway. So, Gaty has made it. Gaty has made so, it over. Yeah, and, and, and these guys look busy now, don't they, guys? They, they're, they're focused. Uh, we'll, get a, we'll get a feeling for the gap, of course, but we're not far. For those that are uh, watching us live uh, on venue, we're not far now. They're about to come through and, uh, and head out on six laps around town. We'll get a time gap as they come past. We'll make sure we start the clock and we'll know exactly how much time these fellas... Well, they're about to come through and uh, through the start-finish line area here in front of the commentary position. And what is going through the head of these wonderful athletes, these two street fighters, these warriors, and George Bennett and Michael Torkler, they have committed. There is still a number of cards that can be played from that chasing group for the fact that he does have a fellow teammate in that peloton in that chase group that can help him if required. Righto, they just came through the start finish there. Fully committed. You can see, look how aero, look how small he's trying to make himself. His aerodynamic silhouette is what they call it. The smaller you are, the less frontal service you have, the faster you can go in, into the headwind. I tell you again, I'm, going, I'm still concerned Black Spoke have taken up the charge. Black Spoke have taken up the responsibility. That really only leaves three bike riders against two. That's, I'm always concerned about that because everyone else is getting a free sit and you've got two strong bike riders and there's three guys chasing. There's, there's, I feel it's a dangerous situation. Well, Finn Fisher Black too, particularly if he is sitting there at fifth wheel at the moment, which it looks like he is sitting at fifth wheel, then he is just simply saying, well, Nobody's going to come past me, and I am then just going to force this pure black racing team to be doing all the work indeed. So he is working for his captain brilliantly, Finn Fisher Black. Not just a quality bike rider, but a smart, intelligent bike rider. He understands how this game needs to play out. I would be the first person going back and talking to the World Tour boys and saying, send some help. There is no need for, in my opinion, Black Spoke to be doing all the work. They're giving a free ride, essentially, to the rest of that peloton, well, which is just ridiculous. It, Greg, though, and the rumours were sort of denied, but are the World Tour riders just want to see the New Zealand jersey on a rider in Europe at the highest level? And who better than this man? Uh, they know how tough it is. I remember, I remember having a chat to Sam Bewley at a number of road nationals in Christchurch. He said, I had the legs, Mark, but there were just too many of them. And what he was referring to were those trade teams at a domestic level, at a continental level, that just weren't allowing him to do it. So he knows what it's like to be a sole trader out there. Hey, why don't we just come together collectively and form a, almost a barbarians team, if I can use that rugby analogy. So talk... Torkler just picking up a drink bottle off his sister, Kerry Ann Torkler. Uh, good rider in her own right, not so racing today in the women's race. We've already ticked over two and a half minutes and no sign of the peloton yet. So this is a large gap. This is a big chase for Black Spoke. And I mean, full credit, I take my hat off to the brand new team and what a successful, what a fantastic team. And they've taken on the responsibility. They're like, we want to have a crack at this jersey. We know we've got one of the fastest guys on the planet here. He's, uh, you know, multiple world champion um, on the track. Who better to light up for 200 metres to go than Aaron Gate? You, you would put a lot of money on him and a lot of confidence in him. But just the fact that they've taken up the chase this early, 60 Ks out with no help, 
It's a long old day for them as well. Well, over three minutes already, and we haven't seen them come back into the finish straight. So George Bennett, okay, look at that, just beautiful cadence. They both look so strong on the bike, don't they? There's just no movement, there's no upper body movement, it's just smooth, fast, and just all they are doing is, it just looks like they're just turning their legs over. Just trying to get there, some sort of idea of gear ratio. It the biggest. looks like he's in the biggest <laughs> gear there. I was just about to say, I was just trying to get a bit of a read of the back of the chain there in the cluster as we now see the chase group about to come through the start finish line. Greg Henderson almost out to four minutes. Wow. You've got the official time. Three minutes 50. They are three minutes 50 behind. There three is minutes 50, but 50, what, you'd say around mm -hmm. about 50 kilometres to go. Six laps now of this nine kilometre course and Shane Archibald just sitting there on the back too, the mullet, he'll just be waiting and hoping that they can close the gap and look for the sprint finish. I don't think we'll see him doing too much at the moment. He knows it's not in his interest to want to come to the front. I wonder whether we might see a, a change in tactic here in maybe about 20 kilometres time or will that be too late? No, there's still a lot of bike racing left. Like you said, still... Six, still 60 k's to go. There's a lot that can happen. Okay, let's just have a look at the graphic. Just give people an idea of the left and right turns for the street circuit, which they do six laps of, Greg. Yeah, as you can see, it's um, as we saw in the in the ladies race. It's it is quite technical. There's not a lot of time you have to spend into a headwind, so that does favour the two guys out the front. Um, again, like I've said, it's always faster one or two riders through corners. You can pick your line, you can pick your apex. You don't need to touch the brakes through the corners. So every single corner you go through, you're a little bit faster than a peloton. Again, that's entry speed, that's exit speed, that's energy. Every time you have to get back up to pace, that costs energy. And, and, and we have alluded to the wind out there on the course too. The two riders, well, you know, if they come across an area of headwind, they know one of them's going to have to take the turn. They know they're both going to have to work into it. Where you get that larger chase group and there's always going to be, hey, I'm not going to go and face the wind. I mean, Greg, did you ever see the wind? You, you never. I, I mean, do you know what wind feels like, Greg? I know what you sprinter boys are like. You just sit there on the back, get a bit of a free ride, eh, and then just take all the glory. Is that how it works, Greg? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Greg Henderson alongside of us just trying to lighten things up a little bit <laughs> as we look at George Bennett. Oh, we hope for him later in the year. Really wants to concentrate on the Olympic Games road race. He will be the team leader for the Giro d'Italia. He's happy to let the Tour de France go this year. And this is the group three. So this is the group that basically just came apart at the back of a number uh, of the climbs out here. Sam Bewley in that group. Yeah, I could see a dejected-looking Sam Bewley. He might just ride round to get the to get the uh, to get the miles in his legs, but he'll be disappointed that he couldn't quite make it up that uh, last time up Mangakawa. And it was to the credit of Blackspoke; they took control in the final stages of that Mangakawa. They broke that peloton in half and have brought it down to that very, very select group. And it's again really impressive. Aaron Gate has made that final selection, and now it's up to them to catch our two lead breakaway men and they've got a big task it was almost four minutes when they came through uh for this from the start finish uh just a while ago and now you know we'll get another time check as they come through it's only a nine kilometer circuit so we'll be able to gauge how quickly if at all that time gap is coming down well other notable admissions from that chase group is two-time national road racing champion jason christie he's back in that third group so he's been another casualty of this plan from George Bennett just to basically absolutely put each other, put the peloton in the hurt box early as these two look to try and tighten the screws. George just indicating what way we're going here so there's no confusion. So three minutes 50 is that gap at the moment. That is the word coming from the Chief Commissaire's vehicle. To the old the First, mullet. 13 riders in that chase group is our understanding. The mullet just sitting Larry last wheel, just looking after those legs. Any chance of a break to go later? Because I expect the tax to happen. There's no question. It, it might, it may take, uh, you know, 20 or 30 k's before they decide now's the time to smack it in the crosswind. You can see now that's riding slightly right to left. There is a little bit of crosswind there, not huge. Um, Again, if I was Black's boat, I'd put it right in the gutter. I wouldn't let anyone sit on for free. See, look at the free ride everyone's getting. I'd say, guys, move it left. 
Don't give anyone a free ride. Finn Fisher Black, very, very fast too, over a few kilometres. He has the ability to jump if this gap does come down, but look at this. Hayden McCormick Hayden on the front, McCormick. just doing massive pulls, and he is flying at the moment. I saw him racing over at the Sun Tour. Luke Mudgeway, very, very fast sprinter in his own right. Again, completely committed to the team tactic of Black Spoke, which is let's get that jersey on the back of Aaron Gate. He's obviously said, I'm up, I feel good. I know I I've done a lot of track training recently. I will be one of the fastest, if not the fastest, in the last 200 metres, no question. Uh, uh, look, I think there's a performance element here too, but I also just wonder too, uh, it's also Black Spoke Pro Cycling. They're wanting to introduce themselves to the wider cycling community. They're a relatively newly uh, launched team. This is a perfect opportunity to do it. Nationwide television, get yourself on the front, get yourself doing the work set the standard, set the benchmark, say, hey, we are a legitimate team here. We are a world-class team. And what a better way of doing it. But you've got to like Finn Fisher Black just sitting there at fourth wheel at the moment. And I just wonder whether one of the Black Spoke boys here has just dropped back to have a bit of a chat saying, come on, there you come go. on, guys, come through and do some work. That's exactly what come I Come and see. help us out up front. And not really still getting any buy-in, are they? Don't any of you want to wear this black and white jersey? Are you happy just to give it up? What's George Bennett done for you lately? Bit of psychology going on, perhaps. As we see Hayden McCormick roll through again, taking another big turn. Luke Mudgeway in that group. Number 129, Dylan Kennett there. Again, another danger man. They're all getting a free ride. Look Dion Smith in that group. <laughs> currently sitting sixth wheel in the black and yellow. This is where it can get frustrating. You know, you need some help. They, they're starting to realise. That's why they've gone back asking for help because the gap probably isn't closing that quickly. So Finn Fisher Black, he is the fastest in the world for the individual pursuit. So we know he's got plenty of power. I'm just so impressed by his racing now. He has sat down with George Bennett, showing real maturity for a young man. I just messaged Scott Guyton, actually, the director of Black Spoke, and I just said, mate, put the peloton in the gutter. Don't give anyone a free ride and look exactly where they're riding right now. Hard in the gutter. Nobody gets a so free ride. For those watching it, not sure in what Greg is talking about, there is a crosswind here, and it is coming across the right shoulder of the cyclist, therefore... They're trying to take it as far across to the other side of the road as they can, so no rider can get a draft from that crosswind, i.e. no rider can get their front wheel just tucked in behind the back wheel of the rider in front of them. You can see now they've had a headwind and it sort of spans across the road. And that's where you'll tend to get that staggered formation. And we go, that's a great example of it there. Yes. That rider on the front is closest to the wind. The riders at the back are furthest away from the wind. And therefore, you'll get that natural stagger. The rider behind is just trying to get their front wheel just in line with the deep rim carbon wheels. Yeah, the they go. They've moved it across. Exactly. He was just sitting out protecting the whole peloton. Now, take it to the side of the road. Yes, we're doing the work, but we're not going to give you a total free ride on the crosswinds. We need you to do some work. Well, Greg Henderson from the commentary position now starting to have some influence, texting Scott Guyton and telling him how he needs to take this. The leader of this newly formed New Zealand team, Black Spoke Pro Cycling. The there will come a time, there will come a certain moment, a certain a crucial moment or point in this race when the rest of this peloton will decide, while the brake's not coming down fast enough, we need to do something about this, and you'll see a lot of either other jerseys come to the front and start riding really fast, or you'll start seeing attacks. Okay, I, I want to ask you this question then. We, we know that Finn Fisher Black is in that group. We'll just let's come back to that because they're about to come back into the start finish line area. They'll have then five laps to ride. It is George Bennett, you'll see him swing around in the yellow colours, and Michael Torkler. Not too far away. We will put the clock on. It was around 2 minutes 50. 3.50. The first time they came through town. Has it gone out? You sense it might have. Dave Mann on one of the league bikes. An icon in his day. One of the great riders out of the way. Caddo region. George Bennett gone out on his own, has he? Oh, no. No, he has lost Michael Torkler. 
And Torkla now just oh. sitting up. So Torkla has popped. Torkla has blown. Or does Torkla now go back into the bunch? Now George Bennett has to go solo. What a tough day for Bennett. He's got 45 kilometer individual time trial. But we know this is an area of his cycling that he has improved dramatically over the last couple of years. It was his time trial that got him and ultimately won him the Tour of California. Second a couple of days ago in the New Zealand Time Trial Championships. But Michael Torkla, who looked for so good for so much of this ride, well, he simply waved the white flag. He has just simply burnt too many matches, and his day is done. He has blown to pieces by a pace set by George Bennett. Well, it's like we spoke about again. We get to that 120 kilometre mark where a lot of the New Zealand riders don't get to race that sort of distance at that intensity, and his legs just gave way in him. So Michael Torkel, really, what he's got to do now is just sit up, grab as much food as he can, get on the drink bottle, try and recover, wait for this chase group to come through. Has he formed a bond out there with George Bennett? Does he possibly go back and pretend, you know, does he act in a policeman role if he can, in fact, survive the chase group? Oh, uh, mate, he would not have let the wheel go uh, without a fight, so I'm thinking it's day done for Michael, unfortunately. What a fantastic ride. He showed his ability, how strong he is on the climbs, but now he's just, uh, it's, it's game over. It's lights out, unfortunately, for him. And sure, if he can get on the back of the of the peloton, then you know he's under no obligation to help. How important now is the role of Finn Fisher Black in that chase group, holding fourth wheel? He's not letting anybody roll through. He's just forcing the Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy to do all of the work. Surely his role becomes so important now. He will be looking to try and disrupt how he does that. Well, that's a different story. It'll have to be subtle. They haven't picked up Michael Torkler just yet. So Michael Torkler certainly got enough time on the road to try and recover. He is in good form. The nice thing for Michael Torkler is there are no climbs. This is all just a flat stretch for the next 45 kilometres. And we will just get that time. It's coming up to two minutes since we saw them come through the start-finish line. George Bennett, wow, what a performance, what a wonderful tactics that he's played today. He'd be wanting to switch to his time trial bike about now, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he, he did a fantastic, he did a fantastic TT only a couple of days ago. We know he's done a lot of work on his aerodynamic position. He's done so much position changing. He's done so much time in the wind tunnel. We know how fast he is now in an individual time trial. Now... He has to do it on well, a road bike. Well, he led Hamish Bond. We know Hamish Bond, arguably one of the only pure time trial specialists in cycling over the last three or four years. I mean, Hamish Bond, Row is naturally progressing to being good cyclist. Hamish just worked, worked, worked. I'm a time trial specialist. Well, really through the first 30K of that 40K time trial, he actually was ahead of Hamish Bond, so it shows that he's got the form. We know that coming off the Tour of California, he is going to be fully recovered for this race today. And with just a little bit of that stitch, an ongoing issue that he's had, he's had uh, uh, five surgeries to try and uh, uh, to get rid of a, a rib industry, a rib injury that's just been affecting his aerobic ability at times and giving him a bit of stitch. So they'll now come through the start finish line, and that gap has come down. Dylan Kennett in that group, so three minutes. So they have taken time. 3.15, 3, 3.20 maybe. I was a little bit late on the clock. But again, look who's sitting on the back. Larry Last, where we're getting a free ride. It's the flying mullet. Well, he looks super comfortable too. He's just waving to his mate on the corner. So uh, we got. Well, Shane Archibald, Dylan Kennett, who's going to win the sprint if it comes down to a sprint finish? Out of those two, I'd put my money every time on Shane Archibald. He's, he leads out Sam Bennett. Sam Bennett is one of the fastest bike riders on the planet, and to actually be able to get him to the front of a peloton, you've got to be very fast. That was my job for seven or eight years leading out Andre Greipel. The mullet man, he does exactly the same now for Sam Bennett, who's one of the fastest. And so his speed for two, three, even 400 metres is incredible. We've talked about the four riders uh, for Black Spoke here on the front driving at Aaron Gate, Hayden McCormick, uh, Luke Mudgeway, James Oram. They've got, they've got about, about 40 kilometres left. At what point did their fatigue levels kick in? At what point? Did they start to find their power being reduced? And one of them says, you look, I've done as much work as I can. I simply can't do any more. They're just starting to help now. That's exactly what I was alluding to, was um, the fact that 
they do get to that point where they get tired. Absolutely. Yep, they raced uh, Suntour last week, so they've had some good hard racing. But yeah, there's going to be a critical moment when the, these guys on the road will actually start to realise we're not catching fast enough. Well, that looks like just a little bit of not doesn't look quite as orderly at the moment. They've just got some help, haven't they? Yeah, just got a little bit of help. And I just wonder there whether they're just struggling a little bit with some of the winds on particular parts of the street circuit. So gels probably now coming into play. They'll be looking for more than just drink, possibly a little bit of caffeine in some of those gels just to give them that little bit of a pickup, just to try and allow them to maintain that concentration, just find that little burst of energy. Try and get an idea of just how well organised this chase group is. It is 13 riders, we understand. Well, there's a large halt in proceedings right here, isn't there? What's there going is. on? And I thought initially it must have been the headwind or something that's slowing them down, but there just seems to be a little bit of confusion. No, I we, think it's a great call. I reckon Black's boat has said, nah, mate, we're not going to tow you guys all the way to the finish. If you want to win this national title, come and give us a hand. Black's boat are completely off the front, starting to call the bluff. Mitchelton Scott comes to the front. They said, well, we do actually all need to ride if we want to catch this. Well, you heard it from Greg Henderson. So Black Spoke have said enough is enough. We're not going to burn too many matches. We need some help. There's as much in it for you as it is for us. So you've got to start taking up some of the workers. Just in front of us, we see this third chase group come through, which includes the likes of Sam Bewley. And Jason Christie, the two-time national champion, also in there. A few splits in that breakaway, too. You saw a lot of grimaces on the face, as you can tell. There's a lot of tired legs out there right now. It well, has been a rough day out there. Well, there's still a race going on, though, for the under-23 title. We're not sure how many under-23 athletes are in this chase group, but there is still an under-23 title to be one on the road Look as well. Look at this. They're freewheeling, they mate. They are across the road. Any time you see it bunched up like this, the pace is off. They're talking to each other. Who and is you know going to take this the helps? initiative? This, well, this is just going to purely help George Bennett, isn't it? It's going to play into the hands of Finn Fisher Black. Finn Fisher Black is a quality bike rider. We know how good he is. So you do. You, you, you pull back George Bennett. You open the door for Finn Fisher Black. But if the peloton is disrupted like it is now, then it's just playing more and more into the hands of George Bennett. He's just... All he has to do now, he can only ride one pace, and that's, you know, his time trial pace. But if they start going across the road like this, asking for help, and no one's willing to help, George will just ride away well, with this. Well, it would be one of the great individual performances in the history of this race. It goes back to 1934, the New Zealand men's elite road race. It is his 87th year. It's had some of the biggest names win it over the years, the likes of the Jack Swartz, uh, Yourself have been, have we mentioned you've been second five times, Greg? I think we probably have, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> but you do look back over the years at the road race champions that have won this. And Swinging it across is the just, road again. Uh, uh, on a roll, Gordon McCauley has won the most with five. Julian Dean's won it. Hayden Rolston. You go back to Heath Blackgrove. Yeah, it's an impressive... Uh, Brian Fowler. List, isn't it? Carl Murray, Carl Moore. Yeah, it's impressive. Right, so what have we got? What sort of situation have we got now? We've got a peloton that is becoming more and more unmotivated. They are looking at each other. They are, there's not the concerted effort by just a whole team of black spoke now. You've got guys bunched up across the road looking at each other. Look, you've even got Finn Fisher Black on the front going, well, guys... Hey, if you're going to be there, I'll go to the front and slow it down even more. This that. plays into my hands. Here we go. You can see... Now Shane Archibald and Dion Smith are going, mate, we have to start working. Yep. They totally agree. And, and Pure, uh, sorry, and Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy, they're also saying, hey, we're happy to buy in, yep. but we want some work here. We want yep. you guys to help us. And Hayden McCormick on the front, but we need to see some of these riders come through and take a turn. It's all very well looking like you're going to do it, but you've got to come through. You can't be soft pedaling. What we mean by soft pedaling is just simply turning the pedals and looking like you're working but in fact really not putting energy. And again, it's just going to group back up. This is better, though. Now now you'll see the time start because you've got everyone is, again, they're showing that they're motivated, they're ra they have to race. Like, if you're in this position, if you're Shane, if you're Dion, you have to put yourself in a position to win the bike race. It doesn't matter how if you arrive absolutely cooked or absolutely tired, 
you have to be at the front of the bike race for a chance to win it, and they know that. So this is what no, it doesn't normally happen in a European race because you'll be protected. You'll have a whole team that will chase for you. But in a national title like this, to actually be able to win this bike race, you have to be at the front of the bike race, and they're starting to realise it now, and they're coming through, and they will be hunting down George Bennett. Well, George Bennett, he will be asking for updates from those in and around him. He will be given time checks. He will have got a pretty good understanding now of where the crosswinds are, where the headwinds are, where the tailwinds are on this nine kilometre in the town street circuit. This is the third group on the road. There is big Sam Bewley, Wagon, the two-time Olympic Games bronze medalist, number 174. Coming through is Joseph Swale. So Swale out of Otago, just a young rider who's looking really as an opportunity to gain some valuable experience, I would imagine. Again, riding hard at the front, you can see still a chance. I mean, there's any, like I said, you just have to keep riding in this race. Any, it could all come back together. That's Anything, look at them now again. It doesn't look organised though, Greg. Exactly, that's what happens. And then they come back from behind. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a unique bike race well, 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 for the national we, champs. We don't know too, within that chase group, who here is potentially riding for George Bennett. George Bennett said, look, no one's going to work for me. I've got Finn Fisher Black and that's it. Well... Is that the case? Have they got a dark horse in the pack here? Have they got somebody who is just prepared to disrupt the little things, who for whatever reason has an incentive for George Bennett to win this race? Looking, I'd hate to use the word because it's probably not fair, but at times looking somewhat pedestrian. Yeah, that's... There's some interesting tactics. We are waiting for George Bennett to come back through, and then he will have four laps. It's around about um, 36 kilometres if he's to win his first ever national road racing jersey. It's a big ask. It's a really big ask to do 36 Ks. But consider where he actually took off. You know, it's not like he's just done the flat circuit on his own. He went flat stick up Mingakawa the last time. He has been on the gas for a good couple of hours now. It's, it's a big ass 36 k solo, but let's be honest, if anyone can do it, it's George Bennett. He's in fantastic condition. I was over at the uh, Tour Down Under with him, climbing with the leaders there comfortably. He's in great condition. He always gets himself in good condition this time of year. Heads to Europe in peak physical condition. And uh, he just came off eighth at the Tour Down Under, you know, climbing with the world's best, Richie Port um, and the likes. So, yeah, it's a big ask for anyone, but George is committed. George is focused. He knew he was going to be in this situation. And, uh, you know, there's nothing he can do. There's no actual rocket science to it now. He's literally... And he's about to come and swing himself in front of a large crowd that is beginning to build. We will put the clock on. We will try and keep you updated. He had Michael Torkler for much of this race. Now, he is in the race of his life. He knows the challenges are coming. The crowd will try and lift him. They will try and pick him up. The street fighter, this warrior, looking to try and hang tough. He is in a world of hurt here at the moment. He's locked himself in the torture chamber, and he is going to stay there. It's an... It, to have the ability to do that is a rare, rare talent. It's not something that you can coach. It's almost an inherent quality. And it is the young team now, this young team, and what I mean by that in terms of its establishment, the Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy team who are trying to get the chase going. And when we thought there was going to be some buy-in, we have been somewhat been let down because at the moment it is still that team who are at the front of the chase group. There are four of them, and Aaron Gate, Hayden McCormack, Luke Mudgeway, and James Oram. Again, you can see it dominated by Black Spoke, but it's not now Finn Fisher Black sitting fourth wheel. It's Dion Smith. It's Shane Archibald. They're prepared to help. I think this is the moment now, that critical moment where we said we have to start chasing guys or it's not coming back. So Dion Smith, what an incredible talent he is. Originally out of Taupaki, and he rides for the Mitchelson Scott team. He's got a friend in Sam Bewley. He's back in the third peloton. But he was an original member of the Pure Black Racing Squad back in 2012. He's sort of progressed through one pro cycling team. And he's just continued that progression. He is genuinely a contender here. He finished second in the New Zealand Road Race in 2016. Third in 2017. He finished second in Stage 5 of the Herald Sun Tour recently as well. So he comes in with some great form, Dion Smith. 
Actually, we just caught a glimpse there of the third group on the road, and they looked really, really organised. It'd be interesting to get a time gap, but here they are here again. They are riding really well together. Everyone's going through, taking their turns. It'll be interesting to see what a time gap between this and the chasing peloton is. Well, Hayden Wild on the front, 135. Now, he is a real prospect to go to the Olympic Games in the sport of triathlon. An incredible runner, a great talent. Coached by Craig Kirkwood. And Hayden Wild, what I like about him is he's here because he wants to become a better bike rider. So do not underestimate Hayden Wild. He's as tough as they come. He's incredibly talented as a runner as well. He's a sub-15 minute, 5,000 metre runner. Big Sam Buley coming through, take, taking his turns now. He's very accustomed to doing these long hauls on the front. He's very, very strong for his Mitchelton Scott team. Just asking now for a little bit of help. They'll know on the road. They'll know exactly. So Michael Torkler now dropping back into group three. And he'll just group be two. one. Group two, is it? Yeah, he's going so back. To he'll be looking to try and just get on the back there. And he's done the right thing. He's just sat up. Let's see if he can just handle this little attack coming out of the corner, whether he even wants to. No, it looks like he's happy to try and jump back in and join this chase group again. He's done the right thing. He's just sat up, taken plenty of fluid and food on board and trying to just get the energy levels back up and trying to recover, trying to flush a little bit of the lactic acid out that I'm sure um, George Bennett dished out to him up a number of the climbs. So 3.26 now is that gap. So George Bennett, 3 minutes and 26 seconds is the lead to the chase group. And Torkler is just about to catch and release. You just see him there, he goes. No, he's gone. So Michael Torkler, he'll just ride around and pick up some acknowledgements from the crowd. He certainly played his part in this National Road Racing Championship and great that it's on television because it will be documented. He's certainly been a key player in what is becoming a fascinating game of chess. But that was only 30 seconds they took out of George in that one lap. And, you know, what have we got? Four laps to go? We do. That's and they're not still not looking that organised, are they? As you've mentioned, I think the third group looks more organised. If they continue to take 30 seconds a lap, they're not going to catch him in time. They're going to run out of real estate. It does start to look a bit organised now. Oh, here we go, Group 3. Hayden Wild again, is it? So strong, isn't he? He's just tearing everyone, tearing everyone's legs off. Nope. Number 185. I'll just update that for you. So 185 in the men's race. Don't actually have here in front of me. Start list that I've been given. That's Keegan Hornblow. Keegan Hornblow. So is good. blowing legs off people. Look no, at him. Well, good on him. Well done. Real strong. Go good to, to the see. front. Get yourself some TV time. So it'll be nice actually to see a, uh, a graphic on George now, just to see how he's travelling, see what sort of condition he is. You can always tell a lot by looking at the bike rider. See how he's moving. See how he's he's, he's um, steady on the bike. Uh, you know, obviously what gear he's in. Um, It'd be nice to get a graphic, actually, but uh, at the moment, again, you can see this is the chase group, and they are organised. Again, it's predominantly black spoke, but they are getting help from Shane Archibald and Dion Smith and possibly a couple of others. There'll be definitely some guys in that bunch that are absolutely on their last legs right now, and, and they'll know it, and just happy to be there, have made the front group, super happy to be there and literally will not be able to pull a turn. But the likes of those World Tour riders, you've got to be asking those guys for some help if you want to catch George Bennett off, off the front. Yeah, we saw Jake Marriott out of Canterbury, number 110, as part of that group as well. I just wonder if we might be able to, and I'll just see if we can, maybe just replay that George Bennett interview we did prior to the race in terms of how he thought this race needed to play out. Well, I know we've got a number of people that have joined us later in the day. Wasn't it amazing that he actually told us what had to happen for him in this bike race, and he went out and did it? It's like everybody knew right here that's chasing now. Everyone knew what he was oh, going to do. I, I used to, you know, I know a guy like Gordon McCauley who has won five New Zealand road cycling championships, and he, he you know, colourful personality, polarised a lot of people, but he was another one. He'd often go out to races and go, this is what I'm going to do, and go out and do it. And everyone said, but we didn't really expect him to do it. And he'd always go and do it. 
And sport needs those sorts of personalities. I, I you know, I always enjoyed the colour that, um, th that he brought to the peloton. As we see this group three now come through the start finish line. Sam Bewley in there. Number 128, Alex Heaney, the local lad. I saw him actually over in uh, the Sun Tour just recently. He's riding very well. And some of the legends of the sport, the like great Jack Swart, they'll be enjoying this. They'll be enjoying this type of racing. Very much athletes who just wanted to take the race by the scruff of the neck and sort of maybe throw some convention out the door. That is a concerted chase, isn't it? There's no question. That is a concerted chase. Yes, it is game on now. This is the business end. This is where everybody understands there is a vested interest. There is a collective. It's so much greater than the sum of its parts. It's got to be a collective buy-in now, and we're starting to see that. Yeah, so what I was alluding to with, with George was the fact that he really only had one tactic in this race. There's only one that he could use, and he went out and did it. You know, it's like... But the thing is, everybody knew he only had one tactic. There's only one way that George could race this race. Everybody knew it, and nothing they could do about it. That's the class of rider that George Bennett is. Yeah, and when you've just got that expector and you just really that step up above everybody else, you can try or you want. You know it's coming, but it doesn't mean you can necessarily control it. It's funny because, uh, you look, using in a rugby analogy, I remember talking to a lot of the All Blacks in the 1990s, and I'd say to them, who's the best rugby player you've seen? They'd all go Christian Cullen. And it was what they said. They said, you knew it was coming, but you didn't know how to stop it. And that's the same sort of thing, isn't it? With a quality athlete, with a guy like George Bennett, you can have all the tactics in the world, but at the end of the day, sometimes you just don't have the genetics, do you? And he is absolutely world-class, you know, and that's a full credit to him. It would be just amazing to see him take the national title and take it to Europe, because you know that you would see it on the at the front of the peloton in the high Alps and the high Pyrenees, you would see George Bennett with the New Zealand national jersey on. It would be a fantastic sight. The Dolomites this year, actually. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's focusing on the, uh, he is. On the Giro, and, not the, the Giro Tour. The Giro uh, uh, oh, just... Yeah. Yeah, and George Bennett, he's already made it quite clear that he wants to target the, the Giro d'Italia, and that's very much, um, he will be the team leader for the Yumbo Visma team. The Olympic Games, of course, it's also suited to his style of riding and the World Championship. So three big races this year. Would love to try and win one of them or certainly get himself on the podium in one of them. Wouldn't it be great to have a New Zealand man or woman win a medal in the road race at the Olympic Games? Now, I just spotted something there that is quite interesting. I'm pretty sure I saw Aaron Gate rolling through taking turns. So I wonder if they've had to make an agreement where we're not going to let Aaron Gate sit on if you guys... If you want us to work, you work... And this, is, this is the message going to Black Spoke Pro Cycling Team. So Aaron Gate is their big rider. He's the guy that could potentially win this. So they've gone back to the rest of the riders in the group and said... We want you to work. They said, we want you to work, but we need to make sure your number one guy is doing his fair share. I think that's what's happened. Just by the looks of it, I'm pretty sure that's what's happened. They've said, right, well, we're happy to help, but well, I'm not giving Aaron Gate a free ticket to the line either. Boy, some wonderful, just, just the little subtleties that go on the sport of bike racing, just the tactics that go on. It's very smart, actually. It's, it's very clever. Very, very clever indeed. But to actually have the ability for some of these young riders to be thinking about that, and clearly they're picking up race radio. You've got some very experienced guys like Scott Guyton there saying, hey, look, this is the message you need to get across. This is the discussion you need to be having. These are the words you need to be using. Because sometimes when you're under physical and mental duress, it's very hard to maintain your concentration. It's very hard to think rationally too. Yeah, a lot of people struggle with uh, yeah, simple decisions, smart decisions when you're under a lot of pressure. It's um, and when you are under that pressure, again, you can lose concentration. You lose concentration in a situation like this, you are going to lose time. But it is still the boys from Black Spoke who have been really anchored on the front. And we are expecting George Bennett through the start finish line very soon. And then we will give you an update in regards to that time difference because he'll come through and he will then just have three laps around about 27 kilometres. But that will feel like 100 kilometres for the fact that, along with Michael Torkler, 
He's made much of this race happen on his own. Really happy to see uh, Ollie Jones just having a stretch there, but uh, I've been coaching him now for the last year. And uh, I had a quick chat to him before the start of the race and said, mate, your only opportunity is really get in that early break. They're not going to watch you and then try and hang on when they come and catch you. And he's done exactly that. It'd be a fantastic ride for young Ollie yeah, Jones. Yeah, tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, so he was the Zwift Academy winner, actually. He came up through through that, those ranks and uh, he w would, uh, won a stage year with uh, Dimension Data Pro team. But now he's tried his hand at a little bit of track cycling. He's, he wanted to have a, uh, his first go at the individual time trial, so he raced that on Friday. And obviously a big eye-opener for Ollie Jones. 40 Ks, you know, he's never done one in his life before. He said it was the most miserable thing he's ever done. But uh, then we talked about tactics today and what's my chances, and I said, mate, this is the, probably the best way for you to make front group. The fact that you had him doing the time trial on Friday, knowing the road race was on Sunday, the rationale behind that? Experience, it, I just think it's, uh, you know, he has to try. If you want to have a, be any good at a 40K time trial, you have to do them, you know. Yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, like I said, when you're fit, when you're healthy, when you're young, a day's rest is all you need. You'll be yeah. back. And and equally, too, if you want to be a professional bike rider, you've got to get used to day in, day out, the rigours of it all. You've got to learn to recover. You've got to learn to be able to back yeah. it up. As George Bennett now comes through the start-finish line, the crowd here in the downtown... Township of Cambridge really trying to lift he is this still moving. athlete. He is looking magnificent. He is tucked in that aero position. He has got a smooth pedal cadence going. He is hugging every single corner, taking the straightest lines as he can, trying to reduce, take a metre here, take a metre there. He's going to need it because here come the challenges. Here comes a group of 13 with some real contenders, the likes of Dion Smith, the Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy team anchored in there as well. The good news for him, though, he does have Finn Fisher Black back in that chase group who can act as a policeman, who can act as a little bit of an anchor in terms of disrupting this chase group. What an incredible ride. Can you believe that George Bennett has been off the front for so long with the power that is chasing him right now and he is holding them off. It's just, it just shows the level of skill and ability that George Bennett has. They are chasing flat stick right now. There is no one holding back. It'll be really interesting to get a time gap here now because if it hasn't gone down much, this is as fast as this group can go. They cannot go any faster. So if it's not coming down fast enough now, their only hope is that George slows down. Well, we saw a great women's race with Kate McCarthy going clear and almost holding on for what would have been one of the great women's victories. And she basically got pulled in with about four or 500 metres left to ride. Are we going to see a similar thing in this men's race? What now does Finn Fisher Black do? What, what can he do? How does he help George Bennett? Mate, there's nothing he can do right now. He doesn't have to do anything. He just sits there, eats, drinks, spins the legs, and just takes complete care of himself in case there is a chance that it comes back together. Well, Hayden McCormick, Shane Archibald, the flying mullet in this chase group too. And if it's to come down to between McCormick and Archibald, You'd have to go with the mullet, and I don't think that would be a bad thing. I'm not sure it necessarily be a great advertisement for New Zealand and Europe. You'd probably perceive that all of us have mullets there, Greg. Uh, he's well he's well received in, in Europe. He's very, very professional. He's at the top of his game. Everyone knows he's one of the most consistent lead-out men there are. Um, it would be a fantastic opportunity. But look, look here's the thing. They, they're trying to ride themselves into a position to actually win the bike race. You can't sit on and ask the bike race to come to you. It's not European racing. You don't have eight bike riders guiding you to the line and, and taking care of the breakaway. You've now got to take it on your own shoulders and have a crack at it yourself, and that's exactly what they're doing. Okay, so they're about to come through the start-finish line very shortly, and that split is still 2 minutes 45. They might have taken some time out of Bennett, and they will come through the start-finish line. 2.55 is the gap, so almost three minutes. So it is 30 seconds, 35 seconds they've taken. It's not a lot of time. 
Not a lot of time considering there are only three laps left, or for George Bennett, probably now two and a half laps left on the streets of Cambridge. Mark Watson alongside of me, Greg Henderson, who rode 12 Pro Tours. Greg, uh, in all seriousness, you have been in a number of New Zealand road races. What's the level of frustration like? I, I mean, I guess the most rational people can, can come irrational. Is, is there a lot of angst? Is there a lot of talking going on at this point? Yes, there is, and that, like I've, I've, uh, I've alluded to before, you, you have to put yourself in the bike race. Normally, you would want to try and arrive to the finish line as fresh as possible, but when you're in this situation and you, you have to use every energy to then to put yourself in a position to win, then worry about trying to win the bike race. So at the moment, you have to be riding through, you have to be chasing that three-minute gap, because if you don't, you're racing for a silver medal. Uh, oh. Well, compelling racing. Don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. It's only just starting to get going. It is amazing. They will be out here for 174 kilometres. What are we talking? Four hours, just over four hours. Race clock at the moment is three hours, 37 minutes and 46 seconds. It can come down to less than 0.001%. can often be the difference between a good night's sleep and a bad night's sleep. And I always say that, Greg, and it's a message to all young athletes out there, never push the snooze button. It's 10 minutes a day, it's 70 minutes a week. It's sometimes the difference between having the legs today and not having the legs. That's a good analogy. I'm loving the level of commitment right now. You can tell this chase group is committed. Nobody is saving anything. It's like we know now is the panic time. Now is the moment. If we don't go now, if we don't start closing that gap down fast, our, our chances of a national title are over. And do not underestimate, though, the ability of Finn Fisher Black. So, for those who are followers of George Bennett and the Umbo Visma team, there is still a chance that that black and white jersey could still head their way. It just might be on the shoulders of a younger rider who's done everything asked of him by his general today. He's Brilliant in, in terms of just getting in that initial break and then allowing George to bridge across. He's been anchoring this chase group. He's been sitting often fifth wheel behind the Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy team, sort of sending a message to the rest of the group not to come through. You can see uh, Shane Archibald going back down the peloton asking everybody, come on through. We need as much help as possible. That often indicates to me that they know that the time it's check is not coming down fast enough. They need more help. But just how much more help? How, how are the legs of Aaron Gate? How are the legs of Hayden McCormick, Luke Mudgeway, James Orham, this newly established black spoke pro cycling team because they have been the team that have been on the front for most of this chase you'd have to say the fatigue levels with what 25 kilometers left to go have got to now be starting to add up uh, you can tell by the body language of the the way they're riding you can tell everyone is on their limit head down just went here just giving it everything they've got doing big long pulls on the front as long as they can, swing off, try and recover, and do it again. See, there's Aaron Gate. That's what I was talking about. See, now, he is not the protected rider. He is he is pulling turns. Who are they riding for? So that's, that's my question. Orham. I haven't seen Orham at the front much. But that makes, no makes no sense. That makes no sense to race for James Orham. It has, to be, it has to be an agreement where they've said, we will ride with you as long as you make Aaron Gate ride because I'm not going to give him a free ride to the line and his possibility to then when the bunch can kick. But don't forget Finn Fisher Black. We all talked a lot about him, but we just have. think, you know, his final two, three kilometres in the individual pursuit, he's a world record holder in that distance. He's been sitting on all day. He technically has the freshest legs out of this peloton right now. And, you know, all he needs is 10 metres, 15 metres. He could just do a bit like a Cancellara and just ride away in the distance in the last three or four kilometres. Yeah. Former, former world champion on the track. And his sister has already won the women's race. Wouldn't that be remarkable for the Fisher Black family? His older sister, Neen, won the women's race today with a piece of brilliant tactical nous. And what an opportunity if Finn could do what his sister has done. As we see the third chase group come through. And it's certainly a little bit of the punch and pops come out of that group as well. Mm. It's still, I'm still really happy to see Sam Bewley in there. He could easily just racked it for the day and called it, you know, called it quits. But good on him. 
absolutely still in there, still riding through, going to finish, and just that's uh, you know a testament to his professional. Um, character, well, he's he, going to do respect to he, the he, national he's title. He's one of the real unsung heroes of New Zealand sport, one of the most underrated sportsmen here in New Zealand. Here he is, riding for one of the biggest teams in the world, ride the Grand Tours, sacrifices himself for the greater good of the team. He's won two Olympic bronze medals. Uh, you know, his track cycling history is remarkable, and yet he probably walks down the street, not many people probably really even know who he is. He probably quite likes that, though, to be <laughs> fair. <laughs> yeah, old wagon, he's pretty laid back out of Rotorua. And that's the thing I love about the sport of cycling. I always remember the likes of the Wesley Goffs and those riders all come out of these sort of smaller towns around New Zealand. They, they do, You know yeah. what you're riding for. You know why you're doing it. Where sometimes I think in the larger centres, you're probably doing it because the school's sort of forcing you to do it. Mum and Dad sort of want you to do it. The big cities like Dunedin, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh. No, it's good. It's good that Sam's carrying on. And it's, it, again, it's a great well, training Mark day. Ryan came out of Timaru, Hayden Ralston out of Ashburton. Yeah, I always used to joke with Rolly. I said, mate, because I used to travel up to Christchurch for track training. I said, mate, the sooner they bypass Ashburton, the better. Like, <laughs> it would be nice and uh, it would make my trip to Christchurch a bit quicker. Yeah, Greg Henderson alongside of me. Lovely to have your company the afternoon as we get set for arguably one of the most enthralling, intriguing National Road Race Championships we have seen for some time. It's very rare that you get a rider coming with a big reputation as a fa race favourite on a course where it perhaps doesn't suit him. But it is unfolding that way. And for George Bennett, he is in the race of his life at the moment. He desperately wants this. He wants this for the greater good of cycling in New Zealand, having those colours incorporated into his Yumbo Visma team colours. And I He's can been get working it. on his time trialling. He's been putting everything into this. It's his time. You sense it's his time. And I can guarantee you his team right now are watching the live feed over in Europe. They will be absolutely just screaming at him. Like, they're such a supportive team. There's such a great network of riders, staff. That's um, just a real community. Yeah. And we talked about it during the women's race, but for those that have come into this broadcast a little bit later, let's just go back again and talk about why it is so important, why it is such an honour to have a national road racing champion within your team and what it does mean for that team and what it does mean for the rider in Europe. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity. It's like you are representing New Zealand all year. You are the number one representative of New Zealand. And you know that if it goes on the back or on the shoulders of George Bennett, it will be visible in the high, high mountains during the biggest races of the world. It's just a fantastic honour. Um, again, likely if it went on, on the shoulders of someone, say, like uh, Shane Archibald, it would be at the front of the peloton in the bunch sprints. So it's, it's an honour. You are representing every time you ride your bike, you get to pull on, you know, the silver fern, and you get to represent your country. Mm, well, remarkable, and that would be incorporated into the black and the yellow covers, colours of his trade team, or possibly into the trade colours of someone like a Shane Archibald, which tend to be sort of more predominantly white and blue. And so that is what they are racing for. But it's also to add their name to a long, illustrious list of former winners. It's one of those little things you want etched into your resume. And so plenty to race for. We'll pick up our pictures very shortly back out on the streets of Cambridge. They had six laps on this inner city circuit, which it's technical to a degree, but arguably the greatest challenge on the course at the moment is the crosswinds, the headwinds and the tailwinds. And George Bennett, when he comes back through town, he will have two laps of around 18 kilometres. And we saw him come through. That gap was below three minutes, but they weren't taking out big chunks of time each lap. So plenty to look forward to. Greg Henderson, at this point, what's going through his head? Is he just, what, concentrating on taking every corner as tight and as straight as he can? I guarantee he's trying to keep as small as he can on the bike. You know, he's trying to be his aero and keep as much speed into the corners and out of the corners. He's fueling regularly. He knows now he's on the limits of, of nutrition. He's, he's trying to put down as much sugar as he can now because he's used everything that he's got and he is just hanging on. He's on the right of his life now. He's got 18, 20 Ks to go. If he does this, this will be one of the most monumental national titles I think I've ever witnessed. There you go. That is coming from Greg Henderson, who in his own right's resume is as good as anybody that's ever ridden a bike here in New Zealand across track and road. So lovely to have him alongside of me. Hope you are enjoying our coverage of the Vantage 2020 Elite and Under-23 Road National Championships for the first time 
in Cambridge, the capital of cycling, the cycling hub for New Zealand, the velodrome here, of course. And so this crowd now starting to build. A number of people have been out on different parts of the course, up French Pass, a number of the climbs. And now they're starting to congregate around the finish line. Yeah, we're starting to see a really nice crowd build as George Bennett enters into the final straight now, still out of the seat, gaining back up speed. Someone's giving him a time check on the side of the road. One of his supporters, he'll know exactly how much time he's got on the chasing peloton. OK, now we'll get to have a look at his form two here, Greg Henderson. Can you see anything there? Have we seen any noticeable change in the way he's set up? The head doesn't seem to be moving, still seems tucked in. Mate, looks, looks a million bucks. Looks beautifully balanced, doesn't he? Looks a million bucks, I tell you. He is on one today. He is looking smooth and strong. Look at that. But do not underestimate the world of hurt he is in at the moment. He is absolutely on the red line. He is what they call in cycling on the, the rivet. He is going to just have to rely on all of his experience and just hope, just hope there is confusion, just hope there is a little indecision in that chase group. And he will be hoping that Finn Fisher Black, for whatever he can do, he knows that Finn Fisher Black is there for him. He knows that Finn will be wanting to see him get across the line in first place. There he goes, tucks into his familiar position. He's riding a skin suit. He's got this, he's got uh, no, it's called the system on the back with his numbers. They don't actually use pins anymore. They have a really thin see-through sleeve in which they can just place the numbers down so they become more aerodynamic as well. And he's just now on another time trial. He's basically doing exactly what he did on Friday. He's just got the time trial now. The one good thing about George, you have to remember, is he's used to climbing mountains that are 45 minutes to an hour long. He can hold a sustainable power for a very, very long time, and that's exactly what he's doing. Yeah, to be one of the best time trialers in the world, you have to be able to do that. Got the slightly deep carbon rim wheels. We talked earlier about the technology now on the bikes, and it has been well documented that sort of once you get above 24 kilometres an hour, it is the deep carbon rims is the way to go. And this is a course where, yes, it had some tough climbs in it. It was always going to be predominantly flat. So he has set himself up. He'll have his little computer there that might be giving him power output in regards to the watts, the amount of power they're putting through the pedals. And that is always just a really good way of getting an idea in terms of their own fatigue levels. He'll also know what parts of the... He just saw the chase group. I'm pretty sure that was them going the opposite way, was it? Maybe that was the second group. However, um, what I was going to say was he'll know parts of the circuit where he can put power down, where he'll lose time, or here they come through now. Well, 227, and it is still the Black Spoke, Black Spoke Pro team on the front. Hayden McCormick, by the looks of it, driving this peloton, and that time is 2 minutes and 26 seconds, there or thereabouts. So... Less than 18 kilometres to go for George Bennett. Is it enough? Can he hang on? The race of his life. Look at that. He is just in a massive gear now. He knows he needs to be able to turn it quickly, and he's doing exactly that. What a rider. What an athlete. Crowd here willing them on. Go, George, is the call. They're desperate to see this young man win this race today and deservably go on the shoulders of arguably New Zealand's best current road rider. What an athlete. You cannot coach what he is doing. Most people wouldn't survive 30 seconds inside of his head at the moment. He is suffering. Internally, he is bleeding. Look at the man. The nine kilometer laps. What a warrior. Again, he knows I've only got 20, 25 minutes maximum of racing left. I can judge a 25-minute effort. I, I know how to hurt for 25 minutes. Exactly, That's exactly what he's thinking. Greek two. So, this is the, what, the third chase group on the road or the second chase group? Second group. And it is still, every time we go back to it, Black Spoke on the front doing the work. Are they getting the buy-in? Interesting now, we're seeing Finn Fisher...
Mm-hmm. Black, is it coming towards the front? Yep. Maybe looking to just soft pedal a little bit? Yeah, exactly. It's all looking like it might... As you come to the front, you look like you're doing some work, but you're really just soft pedaling, not quite putting the same power through that perhaps the rider previously on the front was doing. But look how good he looks. Wow. George Bennett, hanging tough. Wonderful performance if he can pull this off. One of the great rides in the 87 years this event's been going. Essentially a climber, term time trialer purely for this race. How much will this mean to him? He knew there was 70 kilometres of flat towards the finish. He sat down with Finn Fisher Black and said, this is how we need to play it. He's taken the advice. He's used all of that experience. It is playing out beautifully at the moment. And you just sent Shane Archibald now on the front of this chase group. There will be real panic in that peloton right now because they know we are not closing fast enough. If we we need help, we need buy-in, we need everyone in this group right now to help. There's only one person that should be sitting on right now, and that's Finn and Fisher Black. Otherwise, they have no chance of catching the flying George Bennett. Yeah, but Black spoke. Is it in anybody's benefit if they come through? How much powder left in their legs? I mean, they might be coming through trying to keep this tempo going, but how many matches do they burn in that initial chase? He's on peak road. In my opinion, you have to burn every single match you've got because otherwise you're not racing for the win. What a race. We thought the women's race was incredibly special in its own right. This men's race, it's living up to the hype. It's living up to the billing. I still don't believe too many people genuinely believed on paper. That George Bennett on paper could win this race Correct. because he just simply didn't have the team. One rider, two riders cannot beat teams of six or seven, cannot beat 13 riders in a chase group. Is the impossible about to become possible? You just would not pick a pure climber being able to... to hold off a chasing peloton, a motivated peloton. You look at the way they're riding, they're motivated. You just wouldn't think that he could actually hold off a chasing peloton. Yeah, well, the joke going around is that it's a track cycling course and that they brought it to Cambridge because the track cycling program's here, but that's not the case. George Bennett, people are hoping he can do this. We normally see him in the mountains. He's comfortable with his head above the clouds, but look how comfortable he looks at the moment. He is stomping on it there. You can tell he is giving it a, a red hot one right now. But look at the motivation in this peloton. Don't count them out yet because you know it's one versus five or six right now and there's still some very, very powerful bike riders in this chasing peloton. Here's Shane Archibald on the front doing big ones. He knows there's no use me be turning up to this line fresh for second place. I want that jersey yeah. and nothing else. Punching out huge power. Let's talk about the type of wattage that he is likely to be putting out at the moment. An average cyclist, what sort of wattage are they putting out? Then put that in context of what we can expect on the front of this chasing group. For sure, every time the boys are going to the front, they're hitting 500, 550 watts for the, sh for the short pulls that they're doing. It's, it's a lot of power. It's, um, but the thing is, it's, it's on and off. You can see, oh, oh, that might be the first sign of a little bit of labouring from George. Race he, course right, possibly into a little bit of a headwind here. He is in a massive gear. He could just be resting. He could be just changing up the muscles there. Yeah, here we go. Switch down the uh, gears now. That, that's an interesting thing you say because I think it's something that riders need to do a lot more of. It's learn to ride efficiently out of your seat. Often a lot, you hear a lot of riders go, I'm more comfortable climbing sitting in. And you go, yeah, but if you train the system to ride out of your seat, it will give that different muscle, give that muscles a little bit of a break and use slightly different muscle groups. Now more communication coming. We're not seeing black spoke now on the front. I just wonder whether a number of those riders don't have too much more to give. Are we starting to just see a little bit of splintering going on in that chase group as well? Fascinating. Number 104, he's been good all day, Hayden McCormick. But immediately, Finn Fisher Black jumps all over him. George Bennett's team's mate. And if two of them, no, in fact, that, that they will bring up no. the rest of that rider. But this is good from Finn Fisher Black. This is where he can disrupt. They have to ride around him now. He will be soft pedaling. He does a beautiful job. It might only be a second, but that could be enough. What is going through the head of this man? A head like granite. Normally rides for his team. He's finally been let off the leash. George Bennett in the ride of his life. 
When he comes around, he will get the bell lap. Nine kilometers to go. Arguably the hardest nine kilometers of his life. He is deep in the hurt box right now. You can tell he's actually really well, mate, suffering he's now. He's locked the key. He's throwing it away. He is stuck there. He is in a torture chamber. This is the first sign I've seen today of George actually suffering. He's looking very... I mean, he's still travelling, don't get me wrong. He knows how to hurt, but that's the first time he's shown any signs of it. He is breathing he's through out of his the seat, eyelids. In and out of the seat. That's not a good sign. The razor blades are absolutely attacking the lanes. Yeah, it come. is now down unto two minutes the lead. Come on, George, is what the crowd are urging. The chase group is coming. And when the wheels come off, the wheels come off. And now, look at the organisation. Look at the urgency here. It is a wonderful thing, a wonderful race. Just really, really, you really feel for George. You just, it's exactly what happened in the ladies' race. You really feel, just hang on, George. There's still, there's still disruption in the chase peloton. Look, they're still not organised. They're still not committed. Fight, George. Get that little bit of food into you if you can. Just grab that squeezy. Use any part where you get a tailwind. Chuck it into your biggest gear. Put just a little bit of doubt, and now there is a bit of indecision in the chase group just when you thought that gap was closing. Still another chapter to be written. Hang in there, ladies and gentlemen. One of the great men's road races oh, developing attacking. here we're in attacking. Cambridge. Now the attacks are coming. And this is Dion Smith, one of the pre-race favourites who's gone off the front. So Dion Smith now just trying to test the legs, perhaps, of the rest of the riders. He'll be trying to get rid of any stragglers. He'll be trying to get rid of anyone who's not trying to help in, in this chase. He'll be trying to put them under load, offload them. Then we've got a smaller chase bunch that is 100% committed to trying to catch this bike rider. George is on Vogel Street. Not long to go for George Bennett. How desperate does he want this? He had no friends. It was lonely. He said, nobody's going to work for me today other than Finn Fisher Black. I'm going to have to take the initiative. He was out here during the week. He was doing reconnaissance on some of the descents. He said, look, I think I can hit this corner this hard, this sort of gear ratio. And now it looks like somebody has thrown a hand grenade in the middle of that chase group. It looks like it's possibly exploded. It has exploded. Here we go. What this a is race. It. This is exactly what had to happen. The critical moment now. We've got... A chase group of 13 looks like it is now going to be reduced to just three. This is the perfect move. This is what we had, had to happen. Now we can hit three guys. We've got a black spoke there. Archibald has obviously just dropped the hammer. And black... Dylan and, Kennett in that group. And one of the black spoke riders. So that's a really good, strong group of three. They have now just got to fully commit. And... 1.38 is the time gap. Um, it is still significant. But... But the energy levels of this man Poor George are is looking tired. to go to empty. What has he got left? The people at Cambridge, if you're watching this, if you're a George Bennett fan, you need to make plenty of noise. You need to encourage him. You need to be that extra man pushing him. Let's have a look at the form there. Let's have a look at the gear that he's in. He is still chucking down a big gear, George Bennett. Pedals just a little bit more upper body movement. Doesn't look quite as relaxed. You just see that bike just rocking back and forward a little bit. He is definitely fighting it, but he knows, like we always, he knows how to suffer. This is what he does for a living. This is why he is at the top of his game. He has just absolutely worked to logic. Wonderful, wonderful bike rider. I hope the rest of New Zealand are watching this because if you want a metaphor for sporting excellence, you want to see the consummate professional, the consummate athlete, you've seen it in George Bennett. But now you can just sense maybe just a little bit of cramp. He swings, takes this right-hand corner. Archie Bald is on that chase group now. He has got a lot of power on those legs. He's got everyone under pressure. He's having a yap to them. Quite vocal actually. Probably giving him a little bit of uh, subtle influence to come and help me work. And that's Dylan Kennett and that's Aaron Gate. He what, knows Aaron Gate and Shane Archibald. Does, obviously very good friends. Does Finn Fisher Black have any opportunity to try and come across and bridge? Does he have anything left in that? What is now arguably the third pack on the road in terms of chasing he would not have let that go. If he had the legs, there's no way. Finn OK, Fisher. he will take a thing. Come he will on, come George. back through. George Bennett, Cambridge stands. Cambridge acknowledges one of the great bike riders that New Zealand's ever produced. Nine kilometres to go. He's got nine kilometres to go. It'll feel like he is just simply riding through quicksand at this point. Twelve It'll minutes feel like of the racing. The brakes are on. 
George Bennett. The clock goes on. Wow, what a race. It's now one against three. 12 minutes of bike racing left. Is there enough time? I don't know. I don't think there is. Well, that is the call from Greg Henderson. That is the call from Greg Henderson. George Bennett will know too. And that split is one minute. Ten seconds is what we're getting. That is our understanding. So it's still out to a minute. Have they got the legs, these three? Let's not underestimate the level of fatigue that exists in this chase group as well. That's all right. That's completely correct. They are all tired right now. Everybody is on their knees. You can tell Archibald is the strongest. Here we go. He's gone solo. Well, I'm not sure this is in anybody's best interest for Shane Archibald to go solo. He is a pure sprinter. Does he have the ability to time trial? He's got 59 this is good seconds. For George, but he's got 59 seconds. So the two big riders, Shane Archibald, now trying to chase down George Bennett. One way or the other, we could see the New Zealand jersey in Europe at the highest level. At the, at the very least, I think we are going to see the national jersey in Europe. Well, that is great news. What a race. Two very contrasting styles of bike rider in George Bennett and Shane Archibald. Archibald had to rely on the bunch. He had to rely on the peloton because he is the sprinter. Bennett knows he doesn't have the wheels if it comes down to a sprint. He knew that he had to take the initiative. He's done that. He has been magnificent. Wow. This is one of the great races, one of the great moments, arguably. The, the remainder of that chasing peloton is in pieces. Everybody is on their last legs. It has been a battlefield out there. Everyone is cooked. And everybody knows, Greg, we've all ridden bikes. We all know just how quickly the legs can come off. You can be leading a bike race at 150 kilometres and sitting in the gutter at 155. It can happen very, very quickly. George Bennett, what is going through his head? Has he ever bled so much? Has he ever suffered so much? You would think so. But he is a man who loves his country. He is an absolute patriot. He so desperately wants this. He deserves this. But Archibald is not going to make it easy. And to be fair, the two guys chasing, Aaron Gate, Dylan Kennan, they have not given up the belief either. They are hunting Shane Archibald's stool. It's not over. This bike rate is, is, is nowhere near over. We've got George Bennett 59 seconds up the road. We've got Shane Archibald in hot pursuit. He, he is just trying to hold off the two behind him and trying to catch the guy in front of him. This well, is a drag race. Well, it's down to one and two. Well, unbelievable. Goosebumps in the commentary box. Greg Henderson, the adrenaline is flowing through the streets of Cambridge. Bennett looks over his shoulder, the first sign of fatigue. He's just got to put his head down. He's got nothing left. He's on empty. It's 50 seconds, though. It could be enough. It could be enough. Because look at Archibald. Now, that body language says that he's not doing it that comfortably. He's down on the drop bars. He's not in the narrow position. He's not as relaxed as he needs to be. Now he tucks into that position. He is pushing a massive gear, trying to just bridge the gap. 50 seconds. He's got 50 seconds to close in eight seven or eight kilometres. That is a big ask for anyone. I don't care how strong you are. Remember, they've been out here for 170 odd kilometres. Everyone is cooked right now. I bet you this has given George Bennett a mental lift, knowing now it is mano a mano. It is me against one guy. He'll rake those chances. He'll oh. love those chances. Settle in. Settle in. Gutsy. Courageous. Boy, there are not enough metaphors to describe what we're seeing. He only had a few opportunities in this race. And he just took them. He showed his class. And now the only thing between him and his first national road title is whether or not that needle drops too far below E on the petrol gauge. I just interviewed these two on Thursday night at the airport. And uh, they're great mates, Shane Archibald, George Bennett. Often they live together in Girona. They train together. They drink beer together on the off-season. They're, they're mates. And now it's one chasing the other. It's like you couldn't write a better script, could you? George, in and out of the seat. You can tell his back, his glutes, everything well, is broken on him right now, but he is just fighting. He's got six Ks to go. Can he hold off the flying mullet? Well, that gear ratio, he's still riding a relatively big gear. What we mean by that is that he's in the big chain ring on the front and he's in a sort of a, a lower or a, a smaller cog at the back for those that are not necessarily um, aware of some of the cycling terminologies. And these are the chase group. These are three and four on the road. So number 129 is Dylan Kennett. 
I'm just curious. And the rider next to him too is out of this Black Spoke Pro Cycling team. We think that is it is in fact Aaron Gate. So we talked about the riders who potentially could win this, and certainly all four are still in the mix. I'm just interested as to why Shane felt it necessary to attack these two because they're still working. Sue, so, oh, there we go. I just got a, shook, a shake of the head. Dylan Kennan is cooked. I says, I'm sorry, mate. I have got absolutely zero left in the tank. And you can see the impetus is just gone. This is, this is probably why Shane, I was just curious, why did Shane attack these guys? And that was probably exactly what was happening. There was, there was just not enough cohesion. Well, Shane Archbold and George Bennett. <laughs> Bennett, can he just get that pick up? Look at he's gritting the oh, teeth. It's everything he's now. gritting the teeth. The razor blades are attacking the lungs at this point. He's got nothing left. He is riding on pure heart. And how big is that heart? What a warrior. He knows he hasn't got far to go. It'll feel like, though, he's at... He's tired and that he's at the bottom of Alp Duez or some of the great tour climbs. That's how this next 3K will feel for him. He is used to burying himself for others. Now he is doing it purely for himself. Who does this? Who punishes himself this badly? What did he do this week to deserve this? Mate, you would give... You would give it everything for that national jersey, and that's exactly what he's doing. You can even see the pedal strokes starting to stomp those yep. pedals. He he's is just dead. got a little bit more what we call duck feet. You're just starting to see not quite smooth, not he quite as circular it. as it was. He could be anything. Could Peddling be. He's been out there. Squares. How Peddling long has he been out there, mate? Oh, he, unbelievable ride. Here comes Shane Archibald. It could. I'd love to see a camera pan there, but. That Look could at even him. Be he's, that got, he's got second wing now, Bennett. He's got second wind. He doesn't normally pedal like that. I wonder if he's like, he could even have some kind of cramp. Just could be have a little bit of cramp. It would just be feeling a little bit stuff. You've got to remember too, he's had five surgeries on his ribs. He's had this rib issue that has led to some chronic stitch. It's been a, a, a major problem with his riding career. It's something that he's been trying to correct. It hasn't been easy for him. He's going to take a right-hand turn. He knows he's not far away. That was the big headwind straight. He had to get that out of the way. Once, he did. And once he swings around that headwind then when he takes that right-hand turn will be a crosswind. Here we go. Out of the seat again. In the big, big gear. He's trying to get it back up to speed. This costs a lot of energy when you come in and out of the corners. Here he goes again. He is just fighting. He just knows now all I've got is five minutes left of racing and I can take this jersey to Europe. Come on. Come, come on, on, George. George. It's the word from everybody here. And I've got to say, we here in the commentary box who have watched this race unfold have said, come on, George. But that gap surely is coming down now to probably less than 30 seconds. So the flying mullet is beginning to make his move. The two biggest riders in New Zealand road cycling are one or two in what you can only describe as a dog fight. Just a small gap is what we're hearing from the race commissaire's vehicle. Now look at that pedal yeah. motion, having to get out of the seat. Is he cooked? Is he cooked? Has he cooked himself? Has the fuel gauge gone to E? Hanging in there, George. What an amazing we ride. We still haven't seen the face, though, have we? And we cannot underestimate the fatigue level, though, of Shane Archibald, who is looking to try and chase this down. We're assuming that it's just Bennett in trouble. The second time up Mungakawa, he took off. And it was a long way from home. He had 60-odd Ks of flat rate to do on his own. And now here comes Shane Archibald. He will be... He's just about to make contact. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have two riders come to the line to take the national title. George has resigned to the fact. Here he goes. He'll probably shake his hand as he goes past. And that is it for George. It's well, going to be one and two. The jersey is going to Europe, the though. The jersey is going to Europe. Now Archibald will just need to try and attack and go past him. He's had the benefit of basically being able to sit all day. But look at Bennett. What a fighter. He's trying to close that gap. That bungee cord doesn't open. Is there still hope for Bennett? You'd probably think not. Not, but certainly, as Greg Henderson has alluded to, the jersey is going to head to Europe, which is great for New Zealand cycling. Archibald has to be the favourite, surely, now. You've got to remember, Shane has still got to ride because there's two guys hunting him right behind. George does not have to do a thing right now. He's done his job. It's like, hold on for dear life now. So just hang on. Just hang on. Just hope. So right we on, do have still possibly another chapter to play here. One and two. 
best mates, live together in Europe, live together in Girona, train together in Girona. Now they're off the front of the bike race at the national championships. It was the most courageous ride I've ever seen. George Bennett, he took off on Mangakawa. He had 60-odd kilometres of flat riding to do on his own. It took Arch Archbold, a group of 13 or 14 riders, to help get across. He's finally bridged solo, and there's two guys that will come now into the finish to have a crack at the national title to take well, that jersey you home. you can't really... Shane Archbold, arguably one of the great lead-out riders in the world. He's got plenty of power. He's got the watts. He knows how to burn. He'll, he wouldn't have burned as many matches. He's had, hadn't had to go at solo all day. It's really only been over the last 10 kilometres that we saw him go. All he has to do is just ride a hard tempo now, Shane, and then maybe take 15 or 20 seconds of recovery. He doesn't have to ride all the way the line. That's all he'll need. And then, unfortunately, the power that he has compared to George right now is just going to be a little bit uh, exaggerated. Well... It'll be a great back. It'll be great for Shane Archibald because he's recovering from a crash that he happened in the Tour de France in 2016. He's tightening his up pelvis. the bootstraps now. They're getting ready to sprint. Shane's just tightening up his shoes. He doesn't want to make any mistakes with this sprint. This is the one you cannot mess up. So they will swing around. Large crowd gathering in the streets of Cambridge. What Anything he can get rid of. So now... Even George, good on him. He's not given up. He's going, I'll have a crack at you. I've got absolutely nothing to lose. You tow me to the line, and I'll have a crack at you in the sprint. And, and the thing with a guy like George Bennett, you know, they do have that ability to recover very, very quickly. So now the commissaire's vehicles will get out of the way. They will swing around, and they will line themselves up for a sprint finish. But you cannot think that, really, it's Shane Archbold's race. He has the power... As they just almost through fatigue, run into one of the run of one of the cones. Now the tactic that George has to employ here is only is a chance of surprise. It's a chance of laying off the back of the wheel like the sprinters do and take a run at Shane's wheel, take him a little earlier than you would expect and hope to get a jump. Go jump hard on the opposite side of the road that Shane has to then chase him. So there is a game of cat and mouse going on now. Archibald taking Bennett across different sides of the road. He has a look over. He will not underestimate George Bennett. This but is the one time you do not want to make any silly mistakes in a sprint. On paper, it should go to Archibald, but never, ever can out the courage of George Bennett. What a champion. Archibald, well, you see, we said he's recovered from serious injuries. Back to his best, the flying mullet. What an athlete. He had a great campaign leading in here. Tour Down Under led out Sam Bennett in the first stage of the Tour Down Under to a victory. He's, we know he's in great condition. So here we go. Not too far away from crowning our 2020 New Zealand road cycling champion. Two of the very best. Two contrasting styles. It will now come down to who wants it the most. Who's got the legs? Archie Bowl goes. George Bennett probably doesn't have anything left. He doesn't. Shane Archibald will become your 2020 Vantage Elite National Road Champion. George Bennett, what a warrior, will finish second. The good news is the black and white jersey will head to Europe on the World Tour. What a performance from Shane Archibald. Tactically brilliant, as was George Bennett. Greg Henderson, what a race. Wow. Mate, we could not have picked, we could not have picked the winner 10 k's from the line. It was, again, just phenomenal. And then when Shane attacked that small group that he went with, you were like, well, OK, he's got some good legs. But then he had a chase. He had to catch George. And we just noticed between the two of us, George in and out of the saddle, changing his position. He just started to look uncomfortable, didn't he? Yeah, and that's always the first form, isn't it? The moment you start to see the form go, you know it's fatigue. Some people will go, oh, look at him. Look at the ugly face that he's got on while he's breathing. Well, some people accentuate hurt, others don't. As we see, a good little sprint finish coming. This is for the bronze. And this is for the bronze medal. And Dylan Kenner. Dylan Kennett will pick up that bronze medal. Lovely. And we've still got the under-23 title out there to be handed out, so we'll try and see if we can pick that up. I'm not quite sure. Ollie Jones just crossed... Ollie Jones just crossed along the line there. That was a great ride by young Ollie Jones, so that will be for f uh, fifth place. Who's the uh, first under-23? Has one come across yet? Maybe no, I'm we, not sure. We so I that. don't think so. Maybe so we've still, still got the under-23 title up for grabs, which in itself has a lot of prestige. Absolutely. Wow, what a ride, though.
And to be fair, Shane, he did ride tactically perfect. Well, look, to be, uh, to, to be fair, I don't think he could have been any more perfect from this man. He must be just devastated, just so upset. But he can't be. He, he gave it his everything. He took his chance. You just wish for good things for this young man. I think he'll want to find a quiet place for a couple of minutes, that's for sure, <laughs> before he comes and faces the and we uh, will catch up with the commentators. both Shane and George. We've got Andrew Dewhurst on course. Wow. What a ride. What a, what a national championships. It was everything that we thought it was going to be. It was the attack on Mangakawa. We knew it was coming, and it came. It was the big, long chase, 60 k's of flat, the big town circuit. It had to be a concerted chase. It had to be an organised chase, and it took every single person to you, catch George. You wonder, how different, you, you wonder how different it would have been, too, if Michael Torkler had have just been able to stay just a little bit longer with George Bennett. He looked so good, Michael Torkler, and he took us all a little bit by surprise when suddenly he just popped. Even one more lap, and the, yeah, exactly. It's a lot of what ifs, you know, and that's unfortunately that's bike racing. We've, I've been around, we've all been around a million of them. It's uh, it's one of those things, and it's just you can't fault anyone today. Now, a good little sprint finish coming here from the rest of this group, including Finn Fisher Black. And I just wonder whether Finn Fisher Black might have got up and taken that under 23 title. There was a salute there, so I'm. OK, we have got Andrew Dewhurst standing by with Shane Archibald, the 2020 National Elite Road Cycling Champion. Well, Shane, bike racing, it's one heck of a crazy sport. So for so long, how much hope did you have that you were going to get up and win that? Oh, I reckon 100 people have told me in the last three days, the course is pretty hard, Shane, the course is pretty hard. I guess they're referring to... My uh, stature, my size, and um, the only thing I was thinking was put me in the race, give me a bit of luck, anything's possible. It hurts to ride down George. I played probably the best tactical race. Yeah. This is big, isn't it? This means so much to you guys. Uh, the, uh, the fact that you'll take this jersey across to Europe and around the world, uh, this is big, isn't it? Yeah. One thing was make sure I'm fed and make sure I get the splits. Um, there's about 400 splits out there, and in 1K it changed 30 seconds, so... I don't know what uh, what watches everyone's using, but I just didn't care. I was so happy for George riding around, and it hurt me, as I said, to ride. But I, after the last three years I've had, I really needed this. You are back, and this absolutely underlines that. And, uh, and I know that everyone is wishing you well for the rest of the year, but uh, this is one they'll never take away. We're going to let you go and gather your thoughts, but uh, this is pretty cool, eh? National title and very proud Kiwi. As I said, there's one thing, uh, especially for the young kids, and, uh, don't stop peddling. I mean, I was talking to him. Rowley did it People sit in the race. Is the other message, don't cut you here? <laughs> Come over here, Todd. There's two, there's two things about Todd that are quite uh, unique. He's the only one that's really taken on to the style, and he's also branded up thanks to the Flying Mullet Sports Bar, Papanoa Beach. <laughs> One of our other uncles has uh, fitted out some of the family off the T-shirt, so if you're ever in Tauranga, pop down the mount, have a drink. Good stuff, mate. Wonderful, wonderful performance, and uh, we feel you hurt for George, but as I say, that's bike racing. Well done, mate. National champion. What a remarkable comeback in terms of his career for Shane Archbold. The emotion he broke 
his pelvis badly in a ride back in 2016. It was Sam Bennett who got him back into the professional peloton at the highest level. You could see what it meant to him, Greg Henderson. Mate, it was uh, it was my last Tour de France, and um, I was riding down the hill. We were chasing back onto the peloton, um, a very, very fast ascent. Shane was actually on my wheel. We went around this corner. All I just heard was this massive smash, and I just remember getting straight on the radio going, is Shane OK? Is Shane OK? Is he up? Because we were flying, and it went into a brick wall. I got, we got to the finish of the stage. I ended up pushing him up the final of that stage, and it turned out that, no, it couldn't carry on. Broken pelvis, his back, he was just, you know, unfortunately for him, he just lost a couple of years of his career. But what a way to come back. He's fought his way back. He's now leading out one of the fastest men on the planet, and now he's taking the national title. Uh, it was hard to watch. I can see the emotion in your eyes, certainly emotional for me. Um, and there is that message in there, isn't that he said, you know, you've just got to keep pedalling. You know, sport is about adversity. You have to learn how to lose before you learn how to win, and he is a great example of that. But what I love, too, he has that just genuine compassion for George Bennett. He knew what Bennett had endured out there, but they both know this is bike racing, and some days it goes your way and other days it doesn't. Yeah, that's that's 100% true. Like, like I said, I, I alluded to it was... A best mate chasing chasing down the best mate. He knew what George had been through, and uh, yeah, he said it hurt hurt me to chase down George, but you know he raced. You can't take it away from Shane because he raced perfectly himself. Okay, let's catch up with Dylan Kennett and get his thoughts. He was a key factor and a key player in how this race ultimately ended up finishing. Andrew. Well, third place, uh, Dylan Kennett. Sir. I know you guys are a very tight bunch. Before I talk about your race, I want you to talk about your mate just behind you here who you've just said well done. Yeah, um, coming around with, uh, must have been one of the bit laps to go, he, uh, he uh, chucked the hammer down. I just thought we burned her on the front and then they chucked the hammer down and I could tell this was like a serious, like full commit move and uh, I had to give it everything to get across to Shane and um, Aaron and when I got there, they wanted me to roll straight away and I got copped a bit of... Uh, Mouth from uh, Shane, but uh, yeah, I was just happy to be there at that stage of the race. I've never finished the road race before, focusing on the track, and I got you know a month to prepare for it. But um, Shane was adamant that we could catch George, and like even if I wanted to, I couldn't. But I said to him, I don't think it's possible anyway. Like in any day, I was happy happy to race for a medal. But uh, it'd be nice to come back next year with uh, stronger legs to be able to um, think like that late in the race. But uh, you know, it was a real impressive ride, that's for sure. Yeah, and impressive from George as well. I mean, he just played all the cards and very similar to the women's race. Uh, that finish line can seem an awful long way away, can't it? Yeah, well, um, I think George must like his time trial at the moment because I don't know how many uh, Ks he's clocked up this weekend, but um, he's obviously in really good condition. So, um, yeah, it's going to be exciting to see uh, his racing uh, early in the season, that's for sure. Um, but, yeah, he's a madman. Um, yeah, it was very, very impressive. And, um, you know, the, the, it, it was a real hard day, yeah. Very impressive for you, though. I mean, you're on the podium at the Vantage uh, Elite National Champs, and uh, if you if you can't win it, you want to be on one of those three steps, so you've got to be thrilled. Yeah, well, um, coming into those last few laps, I was uh, had to you know change focus to thinking about winning because I, I I just I didn't think we we're going to pull him back, but um, yeah, for me, it, I was happy to to race for a medal, and um, yeah, and happy to happy to pull it off, and um, yeah, it's, it's been a good day. Out, yeah, good stuff. Well done. Thank you. Third place, third place today, but George Bennett, well, he took the race by the horns and it didn't quite, didn't quite work out the way he had dreamed and the way he had hoped, but he just reinforced and established his reputation as arguably New Zealand's toughest athlete. What well, a mate, like there was just, uh, they just talked about it then. How many kilometres this weekend has he done solo? You know, he did the individual time trial. Now he's done 60Ks individual as well. It's like, uh, yeah, for a 58-kilogram for a climber to have that sort of power is just impressive, and he's just going to have a fantastic season. Absolutely brilliant. Well, I hope you are enjoying our coverage of the Vantage 2020 New Zealand Elite Road Cycling Nationals. Um, Greg Henderson, I mean, <laughs> the key moments... The highlights for you? 
It has to be the move on Mangakawa when when uh, George went and there was one man, there was only one man in the whole peloton that could stay with him. It was Michael Torkler. I mean, what a fantastic ride by him. Um, but just the fact that everybody knew the only way that George could p potentially win this bike race was attack second time up Mangakawa. He did that and nearly came away with the bike race, even though it was 70 k's of flat to go. Just unbelievable. It was just, yeah, that's my highlight, no question. Yeah, and we also want to acknowledge what was a very good women's race earlier in the day too, because we had our elite national women's race uh, prior to this, and it was Neen Fisher-Black who ended up taking out that women's race, just an under-23 athlete, um, older sister two of Finn Fisher Black who was a team, the only teammate really in the peloton for George Bennett also congratulate Ella Harris second in that race and then Therese Radham the first elite female across the line as well and and that was just an absolutely uh, wonderful race as well we are going to now see the New Zealand jersey in Europe and it's going to start with the Spring Classics. How cool is that, Greg Henderson? I mean, you know more than anybody. Absolutely, and I'll see him over there. It's going to be fantastic. It's uh, the it starts with the Spring Classics. You know, we've, one of the first races you'll be very prominent in will be Kern of Brussels Kern, and then of course, like us, we've been speaking about, he's the dedicated, he's the committed lead-out man of Sam Bennett, who was at winning bunch sprints all over the world. So you're going to see the national jersey at the front of the bunch, in the bunch sprints, it's going to be, it's going to give me goosebumps every time I watch it. Yeah, and it's a great investment, isn't it? And we are just seeing more and more riders getting themselves in the peloton now, more and more New Zealand riders being picked up by trade teams overseas, the performances that we're seeing from George Bennett, the performances that we're seeing from Shane Archibald in Europe is showing that there is a pathway through to competing at the highest level. Uh, the intriguing thing for me is that when it was all said and done, we had two very contrasting styles of riders duking it out with two kilometres to go. Com and that doesn't happen often. No, nah, complete opposite bike riders, aren't they? And they were the last two men standing, effectively. OK, I'm not going to take anything away from anyone else that was out there because that was a super, super hard race for everyone. But the two contrasting styles, and you saw in the finish, it was about three pedal strokes that Sh Shane took, and that was when George said, Congratulations, mate. Right, we are going to get, we're going to have an interview now with Finn Fisher Black, who is a member of the Yumbo Visma development team, who was George Bennett's teammate today. Andrew Dewhurst has him standing by. Well, Finn, uh, we've just seen the effort from George. Uh, it can hardly uh, stand. So you were part of that team effort today and tactical ride. Congratulations, first under 23 title. You must be pleased. Cheers, yeah, no, we put it all out there on the line today, right from the first time up Manukawa. Um, I think we did everything we could, we just had two riders there, so it was uh, going to be hard for us and we knew that, so everything we could all the way to the line, it was just unfortunate for George, but yeah, I'm stoked to take out the U23. Uh, we, we can hear your pain, and it's, it's as much for George, isn't it? It might all be for George, because that was the plan, wasn't it? You followed it to a T, but uh, uh, just ran out, of, uh, ran out of gas, very close to the line. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes it even more gutting. It's just so close, and, um, you know, it's, it's been one of George's biggest goals for as many years as he's been going, so, um, yeah, it's pretty gutting for both of us, so, yeah. For you, though, in, in the days to come and, and the months and years to come, you'll celebrate this. Uh, they can't take this away. It's a national title in a hugely competitive field. So, for you, you felt pretty good out there? Yeah, definitely. There was, um, I was on one of my best days today, and, um, yeah, I'm stoked to to finish it like that with the U23, so, yeah. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll go and have a chat with George and uh, get your own recovery in, but uh, well done on playing a part in an amazing race today. Congratulations on the win. Yeah, thank you very much. And how cool is that, that both jerseys will be in Europe at an under-23 level and an elite level? Doesn't happen often. You get to see, yeah, in Europe, we're going to have both national jerseys there. It's uh, yeah, fantastic achievement. You could feel his pain, couldn't you? He actually really, really felt for George. I mean, I think, I think everybody feels I think for George. Everybody, feels yeah, for everybody George. is certainly bought into Shane Archbold. We saw how emotional he was, and maybe we underestimate just how much of a toll mentally that injury's taken out on him over the last three or four years, wondering if he was going to get back to the front. And then, yeah, the emotion of George because the sentiment around him, the guts, the courage.
and he just came up a little bit short. And, you know, to be fair, he did nothing, absolutely no, he did everything right. It was just that you can't take it away from Shane. He just did a fantastic ride. You saw him at times go back and try and motivate that peloton to chase. We need more help. We need more horsepower. And then he was the one that then attacked out of that peloton to come across to George. He was the only one with the legs to actually bridge the gap. And, uh, you know, Shane's very, very well liked in the in the peloton too. Like, it will be, it's a very, very popular win, don't get me wrong. You know, we all feel for George now because we saw how courageous he was. But don't get me wrong, it's a very, very popular win. Shane, I mean, I'm absolutely wrapped for him. I love the guy and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing him over in Europe wearing that jersey. Uh, one of the other things I want to talk about, we talk about the development of the sport in this country. So we've got Black Spoke Pro Cycling Academy. Um, they were very prominent in that chase. In hindsight, could they have played that differently? I mean, how um, how much of a part did they play in Shane's victory? For sure, they had they took it on, and I really you have to take your hat off to t for them taking on the responsibility. They were the team; they took on the race. They thought the only way we can win this is we have to catch the front. For sure, they had the numbers, so they're almost obligated to help Chase. I think one of the smartest moves was, and I don't know who made the call, but we saw it on the television was when. The World Tour riders, which was Dion Smith and Shane, they said they started to work only if Aaron starts working. We're not going to give Aaron a free ride, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's pretty sure that's the conversation that would have happened. Okay, right. Let's go back to Andrew Dewhurst because he has with him George Bennett. What a warrior! Well, here with uh, George Bennett, just sharing a word or two with. Uh a man who was alongside him for so much of that ride. And uh, I know Michael's just come up and said, I'm sorry, mate, but there's nothing to be sorry about when guys lay it on the line, as you've done, as Michael Torkler did today. That was emptying the tank, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, he went full gas. I was just telling Torky, I mean, uh, he must have been done some serious, serious power to stay with me up Mangakawa. Um, I did basically as hard as I could, and, and not many people in the world can, can actually follow that, and Torky can so that's insane for a guy that works 40 hours a week um, <laughs> again Finn Fisher Black watch out that, for that guy you know he's going to be he's you know he's the future of New Zealand cycling and I uh, also had Joel McMillan helping me out and he did a great job but in the end I just just wasn't good enough you know wasn't nothing I could do they caught me a couple of K to go and then uh, my, my glutes had just given out by then couldn't sit down anymore couldn't do anything and um, Disappointed, but on the other hand, you know, Shane won. He's a good friend of mine. It's a cruel sport. I mean, there's nowhere to hide, is there? It exposes uh, that bravery, doesn't it, when you take a race on like you did today. There's just nowhere to hide, but I'm guessing that's partly why you love this sport. Yeah, nowhere to hide. I mean, well, actually, there's a lot of places to hide in the bunch, but, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not here to do that. You know, I mean, it's not that... Not that I want to go solo for 80k, but um, well, how else am I going to win when they make a course like this? I mean, hopefully next year they, they get rid of this, you know, we don't want to go out peak road again, we don't want to do all that. I mean, it's just it's just sucks the life out of the race. So I think we need to do some more Mangakawa, maybe bring it, bring it into town, do a few shorter laps, get the crowd involved more because these guys have to wait 20 minutes for us to come around. So I think there's a lot to work on for next year, but on the other hand, I think it's been a great event and I'm really, uh, really happy in, in what, what the ride festival have done and how great... Um, you know, how they put it on and, and how well organised that is. So, a few tweaks. I mean, it's always going to go through a teething period in the first year here. And uh, in the end, we, we did have an exciting race, but um, it's pretty much impossible for, for the climbers to win. It, it means so much for you guys to come back and race here, the, uh, our, our top pros, our world-class superstars. It means so much for these fans as well that have come out. Uh, and on their behalf, they're delighted to see you and, and not the result that you wanted today, but all of you... Uh, two of pros that are out here. It means so much to you, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, obviously you saw how emotional Shane was when he won. I mean, um, you know, he, everyone wants to wear the jersey. Everyone's proud to be a Kiwi. And, and um, you know, it, it, it might not be the biggest race in the world to, to, you know, in terms of cycling, in the cycling world, but um, to New Zealand it's, it's really special and it's something we all want to win and second means nothing. Huge effort, brave effort, and I know the crowd will let you know right now. George Bennett, well done. Hard luck today. Well done, mate. Thanks, everyone, for coming out, and uh, thanks for all the support out there. It was, it was really special seeing my name on the road, everyone yelling for me. Um, yeah, and 
Unfortunately, Sam Dooley got round, so... <laughs> well done, George. George Bennett. Well, emotions at the different ends of the spectrum, one of absolute elation, and for a whole lot of different reasons, for Shane Archibald and a disappointed George Bennett. Second, well, it means nothing to him because he is allowed to be disappointed because he came here to try and win. He is a winner. But you have to say, sport, cycling in this country is just a wonderful place. He mentioned Finn Fisher Black is the future of the sport. Um, some interesting comments in terms of what maybe George would like to see um, with the course next year. Uh, does he have a point there? It'd be nice to see, um, you know, we've got a sprinter have the jersey now. It'd be nice to see a climber. He deserves to take the jersey. That's a big, big ask for, for George, like we talked about. You can see the disappointment in second place, and I really feel for him. OK, let's get another perspective from one of our greatest ever cyclists, two-time Olympic bronze medalist, Sam Bewley, is standing by with Andrew Dewhurst. Well, Sam, uh, that's one heck of a, a race that unfolded today. You weren't a part of it right at the pointy end, but uh, you were right in the heart of it. Uh, that course and George and Michael going away just absolutely split the race open, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um Probably knew that George was going to do something like that. It was like really his only option on a on a course like this. But he was he had some serious legs today, um, and he did some ma massive, massive damage on that climb. And obviously, he nearly went all the way to the line, line himself after that. So, no, it was a tough race. Um, always unpredictable. The nationals always a little frustrating at times. But you just have to keep riding and and sort of hope that it all comes back at some point and see how it goes next year, I guess. What was the talk in the peloton at different times, if any, when you were getting the splits? Uh, Shane has said that a lot of other riders and a lot of advice was coming in. Uh, George is gone, you won't get him. What was the conversation in the chase pack? Normally just swear words. Yeah. Um, oh, no, there's a lot, there's, it's hard here at Nationals because everyone's got their own idea and everyone's um, you know, do, doing their own race. Um, and sometimes the, the obvious thing to do is sitting right in front of your face and people don't people don't really understand it or, you know, people are also on the limit a lot. So it's hard to get people motivated at times, but um, that's mainly the conversation is try to get everybody rolling. You know, we had to, we're in a, at a point where we had to, we had to really get the group moving. Uh, we couldn't let it go out much further than it was. Uh, and then that's basically what, all we were trying to say to everybody. It's a great advertisement though, not for George and the way he lost today, but the quality at the front of this field with Shane having to ride so hard to ride George down and with having the likes of yourself in this field uh, says a lot about cycling at the pro level for New Zealand. Uh, you guys are flying the flag. You must be pretty proud. Yeah, we probably should talk about Shane. Uh, he's a national champion at the end of the day. <laughs> George did a good ride, but Shane won the race. So hats off to him. Um, you know, we're all of us are really good friends and and we're just stoked to see see the jersey going to Europe, and, and Shane's going to do that jersey proud, no doubt. Um, so yeah, hats off to him, and I look forward to seeing what Quitstep can come up with with the design. Good stuff. And, and for you, what's next? I'm flying to Europe tomorrow, although I don't really want to. Um, but planes don't wait, so off to Europe tomorrow, and then I'll be racing in Belgium uh, the following weekend. Ten. Good stuff. Appreciate uh, your time. Well done today, and good luck this year. Cheers. Thank you to Sam Bewley there for giving his time. And there are the two trophies. The women's trophy goes back to 1981. The men's trophy back to 1934. A long, illustrious list of winners. And those that have, I really guess, set the tone, the platform for what we're seeing now in Europe and the pathway through to Europe. And, of course, there have been some great names that have never got their name on that trophy, including the man sitting next to me and Greg Henderson and George Bennett. He might just have to wait another year. It is a cruel sport, the sport of cycling, but in its own right, it is just so intriguing. It is just so fascinating. Yeah, the race today, I mean, you could, like both races, the, the, the women's race and the men's race, you could not pick the winner five minutes from the finish. It was just an, an incredible race. So, OK, George was a little critical of the, of the circuit just because it didn't suit him 100%, but um, we had fantastic racing. You cannot deny the fact that we had two amazing, two amazing races. Yeah, and it'll also be a really special moment in Europe for our under-23 winner, Finn Fisher-Black as well. Um, nice trophy for him, and um, there it is. It almost looks like the trophy from, um, it almost looks like the trophy from Parry roubaix doesn't it? The, uh, a big from, from the Kimmelberg. Uh, from the Kimmelberg. Oh, yeah. Okay, Valgen, the um, part of the, part of the Spring Classics there in Belgium. 
one of the races at the Gent Wevelgem race. That's uh, oh, Kimmel Berg's one of the famous climbs. Now, when is that in the season? How far from that, now? That's actually around the get the Parry Bay, you can get in Wevelgem, you get all those all those major classics. Mm, yeah, Parry. And that's basically very much an acknowledgement and paying respect to those diggers that fought in that part of the world, the New Zealand soldiers back in World War I, 1914 through to 1918. So it is a wonderful trophy. It is incredibly special. And they actually fought on the Kimmelberg, we have been told as well. So um, that is the significance of that trophy. And we will have those uh, podium uh, awards and the official rostrum very shortly here as we continue our coverage of the Vantage Elite and Under-23 Road National Championships. The uh, the new shirt, the Dakuna Quick Step shirt of Shane Archibald with the New Zealand silver fern on there, it's going to look pretty special in the peloton. Now, I'm does he get a little bit of input in terms of how it looks? No, there's, uh, there's UCI regulations Are and there? how big there is, so it's... Um, It'll be black and white, though. Well, that uh, wraps up the, uh, the racing sure. yeah. side of things, but still our medal presentation to follow, so please stay with us. Join us on the reserve for the medal presentations, which will follow momentarily. And just a, a shout-out for all uh, medal winners in both men's, women's and under-23 races, if you could join us in the, uh, the marquee just alongside the stage. So come and see us, I think, in the Specialised, are we? But uh, come and see us right in the special the street still... Hit. We did notice when he was riding in and out of the seat quite a bit, and in his interview, his post-race interview, he said, my glutes were gone, I just couldn't pedal in that position anymore. It, it, it's interesting he talks about the glutes, because a lot of younger riders too, you know, they, it, it just shows that, you know, if you're pedaling correctly, if you're sitting back further on the seat, it is the glutes that you should be using. I know a lot of athletes, particularly triathletes, and I keep coming back to that, tend to ride a little bit further forward, and it tends to be more the hamstrings. So George Bennett, just part of the reason why he's so efficient, why he's so good, and it just comes back to that physiology and the mechanics and the way he rides a bike. And just right, let's just go back and bring you a highlight of this men's race, uh, just the final stages of it. It was one of the great elite men's road races and two of the big names. And just here at that point, well, George Bennett, he is just well and truly spent. He was never, ever going to win that sprint. And look what it meant to Shane Archbold. It would actually be... a pretty nervous situation for Shane even though you know hands down he won it it's just one of those situations where you do not want to make a mistake and and you know look the wrong way over the shoulder but he did everything correct and in the case you hadn't noticed he took it to one side of the road if you go to one side of the road on the barrier you can only get past on one side right. you, if you sprint down the middle he can surprise you on any side so he did that correctly I remember talking to Tor Hushoff when he won his world title in Geelong and he said the only thing he was nervous about in the butt was making a mistake in the bunch sprint he, he's had it sewn up and you know in his books but he was just, he just, he's, his final words to himself, don't mess it up. Yeah, and it is. And again, we talked about it. You are under duress. You are fatigued. It's not just physical at that point. It is mental. And we all know when we're tired, we lose our concentration. Uh, just talking about trying to sprint down the inside. I always remember that terrible crash with Abdu Japaroff. Down the Champs-Élysées. In the Champs-Élysées. Champs uh -huh. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go on YouTube and watch that. That is what you do not want to happen at any sprint race, Greg Henderson. Absolutely. Down the Champs-Élysées, you hit one of the... Uh, Coca-Cola bollards back in the day. The um, the old uh, signage and the and the barriers were a little different back in those days. They've obviously changed them a lot now for the safety of the riders and the big bunch sprints. But yeah, that was a it was a nasty sprint. And the helicopter view, looking down, and he was just like flat spinning on his on his face. It wasn't good. No, it wasn't good <laughs> at all. I uh, hope you have enjoyed the coverage. But we do want to have the podium presentation. It will be very emotional, I would expect. And yeah, when you look back through some of the names that have won the race, Gordon McCauley, five-time champion. Jack Swartz won it on four occasions. It's a big name back in the 70s and 80s, and it's just been littered. And in time, people will look back and go, well, Shane Archibald won the New Zealand men's road race. There'll be a lot of people hoping that maybe this time next year it will be George Bennett. And you do have to feel for him. Does he go now through the rest of his life with the if only in his minds or he can't well, he shouldn't be tortured by this should he no absolutely. you know sport can be cruel at times like you miss a penalty and a, a, a knockout of a football world cup because it comes to a penalty shootout and you've almost got to live with that yet you've done nothing wrong
if yeah exactly that he did nothing wrong if he had made a mistake somewhere or then you could kick yourself but he did absolutely nothing wrong he rode perfect he rode textbook at the end of the day it was just two kilometers too far mm. so what can we take from his performance looking at the rest of the year he has already said look i want to focus on giro d'italia and i want to have a crack at the olympic road race from what you saw today is there a has he stepped up again over the last 12 months it's pretty hard to to definitively say that because he is world class in the hills, you know. So the fact that he managed to drop the peloton, we expected that. But did we expect him to be able to hold off a peloton for 60 k's on the flat? I wouldn't have picked it, you know. Mm. And what a tremendous job he did. So just the podium to get ready as we go back and look at our women's race and what a special moment that will be for Neen Fisher-Black, her first title and under 23 rider. Also for Ella Harris who many expected to probably win the sprint when things did come together and both of them are all stressing about the champagne, the best way of doing that. I might get Greg Henderson I might get Greg Henderson to talk about the best way to pop a champagne cork because you've probably done it a lot more than I have but I imagine there's a bit of a technique and also Teresa Adam uh, who finished third today on the women's side. You've got to give it a good old-fashioned shake first, mate, before you even start to turn that cork. And then you can just sort of prize it, and give it another shake, and then just aim it at someone. And then you target somebody here. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I was, uh, I was in Wanaka yesterday for, uh, for uh, uh, another race, and they had the old podium, and everybody's sort of sitting there in the front rows. I'm like, you do not want to be there. Yeah, Certainly get... some athletes better than, than others. Usually the ones that So we will now throw over to that official presentation. Andrew Dewhurst, the MC for that, and recognise and honour sporting excellence. And sometimes it's something we don't do enough of in this country. So just waiting. Yeah. Weber Baby Q and the Weber Baby Q stand. So if you were clever enough and sensible enough to go and put your name in the draw, uh, we're going to uh, announce that winner uh, momentarily. Would you please welcome, and they've been great supporters of the event and great riders. Gosh, I saw so many Golden Homes uh, T-shirts yesterday. Please welcome Golden Homes CEO Wayne Smallwood to come and uh, let us know. Put your hands together for Wayne and the Golden Homes team. Now, Wayne... Uh, We've literally, I think, got some bits and pieces over there, but we're going to make sure the barbecue's delivered as well. Uh, and if they're not here today, I stress this is not a spot prize, so we will get the, uh, the prize to them. But have you had a good weekend? Fantastic weekend. Very, very glad to be a part of the event, and I think our crew and everybody's had a great time. Great weather. Hopefully it rains shortly for all the farmers because it's pretty dry out there. But, you know, we, were it. you one of the ones with the uh, T-shirt on riding yesterday? I was wearing a T-shirt, and I was there in support. But I did pay the bar tab later, so I think it's the same thing, isn't it? Fair enough. Fair enough. Great to see you and the team here. Okay, so listen, I, I, I expect that... Okay, we're, we're going to um, shuffle it up. and I Shall I hold it and you draw the winner? How's that? Yeah, there we go. So you reach in. We've got all the entries in here. This is for the Weber Baby Q, courtesy of Golden Homes. Well, we've got two. We're going to separate them. And... Got. It meets all the rules, and uh, yep. who have we got? Who's the winner? Karen McLachlan. McLaughlin. McLaughlin? McLaughlin. We'll call it McLaughlin. If your name's Karen anything. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Karen McLellan. Karen, if you're here, come and see us. Yahoo. But if you're not, uh, is that you, Karen? Come here. Give her a round of applause. She's here. Yeah. Come on up. Fantastic. Come on up, Karen. Well done, thank you, and thanks again to the team at Golden Homes. Kieran, well done. Go and see uh, Wayne and uh, pick up that prize. Congratulations. So uh, we're just going to uh, check now on our uh, 
uh, athletes, sorry folks, and just make sure that we're uh, ready to go with our medal presentations for the Vantage Elite Nationals. And we also have our King and Queen of the Mountain prizes to uh, hand out. So stand by, we'll be back in just a moment uh, with our medal presentations for our Nationals. Kate uh, McElroy, Kate, we're looking for you to join us, all of our medal recipients, if you can join us in the specialised uh, marquee, just uh, across from the stage. So Kate McElroy, and also uh, all of our other medal winners, and uh, Michael Torkler will need you as well, please, for the presentation. Michael Torkler, please make sure that you're with us for the presentations also. Just again, a, a shout out to Kate McElroy. Kate, if uh, you're on the reserve, if you can uh, join us, uh, presentations will begin very, very soon here on the stage.
We opened our Manuka honey season with a traditional welcoming ceremony and a blessing. That's done to get everybody on board with the same goal to produce good quality honey from the land and be respectful of the land as we do it. So the team were up pretty early, 2.30 this morning. Um, and the guys have been, the rest of the crew have been working all night, bringing hives from a, a location where we had them staged. And at first light, the helicopters have arrived. So we, we plug up the holes on the beehives so the bees are, are tucked away. Then we strop three pallets of beehives and we put them under the helicopters and fly them out into the wilderness. As uh, the manuka flower is just coming on now, as you can see behind me, the, the flower is looking really nice. So the nectar will be starting to flow soon and we've got such a short window. And then in sort of 10 weeks time, we'll, we'll be flying back in and picking those hives up. Uh, they'll hopefully be heavy with the pure natural manuka honey. Well, good afternoon again and welcome everyone to our official medal presentation for the Vantage Elites and Under-23 National Road Championships. Uh, we also have King and Queen of the Mountain prizes to award. First acknowledgement I'd like to make, though, is a very special one today. And uh, it's, a, it's a man who won this title back in 1982. Uh, we believe that he might be the only man to finish runner-up six times. Uh, the reason we're bringing him up is partly just because he's a legend and he's a great guy, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, organising and delivering, can you believe it, his 200th cycling event today. Please, a round of applause for Stephen Cox. I'd, I'd make you get up there, mate, but uh, I don't know, it's a big jump. Um, pretty cool. I mean, you, you won this event. You've been such a part of the cycling scene, and we just wanted to acknowledge this today. Uh, you must take a lot of pride now in delivering these events for a lot of people. Yeah, look, I mean, it's been my life for a very long time. Um, sort of started organising events since I finished racing, and, um, yeah, I love it. And I mean, obviously, the last 10 years with Nathan and Anna helping um, has, has made a difference, yeah. And... Uh, can you still remember back to 82, mate? What was the day like that day? Yeah, I have. Uh, unfortunately, I've got a really good memory <laughs> um, of probably the six seconds more than the, the win. Um, but, yeah, look, it was straight after the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane, and, um, yeah, the form was pretty good and uh, got down to Jack and I like it used to quite often and, um, yeah, managed to skip away on the last hill and, and win it. So, yeah, I was pretty pleased. Uh, this is very impromptu, very ad lib. We just want to acknowledge uh, the 200th events and uh, celebrate your career as well and uh, the fact you get so many people involved in cycling. Stephen, thank you very much for your time. Stephen Cox, ladies and gentlemen, 200 events. Amazing. We move on now to the king and queen of the mountain, those with the most points uh, over the climbs today. Three climbs for the queen of the mountain and four for the king of the mountain. Queen of the mountain, proudly brought to you by Forsyth Bar. Forsyth Bar, a New Zealand-owned firm, providing a full range of investment services from 21 offices nationwide, including two local offices here in the Waikato. Now, their sponsorship of the queen of the mountain uh, reflects Forsyth Bar's commitment to supporting women in leadership and to mentoring future high achievers. Would you please uh, a round of applause and thank you for their support as Michelle Rolly and Hamish Bond join us on stage from Forsyth Bar. Thank you. Thanks, guys, for your support. The winner of the Queen of the Mountain jersey and $500 in prize money is Kate McCarthy. We'll make you just uh, take one more step when you get the uh, jersey on and jump up on that top podium there, Kate. Well done. 
Second, uh, as a matter of interest, was Teresa Adam, and third was uh, Anna Marie Lip. But uh, as she takes the top step, round of applause for your Forsyth Bar, Queen of the Mountain, Kate McCarthy. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Michelle and Hamish. The King of the Mountain is proudly sponsored by SIS. Science and Sport is proud to be part of the Three Peaks Ride Festival and supporting the cycling community. Science and Sport is a leader in its field of sports nutrition and a provider for high-performance sport New Zealand. Would you please welcome Sia Taylor from SIS New Zealand to present the King of the Mountain. The winner of the SIS... King of the Mountain jersey and $500 in prize money is, he had a very, very brave ride, Michael Torkler. Well done, Michael. And uh, was the only rider able to uh, climb with George early on. And... Uh, Played all those cards. Uh, great ride, great contribution to what was a stunning race today. We'll get you to zip up and jump up. Well done. Put your hands together for Michael Torklet, SIS King of the Mountain. And uh, we'll get... Uh, our stage, sorry, Nikki, it's going to dash up. We're going to get our podium organised now because, of course, we're going to need one, two and three. As we move on now to the medal presentations for the Vantage Elite and Under-23 Road National Championships, we'll bring our three athletes up onto the stage and we will then acknowledge each of the three uh, one by one as they receive their medals. But would you please... Uh, first, put your hands together and welcome our medalists for the Vantage Under-23 Men's Road Race. <laughs> Medals will be presented uh, by Kevin Burgess on behalf of Grassroots Trust. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal, riding for Team Skoda Fruzio, Andrew Bidwell. We almost got promoted. That's why, that's why I don't do medals. I'm colourblind. There we go. Well done. In second place, the winner of the silver medal, riding for NTT Continental Cycling Team, it's Connor Brown. And in first place, the winner of the gold medal and the 2020 Vantage Under-23 Road Race National Champion riding for Yumbo Visma, it's Finn Fisher-Black. <laughs> now, as well as the medal, Finn will also receive, of course, the, uh, the jersey. And we will also have a very special presentation. And while the jersey's going on, Please, if you're not sure of the background to the New Zealand Cyclist Corps Memorial Trophy, uh, do a Google, have a read. This is a very special trophy that uh, recognises and acknowledges uh, the New Zealand Corps, uh, and in particular uh, in Flanders in World War I. There's a wonderful backstory to this trophy. That is literally a cobblestone from one of the towns where the New Zealand Corps were during wartime and is a very special link back to that part of the world and that time in our history. Please put your hands together now as the New Zealand Cyclist Corps Memorial Trophy is presented to your champion, Finn Fisher-Black. One more time for your medalists in the Vantage Under-23 Men's Road Race. And... This is about the time that I see if I can jump off a stage as the bubbly makes its way. Put your hands together for them, folks. Uh, the bubbly celebration, the Vantage Under-23 Men's Road Race.
Well done, guys. Congratulations. We move on now to the Vantage Elite Women's Road Race. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you can uh, put your hands together as we welcome our medalists to the stage. And again, medals will be presented by Kevin Burgess on behalf of Grassroots Trust. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal, riding for the Waikato Bay of Plenty, Kate McCarthy. In second place, and the winner of the silver medal, riding for Wellington, it's Kate McElroy. And in first place, and the winner of the gold medal in the elite national women's road race from the Waikato Bay of Plenty, Teresa Adam. So Teresa Adam with the double this weekend. As the photo opportunity ahead of the uh, the bubbly coming in come on in kevin hand over that bubbly and then run for your life join in the celebration folks put your hands together your podium for the elite women congratulations teresa i'll get a quick word uh, with you congratulations uh, great weekend the double yeah, thank you so much. I'm really stoked. Um, you know, I came down here just to have a bit of fun and give it everything in the TT and the road race was um, a bonus. So I'm really, really happy. And uh, across the two days, what was the tougher of the two? What challenged you the most, uh, sitting in that tuck in a time trial or riding today in a bunch? Because you're not, well, you're more comfortable in the tuck, of course, in an Ironman race, but what, what suited you best? Uh, yeah, definitely um, today was, was really hard for me. Um, it's not something I do a lot, um, you know, road racing, and so in a bunch, um, yeah, I'm definitely used to just sit, holding a steady power um, all day. Um, so, yeah, all the surging and the, yeah, the girls are just so strong, and um, I'm just happy, you know, happy to be there riding up there with them. Congratulations. Uh, well done. Great weekend. Put your hands together again for Teresa Adam. As we now welcome to the podium, please put your hands together as we welcome our medalists for the 2020 Vantage Under 23 National Women's Road Championship medalists. Please put your hands together. Our medals will be presented by Matt Archibald from Vantage Windows and Doors. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal Representing Velo Projects, it's Ellie Wollaston. In second place, and the winner of the silver medal, riding for Canyon SRAM Racing, it's Ella Harris. Step back up, Ella. Step back up. And in first place, and the winner of the gold medal, and your Vantage 2020 National Road Champion, riding for Bigla Katusha, it's Neve Fisher Black. Yay. We'll get that uh, jersey on, proudly on and zipped up. And of course, uh, also taking out uh, overall uh, race honours, meaning that uh, receiving the Bev May Cup. And would you please put your hands together because guess who's here to present? Bev May is here to present. Please, a big welcome for Bev as she presents the Bev May Cup to Neve Fisher-Black. Congratulations. And uh, if you would do the honours, uh, Matt, you might need to put that uh, cup down for a moment, Neve. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, we've, we've, we've got all afternoon, Ella. It's okay. <laughs> Shall we wait? 
Shall we wait? We're, and stand clear. There we go. Well done, Ella. Put your hands together again, folks. Uh, our medalists and the Vantage Elite Under-23 National Road Champs. Well done, ladies. Neve, I'll get a quick word with you. Congratulations. That's pretty special, eh? Bev here to present you with, with her trophy, but I bet this is one that you're going to be very proud of. Oh, super proud. It's, it's, yeah, it's crazy being able to win the national title. It's my first national title, and, um, yeah, I've I got, not really got any words for it. It's, 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 it's crazy. Did the race go to plan? Talk about the race. Talk about cycling, because that'll be easier for you. Did it go pretty much to plan for you today? Um... Well, you won, but did you win it as you thought you might be able to? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. I won, so um, that, that, that's, that was the end result I was looking for. But the way it panned out was a, it was a surprise. Um, obviously, I have a teammate in the peloton, so that's I we knew together that that we had two shots at the win today, and and so we came in with a plan. But the races did pan out differently, and that's that's races do. So. Had to let the legs do the talking today, and that was, well, yeah. That's the way it worked out. The legs did the talking. You've done some pretty good talking as well. Put your hands together for Neve Fisher-Black, your Vantage Elite National Road Champion and under-23 title holder. And we move on now to the Vantage Elite Men's Road Race as uh, we welcome our medalists uh, to the stage. Please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and let's welcome our medalists in the Vantage Elite Men's Road Race to the stage. And again, we welcome to uh, make medal presentations from Vantage Windows and Doors, Matt Archibald. Good stuff, guys. Jumping behind the podium there. Is are you glad you're not riding into that wind? Yes, a little slippery. Just watch your feet. In third place, and the winner of the bronze medal, riding for St George Continental, Dylan Kennett. In second place, and the winner of the silver medal, riding for Yumbo Visma. What a brave ride it was, George Bennett. And in first place, the winner of the gold medal and the 2020 Vantage Elite National Road Champion. Would you please welcome De Kernick Quick Step Rider Shane Archbold? <laughs> the medal and the jersey. And uh, Shane will also receive as national champion the NZACA Dunlop Cup. And again, there's so much history, so many wonderful names on these trophies. And Shane, immensely proud to have his engraved alongside all those who have gone before him. Put your hands together, folks. Our medalists in the Vantage Elite National Men's Road Race. And here comes the bubbly. Put your hands together for them. Celebrate with them. Congratulations, guys. And just be very careful stepping down again. Shane will grab you for a quick word. Shane, uh, we saw at the finish line uh, how much that meant to you and how much it means to all you riders. Uh, absolutely stunning ride today. To say it was time to perfection is stating the obvious. You must be thrilled. Yeah, um, yeah, um, I had a plan. It played into my favour. I had a little bit of luck, as you need to, <coughs> to win a racing style like this. And, um, yeah, my timing was obviously perfect. There's some amazing names, the history of this event. Uh, do you feel that? you feel the history of cycling here? Is that part of what makes it so special, knowing who's gone before you? Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, it means a lot more. A lot of historic races mean a lot for the history, but this means a lot more for what it's going to be for the next 360-odd days um, wearing the jersey. 
and then after that, it's about enjoying the history of the event and um, the guys that have come before me. Obviously, it's hit and miss. I don't know what the percentage is of professionals to win it, but it's great that the jersey's going back to Europe. And does it just make the rest of this year so much easier? I mean, you've had a heck of a ride the last couple of years, but uh, does this make all the hard work and rehab and everything you've been through, does, does this just set you up knowing that you're back? That you, It must be a great feeling going into 2020 now with this under your belt. Yeah, there's a lot of um, core stability, gym sessions, cold miles, but everyone goes through the same thing. It's not, uh, it's not that I've done more or done less or had a harder pathway, I just didn't, um, I didn't stop when it was hard, but um, in terms of what's ahead of me for 2020, I'll be calling the team and tonight and telling them I won't be in Dubai in 24 hours time, because I'm going to take a few weeks off, but we'll talk about that with them later and see what they come up with. This has been live streamed, so you've just told them, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, but again, we, we just want to congratulate you on this result, but uh, on the gig, um, and you're in pretty good company, aren't you, with uh, the rest of the year? Yeah, the, um, obviously it's the most winning team the last three, five years, or however the statistic is, I think, in the history of Quickstep. I was told the other day there's been 94 individual winners, um, so it would be 94 or 95, which is, it's a winning team, and um, it does obviously rub off. Nothing changes for me apart from the clothing I'll be wearing. I've still got a job to do. I still won't get the opportunities. I don't deserve the opportunities. I know what my job is. I'm pretty clear in that. But it will be great to be able to do my job wearing the National Champs jersey. Good stuff. I know everyone's very proud of you today. Well done. Give them a big round of applause. Uh, Shane Archbold. And that uh, concludes our medal presentation for the Vantage Elite Road Cycling Championships. Thank you so much for your attendance. I want to thank all of our sponsors across the uh, three days of the Three Peaks uh, Ride Festival. Uh, congratulate all of our riders in all of our events across the weekend. A couple of quick housekeeping reminders. Please, riders, make sure your transponders are returned back to... Uh, the team here, so please make sure your transponders are returned, and everyone, if we can make sure we leave the uh, reserve as clean as we found it. But thank you, everyone, and a safe journey to wherever you might be going, whether it's on a bike or in a car or on a plane, but a safe journey. Thank you so much for joining us, and we wish you well. We'll uh, get our champions uh, back up, I think, for a little photo opportunity. So uh, our respective winners, uh, Teresa and Shane, and uh, Neve is there as well, Finn. Come and join us and we'll get our uh, four champions up for a piece of history here up on stage. But thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time at the Three Peaks Ride Festival and the Vantage Elite National Championships. Well, it's just been a remarkable day as we now once again honour and recognise our four champions. The first elite female athlete, Teresa Adam, Neem Fisher-Black, the overall winner, the under-23 champion. And then what a cracker of a race it was on the men's side. And you do have to feel for George Bennett, but Shane Archbold did everything asked of him and he will be the national champion for the next 12 months. And Finn Fisher-Black, under-23 champion, both jerseys heading back to Europe, Greg Henderson. Somebody who's ridden 12 grand tours, who's pretty much won everything in the sport of cycling. Sum up today, let's start with the women's race. Mate, we couldn't have been treated to any better bike racing. I mean, like like we mentioned before, we you could not pick a winner with five minutes of bike racing left to go. The women's race, like, it came down to the wire there was no clue that who was going to win that race in the end, and what an incredible performance. Yeah, you have to feel sorry for Kate McCarthy. Uh, she was like George Bennett. She went solo. She went a lot earlier than she had hoped, and again, she just ran out of real estate in the finish, didn't she? But plenty to take from this, and uh, again, a, a stepping stone to perhaps higher honours in the future. Absolutely. It was, it was just two kilometres too far for her. You know, they just caught her, and then... She'd been out the front for so long, just absolutely depleted. She was just dead on the bike. There's nothing you can do at that stage. So, I mean, what a future, you know. Yeah, what a future, too, for both of these under-23 champions. And we do just need to talk about Neem Fisher-Black equally, Ella Harris, uh, women's cycling. Uh, you know, it's been a gradual evolution, but it's really well and truly established it itself now, and you've got a sneaking feeling that New Zealand women are going to do something really special in the future. Absolutely, and, uh, you know, over in Europe, you can see the, the potential and the growth and the racing is just 
dynamic, it's enthusiastic, it's, it's raced hard. You saw how hard it was raced today, and it's just a testament to the, the type of athletes they are. Yeah, they do know how to put on a race indeed. Now, let's talk about the men's race, because, Greg, I mean, you've been in a number of national championships. It's first national championship on the men's side was back in 1934. And you'd have to go through back through the history books to find a more dramatic race, a more emotional race, two very contrasting styles, dueling it out with just, what, two kilometres left on the road. Absolutely. And you look, you know, two laps to go here, 19, 18 k's to go, you were thinking it's all over, George Bennett is going to win this title and what a heroic ride, what an epic ride, absolutely deserved. And then all of a sudden, the Shane Archibald, he still believed, he said it's not over, this bike race is not over. Away he went with two other guys, he unloaded those two, then rode across solo to George. He admitted it hurt him because they're friends, it hurt him catching him, but he knows how important this national title is to him, he knows how important it is to his team, and you saw the emotion from Shane when he actually crossed the line, that the victory salute was just pure emotion, and then obviously that amazing interview at the end. We were hoping to see George Bennett um, in the colours, the black and white colours of New Zealand, incorporated into his trade team on the big climbs, but we are now going to have the New Zealand jersey at the front of the peloton, leading out some of the best sprinters in the world. That is the job of Shane Archbold. Absolutely. So he he rides in front of uh, Sam Bennett, who's one of the fastest sprinters on the planet at the moment. So when the big bunch sprints are happening in the Giro and the Tour and all those huge, or the Spring Classics even, you'll see the New Zealand Championship jersey on the front at 500 metres to go ramping the pace up super fast to launch their sprinters. It's going, to be, it's going to be great to watch. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you have enjoyed live coverage of the Vantage 2020 New Zealand Elite Under-23 Road Cycling Nationals. It's been a day full of drama. You know, I've been lucky enough and privileged enough to commentate over, on a lot of sport over the years, but today, as a commentator, was incredibly special. It was special for the people of Cambridge. Congratulations to Shane Archibald. Congratulations to Neem Fisher Black. Commiserations, condolences to George Bennett. What a street fighter, what a warrior. Cycling is in a great place in this country. We look forward to having your company again in the future. God bless New Zealand Cycling. The Perry Group is in its 63rd year and the entrepreneurial spirit and core values the company was founded on are stronger than ever. While the commercial businesses strive to be as successful as possible, there is still a big commitment to share some of that success with the communities we do business in, in particular here in the Waikato. There is a can-do attitude that filters through the culture of the organisation. Projects such as the Hamilton Casino, the Avanti Drome, the Tiawa Cycleway and now the Tiawa Lakes development out north are great examples of this. The vision of the Brian Perry Charitable Trust is to make a meaningful contribution towards a vibrant Waikato region. Perry's initiates and delivers iconic regional projects that will have benefits for generations. The Tiawa River Ride is a great example. It's a 70 kilometre cycleway stretching from Narawahi in the north to Horahora in the south. Our newest example is the Podium Sports Lodge in Cambridge, an 86-bed accommodation facility designed for the sport and recreation market and to complement WIPA's world-class facilities like the Avantidrome and Lake Karapiro. We're really excited about the Waikato and the future. The region is about to take off. There's so many developments here and Tiawa Lakes is one of those where we're connecting with Hamilton, connecting with Waikato River, connecting with the expressway and creating a gateway property that uh, we think our region will be proud of. Tiawa Lakes is a great example of an exciting project that will help make the Waikato a better place to live, work and play. After all, this is a place where we choose to raise our children. So to be involved in a transformational project such as this is incredibly exciting.
shapers, I swear the baby's lately crazy these days. People dancing like they 